The following programs were originally aired live, long before the advent of high fidelity. And they were recorded using a variety of means, from direct recording onto early audio tape and glass records, to simply placing the microphone of a wire recorder in front of the speakers of a radio playing the program. I hope, however, that any variance in audio quality will not take away from your pleasure in listening to these, some of the all-time favorite shows. down the street to get back to town to, uh, to, uh, try and find the train you came into town on. Would you see if you can use it to time travel back to your own time? After getting mistaken for spies, that you have some strange thoughts. Oh, really? The only fun I have is that I'm going to the to You think you look bad? I'm a sleal. I could really use a dip. Yeah, um, well, we'll find somewhere, I'm sure. But what were you saying about strange thoughts? Well, it just occurred to me. Eve was the first person in history to fall for a bad diet that didn't work. What? I, I mean, think about it. Think about the servant promised her that the, uh, that the uh, fruit would make her wise, it would enable her to live forever, and, uh, well, he just made all these claims. And she believed him, and it turned out to do none of those things. You're weird. Also, I guess you could say... That that makes the sn snake the literal first snake oil salesman. Bleh, 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 bleh. Uh, uh, looks like it's about another ten miles into town. Well, why don't we do this day in history while we're making our way down there? Might as well. It's April the seventeenth. And in 1387, Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales character began their pilgrimage to Canterbury, according to scholars. In 1492, Christopher Columbus signs a contract with the Spanish monarchs to find the Indies with the stated goal of converting the people to Catholicism. This promises him half 10% of all riches found and the government governorship of any lands encountered. In 1895, Treaty of Shimaksky is signed, ending the First Sino-Japanese War. In 1961, 1400 Cuban exiles land in Bay of Pigs in doomed attempt to overthrow Fidel Castro. In 1982, Canadian Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau and Queen Elizabeth II signed a proclamation of the Constitution Act, establishes charter of rights and freedoms as part of the country's new constitution. In 2011, Game of Thrones, based on the fantasy novels by George R. R. Martin, premieres on HBO. In 1970, Paul McCartney releases first solo album, McCartney. In 1976, NL Greatest Comeback. Trailing 5 to 1, Philadelphia Phillies beat Chicago Cubs 18 to 16 in 10 in innings at Wrigley Field. Mike Schmidt hits four consecutive home runs. Good night. He did well at night. In 
But anyway, let's get on with the show. Who's on first? Why, it's Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. Coming up next. The Abbott and Costello program brought to you by Campbell's, the cigarette that's first in the service. Campbell's stay fresh because they're packed to go around the world. Listen to the music of Freddie Rich and his orchestra The songs of Connie Hayes Tonight's special guest Star of the 20th Century Fox picture Tampico, Miss Lynn Barry And starring Bud Abbott and Lou Costello Hey, Abbott! Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy <laughs> Hey, Abbott, come on, come on. Help me get dressed, please. i got to get to the broadcast right away. Well, take it easy. There's lots of time. What's the excitement? Excitement? Tonight we're having Lynn Barry as our guest star, and I'm going to make love to her. Boy, oh, boy. All right. See, if I'm late, she might walk out of me. So what? Let her walk out. There's plenty of fish in the sea. Yeah, but who wants to park in the dark with a shark? Oh. <laughs> Never mind. Come on. Get your clothes on and let's go. Okay, now, kid. Hey, this Abbott. I I'm waiting for my new suit. Boy, it's going to be beautiful. It is? The most gorgeous suit you ever saw. Is that right? Yeah, the coat is red with green stripes. It's got pink lapels and orange buttons. Wait a minute. A red coat with green stripes, pink lapels, and orange buttons? Yeah. I suppose you're going to wear yellow pants? What? And have people stare at me? Oh. <laughs> what do you think I am, Abbott? A dope? Uh, yellow pants. Yeah. They clash with my purple shoes. The purple shoes? Surely, I never heard of such a thing. Yellow pants. All right, all right. Drop the pants. I can't. Why not? <laughs> my red underwear won't match my lavender vest. They are. Right. <laughs> now, don't be ridiculous. I wouldn't let you meet Lynn Barry in clothes like that. You'd better wear one of my suits. Here, I'll lend you my uh, dress suit. That old thing, it's full of moth holes. Oh, there isn't a single moth in that suit. You said it. They're all married and got children. Now, nah, wait a minute. <laughs> Just a minute. We don't have any moths in our clothes closet. No moths, eh? No. Just open that closet door and see. Okay, I will. No moths, eh? All right, so there's one. One? That was the mother. Here comes the children. <laughs> was just hatched. Look, uh, that's a brand new baby look, moth. Well, all right, forget about the moths. Here, look. I'll lend you one of my other suits. Now, let's see. There's the uh, worsted, a plaid, a tweed, and that dark one is a twill. A twill? Certainly. Didn't you ever have a twill? Oh, sure. I get a big twill when I ride on the wall of twill. No, nah, no. Nah. <laughs> Don't be silly. Wait a awful twilly. Here's just the suit for you. It belongs to my father. It's his dinner suit. Uh, there's a little breakfast on it, too. No, 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 you dummy. This is his soup and fish. It looks like egg to me. Listen, Costello. <laughs> when you lived at home, didn't your family dress for dinner? Why, certainly we dressed. Well, what do you think we did? Come to the table in our underwear? Look, <laughs> what's the matter with you? Didn't you ever wear dinner clothes? Yeah, I always wear pajamas. Pajamas are not dinner clothes. They are if you eat in bed. No, look. <laughs> that isn't what I mean. You see... As long as I can remember, the men in our family have always worn their tails to dinner. That's a very pretty picture. Yes, it is. <laughs> Where I come from, a man with tails is called a gentleman. Where I come from, we call a monkey. Oh. <laughs> I mean, after all, that 
uh, what they call them. Come in. Oh, oh. it's Ken Niles. Ken Say, Niles. Ken. Costello needs a suit in a hurry. Can he borrow yours? Uh, well, uh, I'll have to go outside and ask a little woman. A little woman? Her neck alone is three feet long. <laughs> Remark, Costello. I'll have you know my neck is not long. Oh, no? Last time I saw a neck like that, a jockey was bending over it. <laughs> <laughs> Am I insulting you? <laughs> How dare you compare me to a horse? Why, I have an aristocratic face. My grandfather was a count. You're right, Count Fleet. <laughs> <laughs> Kenneth, are you going to stand there and let Costello compare me to a horse? Nay, nay. Um, that was a very snappy part. Costello, Easton. with your appearance, you're a fine one to talk about Mrs. Niles. Certainly. Just look at yourself, fat boy. I'm not fat. Oh, no? I saw you fall down yesterday, and you rocked yourself to sleep trying to get up. <laughs> oh, now, now, look, let's stop this fighting. Uh, look, Mrs. Niles, Costello has to borrow a suit for the broadcast tonight. Uh, yes, dear. Uh, may I lend him mine? Kenneth Niles, before I let you do that, I'd lock you up in the attic. But, gee, dear, you, you just let me out. <laughs> oh, come in. Hello, boys. Oh, it's my friend Meyer, the butcher. What's going on, Meyer? Oh, boy, Louie, am I excited. What is happening to me today shouldn't happen to two dogs. <laughs> One dog couldn't handle it. <laughs> Why, what's the matter? Oh, it's my wife, Sophie. After ten years, it's going to happen. Today is the day, and I got to be by her side. So you got to come over right away, Louie, and take care of my butcher shop, huh? Now, wait a minute, Meyer. I can't do that. We're going to broadcast. I'm going to do a love scene with, li with Lynn Barry. But, Louie, would you rather do a love scene with Lynn Barry than mine? Mind butcher's shop. Can a duck swim? That's a silly answer. You ask silly questions, you get silly answers. <laughs> Costello, come on. We have to get to the studio. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Think of my wife. Louie, you never do anything for me. Meyer, you shouldn't say that. Now, I do. Now, five years ago, I gave you the money to open up the butcher shop. And when you were sick, I paid for the operation. Then when the government was going to put you in jail, I paid your income tax. And six months ago, when your house was on fire, I ran into the burning building and saved your life. And you say I never do anything for you. Yeah, but what have you done for me lately? <laughs> Freddie Rich plays a Cole Porter favorite, I've Got You Under My Skin. Costello, you had to open your big mouth just because you want to help Meyer. We're stuck here in a butcher shop. Now, come on. We might as well get the orders out. 
Uh, you dress the chickens. Me dress the chickens? Why should I? They're old enough to dress themselves. No, I'll dress the chickens. You bring me the other fowl. What fowl? That uh, duck. Why should I duck? I'm not ashamed to help Maya. <laughs> no, I mean duck. Duck in the icebox. Why should I duck in the icebox? You duck in the icebox, oh, you bitch sissy. Now, here, take it easy. I'm glad to help my friend Meyer and his wonderful little woman. All right. I know what they're going through. Why, only last week a little stranger came to live at our house. Really? Yes, my sister married a midget. Oh, come on. <laughs> Costello, you're impossible. Hello, Meyer's Butcher Shop. Hello? This is Meyer on the wire. Oh, Meyer, how's the wife? Anything happened yet? No, Louie, it's a very slow process. Uh, how's things by the shop? Oh, listen, Meyer. Mrs. Jones sent back the Christmas turkey you sold her. She says it only has one leg. What does she want to do, eat it or dance with it? <laughs> oh. Well, did Meyer say when he's coming back? Do you realize that Lynn Barry's probably at the studio now waiting for us? Now, Abbott, this is more important. Let her wait. I got plenty of women waiting for me. 50, 60, 70. 50, 60, 70? Yes, and I wish I could find some a little younger. Oh, come on. <laughs> now, Abbott, women and beautiful women always chase me. See, I don't know why. You think I... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> At any minute, a gorgeous girl is apt to walk in that door. Oh, there you are, Costello. Oh. Oh. So you want to borrow my Kenneth suit, eh? So you were going to make love to Lynn Berry, eh? And now I find you in a butcher shop, eh? You're going to run out of eight coupons. <laughs> Costello, for your information, Mrs. Niles is one of Meyer's best customers. Yeah, Now yeah. take her order. Huh? Yeah. I said take her order. Take her I order where? Just... Did you come in with an order? Never mind that. Take where do you want one. me to take it? Just take it. Listen Somebody is lost. I, uh... I... <laughs> Costello. Yes, dear. I want 20 cents worth of dog meat. Shall I wrap it up or do you want to eat it here? <laughs> no, wrap. Ra- oh! Oh, that's the last straw. Now, you see? Now, look what you've done. Oh, I've never been so insulted in all my life. After all these years of trading with my eyes, I have to come in here and be humiliated. Okay, 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 Costello, Costello, don't stand there. Apologize. Okay. Come on. Mrs. Niles, if I said anything to offend you, I'm glad of it. Uh, <laughs> Costello, I said apologize. Okay. Mrs. Niles, I'm sorry I suggested that you eat the dog meat here. <laughs> Is that better? That's much better. Wait until you get home. Uh, Costello. Oh, that's all. Cancel my order. Well, you lost Mrs. Niles' order, Costello. You'll have to change your slip. I can't, Abbott. What do you mean you can't change your slip? I'm not wearing any. Oh. <laughs> oh, pardon me. Where do I find Lou Costello? That ain't well, me. That's me. <laughs> pardon me. Where do I find Lou Costello? Here I am, over by the pickle barrel. Well, raise your hand so I'll know which one is you. <laughs> hey, Abbott, who is this fresh dame? Costello. Don't you recognize her? Lynn Barry. Gee, Miss Barry, how did you ever know, and how did you ever find me in this butcher shop? Where else would I look for a fat meatball? (laughs) See here, Costello, I'm supposed to do a play on your program tonight. Where do you expect to put it on, in this butcher shop? And why not? Lots of plays were done about butcher shops. Did you ever hear of Hamlet, the Merchant of Venison? (laughs) You ever hear of Abe's Irish Roast? Oh, come on. (laughs) That's ridiculous. Oh, yeah? Ridiculous, huh? How about the story about a hog? Big million. Oh, that's crazy. Crazy, huh? They even wrote a great picture about cows. What picture? What out canal dairy. <laughs> Boy, did I milk that one. Come to think of it, how about your last picture, Hit the Eyes? There was no meat in that one. I don't know. I saw two hands in it. <laughs> Now, wait a minute, Lynn. Don't pay any attention to Costello. He isn't very B-R-I-G-H-T. Yes, he does appear to be rather S-T-U-P-I-D. I I heard that. What do you think I am, a (laughs) D-O-P-P? Listen, Mr. Abbott, what about this play? Well, Lynn, it's an original play, and Costello will be your leading man. Costello? He could never play that part. Why not? My leading man must be able to brush me into his arms... Sweep me off his, uh, off my feet and carry me away. You don't want a leading man. You want a street cleaner. <laughs> Costello, that's no way to talk to our guest. Can't oh. you be nice? 
Yes. Miss Barry, if you'll do this play with me in the butcher shop, I'll take you out after the broadcast. We'll go for a drive. But, Lou, there's no more pleasure driving. Yeah, but there's still pleasure parking. Ah. Woo! Who wants to park at a coop with a droop? Your technique is all wrong, Costello. Is if that you want so? to take out a beautiful girl like Lynn Barry, the first thing to do is hire a limousine and chauffeur. A Rolls Royce, of course. Then you buy me flowers. Orchids, naturally. Then cocktails at the Windsor House. Dinner at Romanov. With caviar. And champagne. Then tickets for the theater. First row. After that, you make the rounds of the nightclub. Winding up at the Trocadero. Uh, then you get into your limousine again and drive down Wilshire Boulevard. Stop the car! Stop the car! What for? I want to stop at the finance company and make a loan. Ah. Johnny Haynes sings the lovely ballad, My Ideal. Camel cigarettes do have more flavor, and if you've ever tried one, I think you'll say, yes, I know. And yet, you may not be a steady camel smoker. Well, here's the difference between trying just one or two camel cigarettes and trying a couple of packs. Camel's extra flavor, the result of expert blending of costlier tobaccos, is what helps them to hold up, keep from going flat, no matter how many you smoke. Give your second pack of camel cigarettes a real test in your T-zone your taste and throat. You'll find out about flavor, and I think your throat will give you the last word on camel's smooth, extra mildness, too. And remember, your camels will stay fresh, cool smoking, and slow burning because they're packed to go around the world. C-A-M-E-L-S. Camel cigarettes. They're first in the service. They've got what it takes. <laughs> Well, Costello, we're all ready to do your play. What's it all about? Oh, it's a great story, Abbott. It's about Buffalo Bill and the Wild West. Can you play a Western gal, Miss Barry? Can I play a Western gal? Why, where I come from, they all call me Tex. Where you all come from, Tex? Oklahoma. <laughs> Just a second, Costello. Since when are you a Western character? Are you kidding, partner? What he used to call me Six-Gun Costello. But I had to change it to Two-Gun. Why? Of course, with six guns, every time I took a step, my pants fell down. <laughs> yuck, 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 yuck. That's another character for you. Well, six gun, I'll agree to play the part. Sounds fun, squaw to me. What's that? I said it sounds fun, squaw. Oh, fun, squaw. I used to hunt bar down there every year. <laughs> Yo. Yeah. All right, look, I don't... I don't believe all this, Costello. Oh, yeah! Oh, uh, no, 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 no. You don't...
don't know anything about the West. Oh, no, I was raised on a dud ranch. You mean a dude ranch? I said dud. No women. <laughs> Must have been near no gals, Arizona. Har, har. Har and squar. Uh, Lou, this is ridiculous. Must be a couple of Southern All right, cowboys. Right, no, Go ahead, Ken. Set the scene. Go ahead. Oh. And now... Somebody better set the and scene. And now, our play of the evening, a saga of the adventurous West, the life of Buffalo Bill, brought to you direct from Meyer's Butcher Shop and starring the Abbott and Costello Pickle Pigs Feet Players. <laughs> and as an extra special attraction, Meyer has goose liver at 10 cents a pound. As the scene opens, Buffalo Bill Costello and Buckskin Abbott are on the trail. Suddenly, a shot rings out. Hello! Hello? This is Meyer on the wire. Hello there, Meyer. This is Buffalo. What have I got in my store? A talking Buffalo? <laughs> no, no, Meyer. This is Buffalo. I'm, I'm talking from Indian Heights. Please give him my butcher shop in Boyle Heights. Now, Meyer, will you stop bothering me? I gotta go out and kill some Indians. What's the matter? We're running out of meat. <laughs> oh, never mind that. What's new with Sophie? Well, it's still a very slow process. Look, I can't talk to you now, Meyer. Call me back. This is the craziest play I ever heard. When do I come in? In just a second, Lynn. Costello and I are still on the trail approaching the camp of your father. Uh, read your line, Costello. Oh, yeah. Buckskin, bud, it's getting dark, and we're going to run into a heap of trouble. Yes, Buffalo. If we don't reach the stockade by sundown, the Indians will massacre us in the dark. They'll scalp us alive. Well, what are you going to do? we got to get word through to Gene Autry. Uh, uh, Gene Autry? <laughs> shh, shh. Buffalo, look. Here comes an Indian chief. He's going to speak to us. Oh. Oh, hula, gala, pala, mula. How? Mila, pula, gunda, munda, malabala. Uh, Costello. I didn't know you spoke Indian. I don't. Something went wrong with my typewriter. Uh, <laughs> me. <laughs> me welcome you. Me, Chief Flatfoot. Who gave you that name? Great White Father? No, Great White Draft Boy. Uh, <laughs> Chief Flatfoot, I've come to marry your daughter, Moon Eyes. The one over there. Moon Eyes could not come. I am her sister, cross-eyed. <laughs> Me glad to meet you. Greetings, white fish. Not fish, face. <laughs> Greetings, fish face. <laughs> I don't think she... I don't think she likes you, uh, Buffalo. Now, let me handle this. Look here, cross-eyes. I want to marry you. Now, what do you say, gal? No marry you. Me marry the bicarbonate kid. The bicarbonate, the bicarbonate kid? kid? <laughs> yes. Wild Bill Hiccup. <laughs> I used to know him as Hopalong Acidity. <laughs> then everything is settled. White man, you go. What's that? I've been an Indian scout for nigh on to 20 years. And you're the most despicable, obnoxious, incorrigible renegade that I've ever encountered. Them's hard words, Buffalo. Hard words? You're right. But I said them. <laughs> Buffalo Bill, you be careful what you say to my father. He's strong in the... I seat. smell him. Yes, no. <laughs> He's strong. Me not wear shoes. Me not wear clothes. Me sleep in wind, rain, and snow. No roof. Me eat raw corn, raw meat, raw fish. You do all that? Yes, and I'm sick and tired of the whole thing. <laughs> Glad you liked it. <laughs> well, Indian girl, I want you to marry me. It's no use. You cannot marry me unless you get my mother's consent. I've taken care of that, Cross Eyes. I married your mother, so now I'm your father. So listen, daughter, you have my consent to marry me as soon as I can get a divorce from your old lady, your mother. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Buffalo. The Indians are going to attack us. Me afraid, Buffalo. Don't worry, Cross Eyes. Get behind me. If you hear a shot, get in front of me. Look out. Here they come. Run for your lives. <laughs> Hello, Louis. It's me, Meyer. I'm back. Oh, boy, what a play. Costello, Abbott, Miss Barry, I want to thank you sincerely for watching my butcher shop while my wife Sophie is having a crisis. Gee, Meyer, 
Well, tell me, what happened? Yee, 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 such a day. Girls with white uniforms are rushing in and out. I'm walking up and down. I'm biting my nails. I couldn't eat nothing. But everything turned out wonderful. Sophie is resting up. We am so excited. Gosh, what a lucky fellow. Congratulations, Maya. Yeah. What was it, a boy or a girl? The most beautiful permanent wave you ever saw. <laughs> Abbott and Costello will be back in just a moment. Thanks to the Yanks of the Week. Tonight, we salute Liberty Ship Captain Henry A. Fritz of Detroit, Michigan, whose freighter was docked between two Allied vessels at a North African port. During an air raid, both the adjoining vessels began to burn and explode, tearing huge holes in the American ship's hull. Captain Fritz ordered his men to abandon ship, but went himself to the bow and though seared by flames, chopped the bow lines and enabled the ship to be moved to safety. In your honor, Captain Henry Fritz, the makers of camels are sending to much of marine men on the high seas 300,000 camel cigarettes. Each of the four camel shows honors the Yank of the Week, sends 300,000 camel cigarettes overseas, a total of more than a million camels sent free each week. In this country, the traveling camel caravans have thanked audiences of more than three and a half million yanks with free shows and free camels. Camel broadcasts go out to the United States four times a week, a shortwave to our men overseas and to South America. Listen tomorrow to Jimmy Durante and Gary Moore, Saturday to Bob Hawk in Thanks to the Yanks, Monday to Blondie, and next Thursday to Abbott and Costello with their guest, Mr. Edward Arnold. And here's a special message to all young men of 17. Listen to this. Right now, you can join the Army, Navy, or Marine Corps Aviation Enlisted Reserve. If you want to be an Army flyer, join the reserve now and continue your school or job until you're 18. And then you'll start training to become a pilot, navigator, or bombardier. Talk to your parents about this. You must have their permission. You can receive full information and printed literature by writing or visiting your nearest Army Aviation Cadet Examining Board or Naval Office of Procurement. Any Army, Navy, or Marine recruiting station will tell you how to find it. Abbott and Costello with a final word. Thanks, Ken. Well, Lynn Barry, thanks for being our guest tonight. Just a minute, bud. Look, Costello, I want to know how that play ended before Maya came in. Oh, it was a terrific finish. I'm standing on a hill, all alone. 10,000 blood-curdling Indians are coming at me. How many? 1,000 screaming redskins. How many? 50 ferocious savages. How many? So I killed the old squaw. Fire and squaw! Let me out of here. Let us all out of here. Good night, folks. Good night, night, neighbors. Good night to everybody in Patterson, New Jersey. Good night, Uncle Marty. Tune in next week for another great Abbott and Costello show with our guest, Edward Arnold. And remember, camels for Christmas. Yes, camel cigarettes make a wonderful gift. Wherever you send them, you can be sure that they'll be fresh when they arrive. Because camels are packed to go around the world. This is Ken Niles wishing you all a very pleasant good night from Hollywood. More pipes smoke Prince Albert than any other tobacco in the whole world. Remember that if you're looking for just the thing to give that pipe smoker for Christmas. Prince Albert comes in special Christmas-wrapped pound or half-pound containers. 
Get a Christmas-wrapped pound or half-pound container of Prince Albert for every pipe smoker on your list. This is the National Broadcasting Company. KFI Los Angeles. And, of course, the Avengers. It'll be a crime if we don't find a body. It'll be a crime if we do. In shooting? The secret of the double barrel atomic sock netter is safe. The Nathan is secure. Right. Back up. Give me the gun. Back up. Give me the gun. You're remarkable. Oh, I broke my arm both. And now, here is a man who only wishes he could sing as well as I do. It's Bing Crosley. Howdy, folks. Howdy, Rosie. Howdy, Bing. You got a melody missile you'd like to put into orbit for General Electric light bulbs and cells and company? I don't know if I want to go that far. You don't want to? Melody missile. Yes. I've got a little thing here that's uh, kind of a small little uh, shot in the arm. <laughs> Stand back now. I'll just kind of give it a little poop. <laughs> this can't be love because I feel so well. No sighs, no sorrows, no sighs. This can't be love. I get no dizzy spells. My head is not in the sky. My heart does not stand still. Just hear it beat. This is too sweet to be love. This can't be love because I feel so well. Still I love to look in your eyes. My heart does not stand still. Just hear it be. This is too sweet to be loved. This can't be loved because I feel so well. Still, I love to look in your eyes. Oh, how I love to look in your eyes. Mm, now, let's see. Uh, what's next on the program for General Electric? Lighting recipes. What do you know about lighting recipes, Rosie? Lighting recipes, Bing? That's what it says here. Stand right here. Lighting recipes. What do you suppose it means, huh? 
setting fire to a cook book. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, Bing. It means... No, no, wait. Don't tell me. Let me guess. Let's have some laughs. Do lighting recipes mean uh, reading a restaurant menu by the light of a flaming shish kebab? You're getting mm, warm, Bing. Something's warm. Lighting recipes is general electric's expression for how much light you need for reading and homework and cooking and how to get it. Ah, yes. It all comes back to me now. Hmm. They got a free booklet uh, on this, haven't they, Ken? Sure have, Bing. It's called See Your Home in a New Light. Oh, this sounds G.E. Lightful, I guess. <laughs> How do I get one? Oh, uh, that's easy. You just send a postcard to G.E. Bulbs, care of the station, and ask for lighting booklet. You got that? Uh, yeah, I got it. Right, G.E. Bulbs, care of the station, ask for lighting booklet. But say, Ken. Yeah, Bing? I got a, a G.E. lighting recipe of my own. What's that? Well, if you want to get better light in places where you just couldn't get it before you, you get some of these new, smaller, brighter General Electric 100-watt bulbs. They're no bigger than a 60-watt. They give more light than two 60s for only 100 watts worth of current. Don't ask me how. I, I couldn't handle that. And they fit in lamps and fixtures where you just couldn't squeeze a 100-watt bulb in before. No how. Love letters stray from your heart. Keep us so near while apart. I'm not alone in the night when I can have all the love you write. I memorize. can expect showers, sometimes even downpours, but spring will bring the torrents, and there's not very much we can do about it. I know it's most annoying to the ladies, it's got to be, the housewives, of course, the kids tracking in mud, coming home soaking wet, but if you want sunshine, you must have showers, from the song uh, Pennies from Heaven, <laughs> got to put up with it, you see. <laughs> well, Bing, uh, do you have a word of encouragement, a look on the bright side for the girls, something that make them feel a little better about this whole mess? Ah, yes, I do, Ken, and I'm so glad that you cued me into it. <laughs> I'd just like to tell the ladies that no matter how annoying the weather may be, they're just lucky that they don't live in the wettest place in the world. The wettest place in the world? Yeah. Well, let's see. Uh, which ocean is that? The Atlantic or the Pacific? No, it's no ocean, Ken. I mean the wettest place on land in the world. Oh, uh, well, let's see. Uh, under what waterfall might that be? Uh, uh, Niagara? No, no. The wettest place in the world, Ken, is a town in India. A town called Cherapunji. A town called Cherapunji, yes, huh? Sir, that's the place where precipitation is just, well, it's the wildest. It's unbelievable. Fantastic. How much rain to get there, Bing? Hold on to something, Ken. Brace yourself. This is quite a figure. The average rainfall is 458 inches a year. Goodness gracious. Even the ducks beef about the weather there. <laughs> the duck can take just so much, I oh, guess. Yeah, they crack up even as you and I. Oh, what's that? Did they quack up? I thought that's what you oh, said. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, about this uh, rainfall in Cherapunji, what was that average again? 458 inches a year. Just for comparison, so you get some idea, the average in New York is 42 inches a year. But just like in New York, it, it isn't waning Wayne, you know. It's waning wild. Yeah, uh, <laughs> tell that to the dwarf. <laughs> <laughs> now, I wonder how an umbrella factory would go in Cherapunji, huh? An umbrella factory? Bring you couldn't lose. Have to get loaded. And yeah. little galoshes for the ducks, that'd be good, too. Well, anyhow, I just thought, you know, girls, I thought you might like to know that no matter how wet it is around your diggings, somewhere else it's raining harder. A lot harder. 
That's a good point, Bing. In other words, it's never so bad, but what it could be worse. We are just full of just little, little maxims, axioms, and epigrams. Mm -hmm. That's the message, the complete message. Now, here's a song for the ladies. A song that is dedicated to the drip, drip, drip of the weather in Charapunji. Rain? What else? <laughs> I can tell you a dishwashing detergent that's gentle as a lamb, gentle fell. Gentle, gentle fell. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know all about that. It's the only dishwashing detergent that contains lanolin D. And lanolin D is... Uh... Lanolin D is the beauty essence used in the finest creams and lotions to keep hands soft and lovely. Oh, well, then, to have it built right in with your dishwashing detergent, that's, that's quite a convenience. Oh, it can mean the difference between lovely hands or hands that are red, raw, and cracked and sore. Ooh, sounds like that can be wicked. Gentle Fells cushions your hands while it washes your dishes. And only Gentle Fells has lanolin D. And when you use Gentle Fells, glasses and dishes dry sparkling clear. You don't have to wipe them to get that hand-polished look. Gentle Fells just doesn't leave any spots or stains. So, on your next trip to the store, remember now, Gentle Fells. F-E-L-S. Fells. For a spotless reputation, you can't beat the Fells family of fine cleaning products. Gentle Fells for dishes. And don't forget instant Fells napper for laundry. The moment has arrived. The moment when we hear from Buddy Cole and his musical demons. How about it, Buddy? You ready with something? Sure, Rosie. Thought we might do Brazil. What's featured, piano or organ? Organ. We're going to sample through Brazil. That's mighty nice country for that sort of caper. Mm, the best. Go, bud. Start the samba. Begin the begin or whatever.
You know what I'd love, Rosemary? I'd like you to do a tune for us right now. I thought that you might sing something, Bing. Me? Well, what about doing one together? Oh, a we'll compromise, huh? Yeah, compromise. You know, Rosie, that's what life is. Just a series of compromises. Just got to learn to settle, huh? Yep, got to do it. Just do the best we can. Sit down, talk things over, and negotiate. Make adjustments. Steer a middle course. There's a lot of fussing. After this, we should choose something smooth. Got to. Got to be smooth. <laughs> Well, I like your style. Say. I think it's marvelous. I'm always wrong, so how can I tell? All of your shirts are unsightly. All of your ties are a crime. Oh, like my friend. You? Well, if here in you I take rightly, baby, you gotta be the first time you came along. Say, I think you're wonderful. Oh, yeah. You came along. I think you're wonderful. wonderful. I think you're grand. But we may just be wrong. Uh, Rosie, if you don't mind, I think I'll climb back into my hammock. Would you sing something soothing? I'm just delighted to do it. How's this? speaking come true what is there to say and how will I pull through I knew in a moment contentment and home meant just you Certainly hope you listen again, ladies and gentlemen. Adios. Bing Crosby and Rosemary Clooney with Buddy Cole's music were presented from Hollywood. This is Ken Carpenter inviting you to join us again tomorrow. Oscar Mayer, the first name in Bologna.
Now let's join a true legend of American comedy who also entertained troops for nearly 60 years, Bob Hope. The Bob Hope Show with Jerry Colonna, Vera Vig, the songs of Francis Langford, music by Skinny Edison and his orchestra, and starring Bob Hope. <laughs> How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Bob Camp Borden, Canada Hope. <laughs> this is my second trip up here, by the way. I visited Canada once before and stayed a long time, but it finally blew over. And I think... And I think... <laughs> the gag is blowing over, too, but I... <laughs> and I think the natural beauties of Canada are wonderful, but they won't give me their phone numbers. <laughs> I called up a girl I used to know here in Canada. She was from the timber country, but she's married now and has three little splitters. <laughs> we came up here by train. Boy, it was really crowded. One soldier was doing his morning exercises, and when he exhaled, four people got off at the wrong station. <laughs> and boy, was that train slow. A couple of newlyweds got out of Chicago, and when they reached Niagara Falls, their son carried the bags to the hotel. <laughs> Falls, you all know what Niagara Falls is. That's a natural phenomenon where tons and tons of water pour down in a steady stream. We have the same thing in California, only we call it February. <laughs> oh, say, uh, Skinny Ennis didn't have a passport, so I sneaked him across the border in my suitcase. I guess I forgot to put air holes in it. When I opened it, the moth was giving him artificial respiration. <laughs> I was really thrilled when I finally got across the border. I stood there proudly and said, Greetings, Sister Republic. And some Canadian private said, Greetings to you too, Sister. <laughs> and what a reception I got here. When I got off the train, the crowd raised me to their shoulders and paraded for two blocks right down the main street. But I'd like to catch the guy that let him past all those low awnings. <laughs> Here's Skinny Ennis singing a number from Dare Bingle's latest picture, Swinging on the Stars. Swing it, skin, boy. Would you like to swing on a star? Carry moving, comb and jaw, and be better off than you are? Or would you rather be a mule? A mule is an animal with long, funny ears, kicks up at anything he hears. His brain is brawny and his brain is weak. He's just plain stupid with a stubborn streak. And by the way, if you hate to go to school, you may grow up to be a mule. Or would you like to swing on a star, carry moonbeams home in a jar, and be better off than you are? Or would you rather be a pig? A pig is an animal with dirt on his face. Shoes are a terrible disgrace. He's got no manners when he eats his food. He's fat and lazy and extremely rude. But if you don't care a feather for a thing, you may grow up to be a pig. Rather be a fish. A fish won't do anything but swim in a brook. He can't write his name or read a book. And to fool the people is his only thought. And though he's slippery, he still gets caught. But then, if that sort of life is what you want, you may grow up to be a fish. And all the monkeys are in the zoo. Every day you meet quite a few. So you see, it's all up to you. You could be better than you are. Could be swinging on a star. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. That was Skinny and a swinging 
Uh, singing. Yes. <laughs> singing, swinging on a star. With uh, those Toronto Terrors behind yes, you, huh? Dollar, too. Hello, man. That's great going, Skin. Tell me, how do you like it up here in Canada? I like it fine, Bob. You know, I've been going around shaking hands with all these Canadians and telling them I'm their ally. Skin, you shouldn't do that. Up to now, they thought we were winning the war. <laughs> You know, you'll scare these people and the Canadian Mounties will get you. Canadian Mounties? Yeah, you know, the FBI on horseback. <laughs> yeah, Francis Langston. Hello, Francis. Steve, um, is it nice being up here to... Yeah, Francis. You know, I was invited up here by government officials when I arrived... Two big cars were ready, and one of them rushed me right from the train to the governor's office. Well, what about the other car? Well, that rushed the governor from his office to the train. <laughs> well, Bob, now that we're up here in this northern country, you should buy a top coat. Why, Francis, I managed to keep warm. I know, Bob, but it looks a little ridiculous, sewing pockets on an old hot water bottle. <laughs> Well, it's a little damp around the waist, I guess. Well, you could take some lessons from these Canadian men. You think I could, huh? Uh-huh. Listen, Francis, I want to warn you, by the way, there are a lot of wolves here in Canada. Say that again, Bob. Why should I say it again? Well, I think it's so cute the way your pointed ears wiggle when you say it. <laughs> Professor Kelowna around, Bob. Well, I'm expecting a call any minute. <laughs> hello? 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 Kelowna talking. Kelowna, where are you? I'm at Niagara Falls, and I got a wonderful view from my hotel window. Really? What can you see? Other windows. <laughs> Stop that nonsense, Kelowna. What are you doing over there? I'll let you in on a little secret, Hope. I'm going over Niagara Falls in a barrel. Professor, why in a barrel? Somebody stole my pants. <laughs> no kidding, Hope. I'm really getting ready to go over the falls in a barrel. Nope. Got a better idea. Say, what's that gurgle, gurgle, gurgle? I just decided to go over the falls with a barrel in me. <laughs> Professor. Professor, I think the trip has probably been too much for you. Get a hold of yourself. <laughs> What's the matter? It tickles. <laughs> Professor, Professor, why have you got all those cobwebs on your brain? Maid's day off. <laughs> What's your alibi? Yeah. So, Lorna, you're getting very corny, old boy. Association, old man. Association. Here I go. I'm ready to go over the falls, Hope. I'll swim out to my battle. Are you really in the water, Kelowna? Of course I am, Hope. Right now I'm making with a mermaid. Shoot the scales of me, frail. <laughs> He's dead. I'd better not go near her. Why not? She's got a mickey in her fin. Keep your mind on the job. I thought you were going over the falls. I am, Hope. I'm in the battle now. I'm at the edge of the falls now. I'm going over. I'm going way down. Now I'm halfway down. Kelowna, what happened? Customs officer, got to show my passport.
Professor Francis, the professor got up on the wrong side of his brain this morning. Well, did you enjoy the sightseeing tour we took around the falls, Bob? Yeah, you know, Francis, there's a cave right behind Niagara Falls. The whole front of it is covered by falling water, and when you're in there, nobody can see you from the shore. Yes, but it's so damp, Bob. Don't you think you should move to a hotel? <laughs> yeah, but look at the money I save doing my own laundry. <laughs> Say, Bob, is... <laughs> As we were leaving, did you notice those newlyweds who checked into the hotel for a honeymoon? Yeah, Francis, I'm afraid that wasn't a happy marriage. Why do you say that? Mr. Anthony was carrying their luggage. <laughs> hey, but can you imagine that Professor Colonna? Still in Niagara Falls. What a nerve he's got. If he doesn't hurry up and get here, I'm going to tear up his contract. <laughs> Lucky I made the traffic light in Hamilton. <laughs> Say, Hope, uh, remember that native girl I brought here from the South Seas? You know, the one I brought with me to the program last week. Yes. <laughs> Habit forming, isn't she? <laughs> uh, honey, uh, you remember Bob Hope? Oh, Casanova? <laughs> Casanova? Well, how do you like that? Well, you think I've got what it takes, huh? Oh, yes. On my island, we make love by rubbing noses. <laughs> We're on our way to Niagara Falls to get mad at. Oh, so you go for the Professor Bumser, huh? Oh, yes. Professor Colonna, he man of my dreams. Uh, Colonna's the man of your dreams. You must sleep on a lumpy mattress. Say, uh... <laughs> Say, where does this little cutie come from, Professor? Oh, west of here, Hope. Saskatchewan? Thank you, Pops. Saskatchewan. <laughs> I got mine. Catch one for yourself. <laughs> Tell me, how come you're so half-baked? Short circuit in the incubator. <laughs> but tell me, Bumpsip, why do you want to marry the professor? Oh, he keeps me and makes fireworks in my head. He makes fireworks? So I colonia, you're wonderful. What's your secret? Keep my cigar in my mouth. <laughs> oh, professor, you are so cute. And you have not kissed your little bumps today. Kiss me. Oh, now, wait a minute. I'll show her what kind of a friend I am to you, Kelowna. I'll kiss her for you. Oh, you'll kiss her for me, eh? That's right, Kelowna. Oh! What else can you do with that kind of a tourist? <laughs> Here's Francis with a Langford version of it could happen to you. Hide your heart from sight Lock your dreams at night It could happen to you Don't count stars Or you might stumble Someone drops the sight and down you tumble Keep an arm spring Run when church bells ring It could happen to you All I did was wonder How your arms would be Happen to me. 
is a good friend of mine we're very happy to have with us tonight, that world traveler, famous war correspondent and author, Quentin Reynolds. Thanks, boys. Really, Bob, I don't know yet why you invited me to appear on your program. I'll skip that, Quentin, because I don't enjoy fighting with my guests. That is not the men. Seriously, I'm very glad. I'm very glad to be here, Bob. I love your program. Listening to it keeps me thin. Laughing, huh? Oh, no, Bob. Bending over to turn it down between musical numbers. I thought we'd been having more music than your waistline looks like. <laughs> This is like old times, isn't it, Bob? Sure is. Remember when we met in London in that blackout? I sure do. What about it? Nothing. Just give me back my watch. <laughs> I can't. I put it in my pocket and some thief poured acid on my suspenders and stole my pants. Those blackouts were really something, weren't they, Bob? To say nothing of that London fog. Yeah, what fog? You can't even see the end of your nose. You have trouble on a clear day. <laughs> Well, it comes in handy for cleaning my pipe anyway. I, uh... But, Quentin, I'll always remember how swell you were to me during those bombings. Don't be silly, Bob. We, we always revive anyone who faints in an air raid shelter. <laughs> Say, I've been reading about your trip to the South Pacific. How'd you get along with the Australian girls, Bob? Well, Quentin, they speak a different type of English. They can hardly understand you, and you can hardly understand them. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. <laughs> What's so wonderful about that? Well, when you ask them for a kiss, by the time they look it up in the dictionary, it's too late. <laughs> right. Listen, I get tired of talking about myself, Quentin. Let's talk about something uplifting, something of great importance. Yes, Bob, I've read your book. Yeah. <laughs> well, mention the name of it. You say you read my new book, I Never Left Home? Yes, Bob, and I couldn't put it down. You couldn't put it down? No, what a novel idea. Fly paper covers. <laughs> That's yeah, catchy, isn't it, huh? <laughs> I didn't know you were a writer, Bob. Yes, people tell me I'm as good a writer as I am a comedian. Well, chin up. <laughs> you know, I've even thought of going into your racket, Quentin. How is it? Well, there's nothing more exciting than being a war correspondent up on the front lines, Bob. It's a great experience. Well, let's show the folks what it's like, Quentin. First, a couple of Yank correspondents at the front. <laughs> Well, we picked out a great spot to watch the battle in this foxhole, Quentin. I'm not afraid of those rats. <laughs> just missed us. Ah, this is just a picnic. Ah, they make me laugh. <laughs> What's the matter, Bob? Look, a spider. Not back, Bob. Not me. They can't stop a Yank's spirit. They can't stop a Yank's muscles. They can't stop a Yank's fighting heart. Oh! What happened? They found a place. <laughs> and now, and now the same scene the next day, we find two British correspondents at the front. Hey, Ronald, glad things have quieted down a bit, what? Yes. You know, Reginald, that was a beastly bombing last night. Gad, I jumped out of my skin. I noticed, Ronald, you should have had it pressed before you put it back on. Uh... How about a spot of lunch? A hard-boiled egg? An egg? Yes, I'll just hold it above the top of this foxhole for a minute. Shells it nicely, doesn't it? Shall we brew ourselves some tea? Some tea? Quite, quite, oh boy. You have the tea. You have the pot. Uh... <laughs> oh, I, I love tea, Reg. Tea in the morning, tea at noon, tea at night. Really, Ronald, all you drink is tea, tea, tea. Oh, tea. yes, I love tea. Was that a shell? No, too much tea. <laughs> Got the date with an angel Got to meet her seven 
Got a date with an angel I'm on my way to heaven So lovely beside me And whatever betide me Got an angel to guide me So I'm on my way to heaven Soon I'll hear the bells ring out And the choir will sing out When the pearly gates swing out Ah, oh, she'll beckon to me I've been waiting a lifetime For the evening at seven Got a date with an angel I'm on my way to heaven Fighting sun with plane and tank and gun. No matter what your job may be, you'll see the battle won. And we thank you so much. Oh, thanks for the memory. Two nations filled with pride, fighting side by side. Their borders free to you and me, good neighbors now allied. And we thank you so much, folks. Let's each be our own delegation to do what we can for our nation to keep freedom and not have dictation by stamps galore help win this war I want to thank all you wonderful people here at Camp Borden you two Quentin Reynolds for your guest and guest appearance tonight it's been a great day here at Camp Borden you know folks when we first went overseas we met a lot of Canadians war was new to us then but already more than two years old of them for Canada's had five years of this war, five years this month. Boys who were 20 in September 1939 are veterans of 25 today. Canadian youngsters of 15 and 16 were inside the little red schoolhouse in 39, learning their three R's. Tonight they're inside Germany, teaching the Nazis that there is no super race. So it's a privilege for us to be in Canada. Yes, sir, these are the people who've had their full share of blood, toil, tears, and sweat. Their sons stood in the ring at Dunkirk and were slugged. At Dieppe, they took it on the chin, and the folks at home took it in the heart. Canada's first steps in the road to victory were taken in the blackest kind of darkness. But, mister, when the lights go on again all over the world, you can bet there'll be a Canadian helping at the light switch. Good night. And that's... What's behind the brand of hot dogs you buy? You know you're getting solid value with Oscar Mayer and quality trusted for generations. There's wholesome meat protein from solid cuts of meat. The only meat Oscar Mayer uses. U.S. government inspected. Oscar Mayer selected. Oscar Mayer wieners and beef franks in handy twin packs. The flavor's as good as the good meat itself. Oscar Mayer, America's number one. True crime stories of the 1940s and 1950s are up next with Jack Webb's Dragnet. <laughs> The story you're about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. <laughs> Your 
you're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to narcotics detail. You receive information that one of your city's most fashionable hotels is being used as the clearinghouse for high-grade heroin. Evidence points to a narcotics ring, the center of distribution. Your job, break it. You'll be amazed when you compare Fatima with any other king-size cigarette. The size is the same. They now cost the same. But in Fatima, the difference is quality. You see, Fatima is the quality king-size cigarette because it contains the finest domestic and Turkish tobaccos superbly blended. And Fatima is extra mild with a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. So compare Fatima yourself. Fatimas now cost the same as other long cigarettes, but your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Buy Fatima. They're extra mild, with a better flavor and aroma. Smoke Fatima. The quality king-size cigarette. Fatima. Best of all long cigarettes. <laughs> Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, October 5th. It was foggy and rainy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of narcotics division. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Captain Kearney. My name's Friday. It was 8.47 a.m. when we got to 401 North Avenue 19, the main jail. <coughs> Felony section. Morning, fellas. How are you today, Pete? Good morning. What brings you up here so early? We want to see Monty Wilkins, booked in last night on narcotics. Booking number is 906-351. Okay, let me look. Okay. Here it is. He's in 103. Thank you, Pete. I'll put it in the book here, Joe. Okay. Here's my gun. You want to check it with your? Yeah, right. I'll put him away. Okay, Pete. Here's your check. Thank you, Pete. All set, Ben? 906351. That's it. Okay, let's go. All right. All right. We want to talk to Monty Wilkins. He's in 103. All right, we'll get him. Monty Wilkins, 103, for interview. Friday, Ben. Hi, Monty. Better move out of the way there. He wants to lock that door, Monty. Oh, yeah. Let's go around the corner to the interview room, Monty. All right. Man, this is awful. What's the matter? Don't you feel good? I feel awful. Pretty sick. You look bad. I'll get the light. Okay, Ben. Okay. Thanks. Well, it's been about a year and a half, hasn't it, Marty? About that long, yeah. We got you for possession that time, too, didn't we? Yeah, that's right. How long you been in the stuff this time? Well, I guess I've been hooked bad about a month. How much you shoot? Oh, about two caps a day. And you were picked up down in Slauson last night. You had seven caps on you. Yeah, that's right. Well, we checked with the crime lab. They've run the stuff. It's not the usual Mexican, is it? That's right. Do you want to tell us about it? Yeah, it's good stuff. It's not Mexican. We know that, Monty. Where'd you get it? 
Haven't had anything like that for a long time. Real good. Hasn't been cut. Real fine. Maybe it's coming in from the East Coast. Can't get nothing like that from Mexico. Now look, Monty, we ran the stuff through the lab. We know it's high-grade heroin. We know all about it. Now I want you to tell us where you've been getting it. Well, you know how it is. You want to ask the impossible of me? My life wouldn't be worth a penny. You know how it is. We handled you a year and a half ago, didn't we, Monty? Yeah. You're still around, aren't you? Yeah, I did time, though. Well, you knew that going in. You're going to do time this trip, too. So don't shoot us that line, huh? Well, you guys know how it is with us guys. I, I can't tell you anything. No, it isn't that you can't. You just don't want to. Now, look, we didn't come up here to spend the time of day with you, Wilkins. This is the only time around. If you want to help us, you can help yourself at the same time. It's up to you. You mean you can clear me on this? You can give me a break? We didn't say that. We can't make any promises to you or give you any kind of a break. It's entirely up to you how you want us to put it down in our reports. Cooperative or uncooperative. Mm. Well, okay. You squared with me last time. You helped us last time. We made a case. But I'm not going to be able to help you very much. Where you been getting it? Well, I've only made a couple of buys on that good stuff. I just got it from some old mule I just happened to meet down there. Seemed to be pretty well loaded with the stuff. Where'd you meet him? Oh, down near Fifth and Spring somewhere. What's his name? I never did know his name. I just knew that he was pushing the stuff. Some old mule, that's all. Who's he pushing it for? Now, you know they never tell us guys where they're getting it. You know how they do. Yeah. I never did talk to him very much. I did hear him say once he was getting his stuff from a new bunch of guys from the east. He said they were really going to open up this town. The way he talked, they're no small-time operators. I got enough out of it to know they're working out of the Plaza Royal Hotel. Never figured that, would you? Anything else? Any names mentioned? Yeah, I remember this old mule mentioned a couple names. I think he talked about somebody named Kirk and another guy called Smith. Now, you understand, this guy was just talking. I don't know how they fit in or what the connections are. Yeah, we understand. Where can we get a hold of this old mule? Well, I don't know where he's at. How do you get a hold of him when you want to make a buy? I just run into him, that's all. Down around Spring Street. You know, just around. The last time I was down, I couldn't find him. And is that all of it, Monty? And all you can tell us? Well, I don't know too much anyway. You know how it is. I couldn't tell you anymore. That's all I know. All right, let's get out of this 510 if that's all you got. That's everything I got. Hope you fellas will write me up okay. I think I helped you quite a bit, haven't I? One of the best hotels in town, Plaza Royal. Never would have figured that, would you? Maybe. I've told you quite a lot. The rest ought to be easy. No, you're wrong there, Marty. Why? You haven't told us the name of your mule. You haven't told us where we could find him. You haven't made it so easy. That's all I have. I've told you a lot. Yeah, there's a lot you didn't tell. We continued our interrogation of Monty Wilkins. He refused to divulge any further information. What he had told us, together with information already compiled, seemed to check out. For the past seven months, we'd been trying to localize the operations of what had come to be regarded as a well-running distribution center for high-grade heroin. We knew of the existence of this distribution point through the various users that had been picked up almost daily. These users would have in their possession quantities of high-grade narcotics. Unlike the cheaper, lower-grade quality common in the southwest part of the country, this type of heroin was more common to the eastern section of the United States. We had believed the local distribution point to be somewhere in our metropolitan downtown area. The information gained from Monty Wilkins had strengthened this theory. 10.25 a.m., we met with Francis Kearney, captain of the Narcotics Division. Plaza Royal Hotel, what do you think? Well, we have figured what we were looking for could be in that area, but we've never put our finger on that hotel. How do you figure on working it? Well, driving back from the jail, Ben and I were just kicking it around. Skipper, what do you think about putting a man in that hotel? Anything's a great deal better than we're doing now, but I don't know. Well, I'd like to give it a try. I sure like a crack at it, Skipper. You know how I feel about these kind of assignments. One man working inside, one outside. Brings the element of danger up kind of high. Well, we know it's not going to be easy, but it looks like a good bet. Sometimes these things are, sometimes they're not. You know what kind of a bunch they got to be. Been running their racket just about as smooth as it can be run. You know the kind of a risk a man would have to take if he tried to make contact with any of them. Well, we think it's about the quickest way to get to them. Well, maybe it might be worth it. 
You got any ideas how you'd like to work it? Oh. There's just one thing. We haven't come to any decision who's going in and who isn't. Well, I think I ought to be the one to work it from the inside of the hotel with Ben working outside as a contact. I don't know why we can't just turn that around. Last time you had the rough end. Joe, you just got back from your vacation about three weeks ago, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. Didn't you stay down in Arizona? Phoenix, wasn't it? Yeah. You know the town very well? Oh, we got some relatives down there, yeah. If they started asking you any questions about Phoenix, you could fill them in, huh? I think so, yeah. That's probably the best way to settle it, Romero. Friday here will be in a better position knowing a little about Phoenix. I don't see how you figured it that way. I went on my vacation, too. Columbus, Ohio. Well, because of the type of stuff that's been coming in, don't you think it'd be a little safer bet to have our man come from somewhere out this way rather than from the east? Mm, yeah, it makes sense. Well, you did it again, Joe. You beat me out. All right, let's figure it this way. You're a local Phoenix hoodlum. Things got too hot for you down there, and you came up to L.A. to cool off. Yeah. Uh, how about Joe Edwards? How's that sound? That sounds right to me. You'll get all the necessary cards, identification papers, and a few letters to carry around with you, all under the name Joe Edwards. All right. I think the best way to work it is for you to hop right down to Phoenix. When you get in town, check with Roberts. He's in narcotics down there. Yeah, I know him. Have Roberts fill you in on what's been going on down there. Any of their current characters they've handled recently? Any that have been known to pass through? You know, so you can talk about it freely. Yeah, I understand. Joe, well, when you check into the hotel down there, why don't you wire ahead up here to the Plaza Royal for reservation? Might be a good cover. Yeah, a good thought. That's the way to handle it. You two have worked these things before. You know what to do. All the necessary precautions. Well, how long do you figure out to lay over in Phoenix? A couple of days, maybe. Think that's long enough for you to get filled in, what you'll need? Oh, yeah, that's fine. Well, I'll go home and get packed. I'll start on it first thing in the morning. Huh? All right. Romero will stand by at all times, day and night, while you're on this thing. You know enough to call if things get tight. Sure. As soon as you get in from Phoenix and get located at the Plaza Royal, get in touch so we'll know which way to move. Right. Anything else? Well, we want to break this thing, but we don't want to do it at the risk of a life. So if it starts getting warm, check out. Okay. I still don't like sending anybody on something like this, but it's got to be done. We don't know enough about it. We don't know how many are in the gang. We don't know what kind of a bunch they are, so be careful. I will. If you're not and I hear about it, this will be your last assignment like this. Yeah. If I don't hear about it, well, you figure it. Yeah, either way, I lose. I went over to the photo room at the crime lab and picked up the identification papers that had been made out in the name of Joe Edwards. I went home and removed all Los Angeles labels from the clothing that I was to take with me to Phoenix, Arizona. I removed all my personal identification and Los Angeles Police Department credentials. I left my service revolver home and borrowed a 38 automatic from Ben. I packed it in my suitcase. The crime lab also furnished me with a package or a bindle made to resemble the usual form in which a person would carry heroin. I packed this in my suitcase. Before my departure, Ben and I went over the proposed plan as best we could. I was to arrive from Phoenix under the assumed name of Joe Edwards. I would register at the Plaza Royal Hotel in downtown Los Angeles and attempt to make arrangements to participate in a narcotics buy for the purpose of gaining sufficient evidence to apprehend the narcotics ring. I was to keep Ben informed as best I could of my progress. As outlined by Captain Kearney, I arrived in Phoenix and contacted Sergeant Roberts at the detective bureau down there. He furnished me with all the necessary information and assisted me in acquiring local Phoenix clothing store labels to have sewn in my clothing. I obtained everything possible to make it appear that I was a longtime resident of Phoenix, Arizona. Several dummy hotel bills were made up for me to make it look as if I'd lived there for a period of time. I was furnished with an Arizona driver's license, a membership in the local social club, and a voter's registration stub. These were all packed in my suitcase. October 9th, 10 a.m., I arrive at the Plaza Royal Hotel, the front desk. Yes, sir? My name's Edwards. I'm in from Phoenix. Did you get my wire? One moment, sir. Yes, sir. Joe Edwards? Yeah, that's right. Would you sign the register, please? Yeah, all right. Thank you. What? Yes, sir. Would you show this gentleman to room 211, please? Yes, sir. This way, please. All right, thank you. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Two, please. Not very nice weather to arrive in Los Angeles, is it, sir? No, not too good. 
I see by the stickers on your bag you've been through Arizona. Yeah, that's right. Must be nice weather down there, huh? Yeah, it's all right. This way, sir. Thank you. Let me open a window for you, sir. A little fresh air in here. All right. Okay. Thanks. Here you go. Thank you very much, sir. Help you with your bags? Yeah, all right. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Something dropped out on the floor here. You better let me have that. Sorry. Very sorry that happened. That's all right. Mr. Edwards, uh, while you're in town here, if there's anything I can do for you, don't hesitate to let me know. Yeah, okay. I couldn't help but notice that little package there that I dropped. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like I say, I know my way around here in this town. If you need anything, you know, anything at all, sir. I'll tell you what. Now, here's five bucks. You never saw anything fall out of my bag there, right? Anything you say, sir. Okay. Thanks a lot. See you later, huh? Yes, sir. Anything else, sir? No, no, that'll be all. You remember what I told you, sir? Yeah, I was just going to say the same thing to you. I couldn't be sure, but it looked like I'd been lucky right from the start. The bellboy at the Plaza Royal Hotel. I didn't know if I could consider this an opening contact or not, but he seemed to show more than a passing interest in the bindle of narcotics that he had seen fall from my suitcase. I didn't feel it was the right time to press the issue any further with a bellhop, but I figured I'd wait and leave the next move up to whoever he might have been working for. During the next three days, nothing happened. I tried, without appearing to be too bold, to arouse some interest, but without success. October 13th, my fifth day at the Plaza Royal Hotel, 6 p.m. I went in the bar off the main lobby. I beg your pardon? Yeah. Kirk Harding's my name. I noticed you here in the bar the last couple of nights. You up here to buy a little, or are you selling? I don't believe I follow you, Harding. Look, boy, we've had you tabbed since that first day you hit town, October 9th. We haven't been out here too long ourselves. We're in business, too. Same business you're in. Well, I don't know what kind of business you think I'm in, but you've got it figured wrong, mister. You know, this entire matter would work out much better for you in the long run if you'd level with me. You're just going to make it tough on yourself this way, but... Well, I'm sorry. You lost me way back somewhere. All right, let's do it the hard way. You're up here from Phoenix. We know you've got some stuff with you. We know you're not a user. You're a member of the social club down there. You're a registered voter. Well, you've been working real hard, haven't well, you? Well, there's more. you got two pieces of luggage. You're carrying a 38 automatic. Any more? Yeah. There's a telegram from a friend of mine down in Phoenix. Yeah? We know all about you, mister. You are listening to Dragnet, authentic cases from official police files. Now, let's look at our Fatima files. Listed under L. Lovett, Vice Admiral Leland P. Lovett, United States Navy, retired. He says... I smoked Fatimas when I was a midshipman. I still do, because they have a better flavor and aroma. Fatima is easily the best of all long cigarettes. Friends, more smokers now insist on king-size Fatimas than ever before. Because in Fatima, the difference is quality. Quality of tobaccos. The finest domestic and Turkish varieties, extra mild, superbly blended to give you a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Quality of manufacture. Smooth, round, perfect cigarettes. Rolled in the finest paper money can buy. Manufactured in the newest and most modern of all cigarette factories. Quality. Even to the appearance of the bright, clean, gold and yellow package. Carefully wrapped and sealed to bring you Fatima's rich, fresh, extra mild flavor. So, if you smoke a king-size cigarette... Compare Fatima. You'll find they now cost the same. But your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Buy Fatima. Smoke the quality king-size cigarette. Fatima. Best of all long cigarettes. <laughs> It was a 
tight moment as Kirk Harding fingered the telegram in the bar of the Plaza Royal Hotel. I'd spent many hours in consultation with Sergeant Roberts in Phoenix, Arizona, before undertaking this assignment. I felt sure that we hadn't overlooked anything that might lead to my true identity. Kirk Harding read the wire to me. It was from a man by the name of George Ferguson. He'd done some legwork for Harding and had not been able to furnish him with anything other than what had been found out in going over my room. I knew I'd found the contact that I was looking for. I told him that I was in the business of buying narcotics, that I was in Los Angeles for the purpose of making a prearranged narcotics buy with agents dealing in Mexican stuff. Harding immediately gave me a strong sales pitch, saying that he could furnish me with high-grade heroin fresh from the European market in quantity. At the end of the first week, I was introduced to Kirk Harding's two associates, another man called Smith, full name Horace L. Smith, and a woman by the name of Lucille Cosgrove. Ben had been unable to find records on any of the three. For the next three weeks, we became more friendly. We went places together, spent a great deal of time together. Monday, November 15th. Well, we've had a lot of fun the last few weeks, haven't we? Yeah, there's no doubt about that, but i got to be getting back to Phoenix. Well, now, don't get eager, Joe. You know how cagey you were. You made us wait. Preliminaries are over. This is the big buy for you or anybody else. Yeah, I know all that, but when? Just be patient. You'll have something to really set yourself up with down there. Okay. Oh, excuse me, Joe. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, hi, Lucille. Hi. Hi, Smith. Hello, Jeff. Hi, Lucille. What's the matter, Smith? Don't you feel good? I don't know. It's hotel food, I guess. I think I got an ulcer. My stomach's sore all the time. Oh, that's too bad. I don't know what it could be. Baking soda don't do any good anymore. How about a drink? Joe? Yeah, fine with me. Lucille, you want to get some ice out of the kitchen, please? Sure. Yeah. Skip me. Smith, you want to go see a doctor? If you don't know for sure what's wrong with you, you might make it worse. If I don't know what it is, how could a doctor? I don't know. It works for everybody else. Might for you. Hey, I can't get this ice tray out. Joe, would you give me a hand, please? Yeah, sure. Okay, which one here? I got the ice. Keep working on that other tray there. It's something to tell you. Okay. Listen, Joe, the big buys tonight. You sure? Yeah. How about it, you two? You need any help? No, that's all right, Kirk. It's come along fine. Joe, as soon as you show your money tonight, they're going to kill you. How do you know? Look, we don't have time to go into it. I know. You won't have a chance. They're going to kill you. What are you doing? Waiting for him to freeze? Come on. How about the ice cream? Oh, they're right here, Kirk. I'm sorry. Let's go. Yeah. Okay, what do you want? Lucille? Joe? Mm. Coke high, sorry. Yeah? Don't make mine bourbon with a little water. All right. Smith, you sure you don't want one? No, I can't do it. Joe, before I mix them, I got something for you. Yeah? Smith tells me tonight's the night. Well, that's good, but why don't you tell me a little ahead of time? I got a date for tonight. Well, I think you better break that one and keep this one, don't you? Well, yeah, I do, but just wish you'd have told me a little sooner. Well, there's the phone. You can take care of it. Is it all right with you? You know as much about this business as we do. Go ahead and use it as long as we can hear you. Okay, fine. Just take a minute. Want to sit here, Joe? Oh, thanks, Smith. Yeah. See, I wonder if you get my drink for me over there. Sure. She's probably going to be upset. I may need it, huh? Romero talking. Hi, honey. This is Joe. Oh, yeah, Joe. I'm sorry I won't be able to make it tonight, dear. That's right, dear. No, I just can't get out of it. I'll do the talking, Joe. Is it by tonight? Yeah, well, it just came up all of a sudden. Where do you know? No, darling, I can't tell you where I'm going. You couldn't go along anyway. Okay, we'll be with you five minutes from now all the way. Where are you now, at the hotel? Well, that's the way it is, and I can't help it, that's all. Maybe we can get together later, huh? We'll use one car, Joe. We'll stick as close as we can to you. One car ought to be safe, huh? Well, that's better, honey. No, that's the way I like to hear you talk. I'm sorry. And I'll see you later, huh? We'll be with you. Okay, dear. Well, she still love you? Yeah, she loves me. Fifteen minutes after I hung up, we went downstairs and got into a green Chrysler sedan. It was parked out in front of the hotel. I looked around. I didn't see Ben or any of our cars in sight. Smith drove, and Kirk and I got in the back seat. The woman, Lucille Cosgrove, remained at the hotel. 
I didn't know which of the two men was planning to kill me, but I felt sure Lucille Cosgrove told me the truth. Her information on the buy was right, and maybe this other was correct as well. We drove out Figueroa Street for about 16 miles. At this point, it became evident we were heading for the Los Angeles Harbor area. You ever see a fog as thick as this, Jim? No, I never have. Can't see 50 feet in front of me. Yeah, well, just take it easy. Nobody's in a hurry. That's right. Don't want to pile up anywhere. Where are we going? We're almost there. This your car here? I've never seen this one before. No, we rented it. Isn't that the way you operate? Yeah, that's right. I just wanted if you played it as safe as I do. We do. I'm going to swing in this next alley up here, Kirk. Somebody tailing us? Keep the lights. Right. See anything out the back window? Wait a minute. How'd they go? How'd it look? The guys in the front seat. Could have been somebody. What do you think, Joe? I'd look to you. Well, whoever it was, we lost him anyway. Yeah. Okay, let's go. Don't see your soul anywhere. No, it's fine. We almost there now? Yeah, just around the corner. This is a break, isn't it? Fog's clear right in here. All socked in back up there. Well, we're as safe as you'd want to be, huh? Yeah, that's right. This is it. Over by the storage building? Yeah, that's right. Come on, let's go. Over this way, Joe. What's over there in that building? We're not going inside, just over there in that alcove. All right, this is it, Joe. Let's see the money. Well, wait till I see the stuff, huh? You don't trust anybody, do you? <laughs> what are you trying to prove? Well, I didn't like what he said. You're not going to like what I got to say either. Freeze, mister. Drop it, you! Watch it, Ben! He ducked in this alcove. Yeah. Oh! Take care of that one there. All right, easy, huh? Yeah, you see him? No, it's too dark. There he is. Mr. Duck! He's coming on! All right, throw your gun out ahead of you. He's not going to throw that gun out, Joe. Watch it. Come on. There's his gun. Yeah, I, I got it. You want to shake him down? Yeah. yeah Come on. Yeah. On your feet. Yeah. Where'd you get hit? I sure. Let me see. You're all right. Just crazy. you. You're a cop, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. Now, come on. Let's go. Where's this stuff? One of the back seat in my car. Now, you tell me something. Why'd you slug Smith? I just wanted something I knew you'd never give me. What's that? An even chance. <laughs> just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On January 4th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 81, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. And now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. Friends, let's compare Fatima with any other long cigarette. Now, Fatimas are the same length, 85 millimeters. Fatima has the same circumference, one and one sixty-fourths inches around. And Fatima filters the smoke exactly the same long distance as other king-size cigarettes. But in Fatima, the difference is quality. You get extra mildness, a different, much better flavor and aroma. That's right. Fatima gives you all the advantages of extra length plus Fatima quality, which no other king-size cigarette has. Tomorrow, buy Fatima. <laughs> All three suspects, Kirk, Arthur Harding, Horace L. Smith, and Lucille Marie Cosgrove, were convicted for violation of the State Narcotics Act, a felony. Harding and Smith were convicted on one count of attempt to commit murder. They are now serving their terms as prescribed by law in the state penitentiaries. 
have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet portions transcribed from Los Angeles. Stay tuned for Counter Spy, next over most NBC stations. is a corn lover. And there's nothing more gratifying to a corn lover than to know that her mother has given her delicious Del Monte family style corn. More people eat it than any other corn like it. It's a special strain developed to be sweet and tender. And when a corn lover is eating Del Monte corn, she probably doesn't need to hear me talking about how good it is, right? Well, then I'm just going to go into the living room and talk about corn to the sofa. That's too good for Daddy and me. Mom brings Del Monte home. Now it's time to pay a visit to Duffy's Tavern. So we take you now to Duffy's Tavern starring Archie himself, Ed Gardner. <laughs> hello, Duffy's Tavern. Where the elite meets eat Archie the manager speaking. Duffy ain't here. Oh, hello, Duffy, old clean old pal. Well, I'm happy tonight. Huh? <laughs> There's pockets for you, Miss Ox. Oh, let's see. Hey, hey, Duffy, somebody just sent me a potted plant for a present. Let's see. And it costs us to Archie from an, an ardent admirer. Well, that could be any one of 10,000 names. <laughs> uh, I'll call you back, Duffy. Let me see that card again, Eddie. Yeah, the handwriting is female, all right. Uh, could it be from your girlfriend, Mildred uh, Defoniak? No. All right, she wouldn't have sent it. Mildred and me had a falling out, you know, kind of a lover's quarrel. Lover's quarrel, huh? Yeah, she got mad at me because I resented her getting married. Uh, you, you, you suppose it could have been that Bertha Kowalski? Uh, Bertha Kowalski Dimitrescu? Yeah. <laughs> Big Bertha, you mean? <laughs> That's right. The one that there was that question about. About whether she was a woman or a horse? <laughs> nah, I never believed that, Eddie. It was just one of them ugly rumors, you know? Of course, there was that one time when she went out to buy a pair of shoes and they caught her sneaking into the Plaxman shop, but... <laughs> nah, I'm sure the dame was human. Uh, well, you think maybe she sent you the plant? Nah, nah. She forgot about me as soon as she started running around with that trainer from Santa Anita. <laughs> Guy had a lot of sugar, you know? <laughs> Wait a minute. You remember me telling you about a dame that picked me up at the Excelsior Ballroom the other night? Peaches Pepnick? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, when we were saying goodnight, she forced her phone number into me hand. And give me that phone, Eddie. Bet you she sent me a plan. Hello? Hello, is Peaches Pepnick there? Oh. Oh, hello, Mr. Pepnick. Uh, let me talk to your daughter, please. She ain't your daughter, she's your... Uh, I'm calling for one of them radio surveys, sir, and what program are you... <laughs> well, thank you, sir. Goodbye. Uh, <laughs> uh, my, my. Uh, what was he listening to? John's other suspect? <laughs> Don't be so smart, Eddie. Well, we'll find out who sent the plant later. In the meantime, uh, leave us take care of it, huh? And nature it. Now, the first thing a plant needs is fresh air. Open the window, Eddie. I hate to do it. Why? Well, you know as well as I do. Any fresh air that comes in here is committing suicide. Now, don't argue, Eddie. Open the window. Well, there was no harm to inhale a little fresh aqua pure and eat it. Oh, okay. Now, Eddie, let's take a deep... <coughs> Eddie, close it. Okay. Oh, that stuff is strong. <laughs> yeah, it might be too strong for a young plant like that. It's liable to catch cold in its little tendrils. Maybe if we, uh, if we just left a little sunlight headed. Sunlight? 
Now, you can't let that stuff in here, neither. You know our customers, they put on dark glasses when the pinball machine lights up. <laughs> oh, no, boy, you, you've certainly taken a fatherly interest in this plant. Well, I can't help it, Eddie. It's the call of nature. You know something about me? What? Well, on the surface, you look at me and you say, there's a typical, sophisticated man about town. I don't. <laughs> Others do. But deep down underneath, believe me, I'm a man of the soil. Maybe it don't show on the surface. It shows. <laughs> well, thank you. I hark to the farmyard, to the cackle of the hen, to the bleat of the heifer, to the good earth and its dragon seed. You got plenty of good earth around here? Yeah, but where, Eddie? On the top of the bar. On the top of the table. Just topsoil. <laughs> I'm talking about the real thing. To get away from it all and go out and commute with nature in the roar. Don't you think you should at least wear a pair of overalls? Eddie, please. Yeah, I guess I'm a bumpkin at heart, Eddie. Even when I was a kid, I was in love with nature and all her various shapes. Of course, as I grew older, the shapes I was in love with became more various. <laughs> I always remember as a kid, as a barefooty boy, you know, I'd sit in my backyard for hours watching the sun sink slowly to rest behind me father's underwear, <laughs> hanging on a wash line, you know. <laughs> on clear nights, I'd gaze up towards the sky and count the thousands of twinkling little lights on Chin Lee's Chop Suey sign. Yeah, my little heart filled with the wonder out of it all. And your little nose filled with new mold carbon monoxide. In fact, one of the happiest moments of my life was when I became a member of the 3rd Avenue Woodcraft Cadets. 3rd Avenue Woodcraft Cadets? Yeah, that was a group that couldn't pass the physical to get into the Boy Scouts. <laughs> yeah, them was the days. We used to go tramping in the woods, hunting and fishing. Every Sunday morning, our leader would gather us all together and say, Well, Cadets, it's time for our tramp. Oh, Well, Finnegan, I was telling Eddie here about the Third Avenue Woodcraft Cadets. Oh. Finnegan here was a member. Right, Finnegan? Right. I think of the cadets every spring when I get me head shaved. Uh, how come? Well, Arch, it still shows where you carved the emblem in me head. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sorry about that, Finnegan, but I, I still swear I thought it was a rock. Well... Does me right for being such a sound sleeper. <laughs> Boy, what days. Remember the signals, Pennington? Oh, like a ton of bricks. Quick, name your troop and give the high sign. Well, look at Ducha, hip hooray, hey, what's that, cadet? Right, fish patrol, fish patrol, splash, splash, splash. Name your patrol and give the high sign. Indian patrol. <laughs> Very good, Pennington. Yeah. I didn't think you'd remember. Oh, I bet you forgot the laws in the handbook, though. Quick. Who is brave and who is fearless? I would crack the death. Who helps old ladies across the street? I would crack the death. Who is happy and gay, come no matter what? I would crack the death. Who should have stood in bed? It agrees. Oh. <laughs> it may sound silly now, Mr. Green, but believe me, it's great fun when you're childish. And again, remember the time we combined with the campfire girls and went for a hike? You know, must have been about 20 of us guys to about 30 dames. Yeah, and one box of sandwiches. Yeah, that's right. Some Jake wanted to eat. <laughs> what do you mean, Jake? I was hungry. <laughs> oh, boy, them was the days. And it was a great education, too. You know, Eddie, we learned all about flowers and plants and gardening. Believe me, if it hadn't been for the cadets, I wouldn't know a chrysanthemum from a roll of doldrums. <laughs> well, uh, what is the difference, Mr. Burdock? Well, Eddie, you see, the chrysanthemum, or as it's uh, technically known, the Hypernicus mandamus, uh, has longer pistols shooting from its fungus. <laughs> While, on the other hand, the roll de doldrum uh, is more like the petunia, or Evictus nox vomicus. <laughs> see, the stem is closer to the roots, and the uh, pollen is more gregarious. <laughs> Uh, oh, answer that, Eddie, will you? Yeah. Hello, Dr. Savin, where the floor meets the floor. Head of the greenhouse, speaking. <laughs> what? Oh, just a second, Mr. Archer. Your nurse in the hospital. Me nice. Hello? Huh? How's me tonsils? Well, you should know better than I do. You got them over there. 
did I get what? Oh, I've been combing me brains to figure out who sent me that plant. Well, that was very sweet of you, Miss McGillicuddy. Thank you very much. Okay. Holy cat, Eddie. I saw that nice every name in a book, stuck pins in a hot water bottle. Told her how ugly she was, threatened to have her fired, and here she sent me a lovely potted plant. What is it with me? <laughs> Must be that personal magnetism of yours. I guess so. Wonder what kind of a plant it is. Let's see. It looks a little like the biannual uh, night blooming eucalyptus. <laughs> Yeah, I think it is. You can tell by the way the moss grows on the north or lee side of the pot. See, uh, that helps make it grow straight up. Oh, this is ridiculous. A vegetable garden in the backyard? Why not? Oh, 
because it's covered with tin cans, broken glass, old shoes, egg crates, garbage cans, old rags, bed foods, iron gates, and Moriarty sleeping one off. But, Eddie, somewhere underneath all of that junk is good things. Old mother right. We could grow radishes, turnips, succotash, uh, <laughs> mangoes, beets. Yeah, I think you got beets in your belt. <laughs> Look, in the first place, even if you got all that junk out of there, which will be very difficult. Yeah. And there is earth under it, which I doubt. Go ahead. And the earth is suitable for planting, which it wouldn't be. Possible. How many vegetables could you plant in 10 square feet of dirt, which probably won't be any good after you dug it out from under that ton of junk that'll be too tough to move anyhow? <laughs> you got yourself into this. Let me see you get yourself out. <laughs> hey, Mr. Hodge, the whole thing is impossible. Eddie, it is not impossible to a man with a dirt mind. <laughs> can all be taken care of with modern methods of soil erosion. Why, <clears throat> there would be a fortune in that garden. I bet you I could make a deal with Karochi, the fruit, fruit peddler, and sell him all his vegetables. Hey, that's an idea, Eddie. Go over to Karochi's store and tell him I want to see him, will you? Uh, hi, Art. Oh, I Finnegan, hey, that's the man I'm looking for. Finnegan, how would you like to have some great fun? Doing what? Well, in the backyard, there's a nice big pile of junk. Think how much fun a guy could have throwing it into a wheelbarrow and cotton it to the dumps. Don't that sound exciting? Oh, Sally. Uh, what's your job worth? Oh, say, half a buck. I'll give you a quarter and not a penny more. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay, Finnegan, it's a deal. Sure. Now, go on and get started. Okay, okay. What is it, Miss Duffy? What's this about a farm in the backyard? What do we need a farm for? Well, what does anybody need a farm for? Where do your vegetables come from? From the can. But where did they come from before that? From the grocery store. But where does the grocery store get them? From the wholesaler. And where does the wholesaler get them from? From the canning factory. Stuffy, are you sure that there ain't a farm in there someplace? <laughs> oh, see, I think it's a very crazy idea, and I'm going to tell that to Papa. Mm, look, Miss Duffy, uh, look at it this way. If we have a farm here at the tavern, it makes your old man a farmer, which in turn makes you a farmer's daughter. <laughs> Sound interesting? Archie, I'm not interested in traveling salesmen. Oh, don't. <laughs> don't let the salesman worry you. They'll probably take one look at you and keep traveling anyhow. Wait a second, Archie. Just what are you insinuating? I am merely insinuating that you are the only dame I know who, when you're getting ready for bed, the guy across the street pulls his shade down. <laughs> Even dames with wigs can become a message in your cabbage patch. Archie, I don't need a cabbage patch. If uh, I put my mind to it, I could become a missus very easily. Well, the rumor is, Miss Duffy, that very few men would marry you. Well, very few would be enough. <laughs> Think it over, wise guy. Hmm. Uh, I don't. Oh, uh, have you got the yard cleaned up yet? Uh, half of it. What about the other half? Well, uh, I'll take more time. That's where I put the stuff I cleaned up from the first half. <laughs> uh, well, uh, maybe you better go back and try it left-handed. Maybe it'll come out even. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. Hello, Archie. How's it, boy? Yeah. Well, Kaluchi, how are you? Oh, honky donkey. Uh, hey, what's the other plant you got there? Well, oh, uh, me nice sense it to make Kaluchi. Uh-huh. What, uh, what the kind of plant is it then? I think it's a uh, eucalyptus. No. That's not a microlyptus. What? That's a eucalyptus. <laughs> that's a joke, Bambina. That's a joke. <laughs> well, I'm glad to see you anyway. Uh, tell me, how's the sonora and all the little seniorities? Uh... <laughs> well, the, the old lady, she's going to have another Bambina. That's right. <laughs> How many bambinos you got now, Kaluch? Well, let me see. There's a Teresa, Maria, Antonette, Carmelita, Lucia, Filomena, 
Grazia, Lucrezia. Uh, look, Carlucci, it's getting late. Just give me a rough pass. <laughs> well, let me see. I think there's about the 14 girls. 14? <laughs> Even for a vegetable man, that's a lot of tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Now, uh, what is the proposition you want to talk to me about? Oh, the proposition, yeah. Uh, Carlucci, uh, tell me. Have you got 50 bucks? Mm-hmm. Very good. Goodbye. <laughs> Just a second, Colucci. At least listen to the proposition, will you? Okay. I listen, but my pocketbook, she is a dead. All right. It's very simple, you see. I happen to be an expert on raising vegetables, and I need a little cash for modern machinery. Electric caterpillars and uh, uh, automatic silos and things like that. Now, now, you're a vegetable man. Just a minute. Just a minute. What kind of stuff do you want to raise? Well, uh, what do you make the most profit on? Well, uh, grapefruit, uh, pineapple, oranges. Just when I was thinking of raisins. <laughs> oranges. <laughs> Coach, how would you like to be the first guy to sell an orange that is both seedless and skinless? <laughs> With a built-in rind. <laughs> and no navel. Like this, eh? I grabbed them from an eggplant. <laughs> More than that, I can't tell you. Put it back on the second half. 
Yeah, I know. Well, then I took the stuff from the second half and put it back on the first half. Well, Finnegan, in that case, you got all of the junk back the way it was. Oh, I thought it looked familiar. <laughs> I... Finnegan, sometimes I think your mother would have been better off if you had delivered the store. <laughs> I'll get back there. Get that Finnegan and try it again. Oh, okay, I... Finnegan, do you? Hey, which back is that? Gee, uh, did you take a look at the backyard? Yeah. Uh, did you raise all this junk by yourself? Oh, I'm afraid you lack imagination. Now, come into the window a minute. Now, I'll tell you how I got a plan. You see that uh, pile of ashes out there? Mm-hmm. Well, between them ashes and that rubber boot will be the uh, pinopla grove. Now, you see Mrs. Duffy's old corset there? Well, between that and that rusty carburetor will be nothing but avocados. <laughs> Over there, where that bottle tea fender and the horsehair sofa are heaped against the no-dumping sign next to the busted coffee grinder, will be, guess what? What? A new vegetable, named after me. The string of beans? <laughs> no, Colucci, not the string bean. The Archie joke. <laughs> now, tell me, what do you think of the whole idea? I can tell you in two words. Archie joke. Now, wait a second, Coach. Hey, Art, I got a surprise for you. A surprise? Yeah, you thought that underneath that junk was nothing but a lot of dirt. Well? You're in luck. The whole thing is cement. <laughs> yeah. Looks like the man is blowing his top, so I'll... Cement. That's what I want to hear. Goodbye, Art. Hmm. Well, I guess that ends that. I guess I got to start all over again. Eddie, hand me that potted eucalyptus plant. Not me. No, I ain't touching that plant. Why not? Well, I had a hunch about that plant, so I looked it up. You know what that eucalyptus turned out to be? What? Only toxic on Benzon Hedera. In other words, poison ivy. <laughs> Don't be silly. That night was nuts about me. Besides, I know poison ivy when I see it. Eddie, would you mind scratching me back? <laughs> if that is poison ivy, Eddie, I'll eat your hat in Macy's window. Sometimes you feel like a nut, sometimes you don't. Almond Joy's got nuts, mounds don't. Almond Joy's got real milk chocolate, coconut and munchy nuts too. Mounds got deep dark chocolate and chewy coconut. Ooh. Sometimes you feel like a nut, sometimes you don't. Peter Paul, Almond Joy's got nuts, Peter Paul, mounds don't. Because sometimes you feel like a nut, sometimes you don't. Another exciting tale of escape is up next. You, finding life rather dull, dreaming again of exotic places, wishing you were somewhere else, we offer you Escape. Escape with us now to the most evil city in the Orient and the story of a beautiful but unscrupulous woman who ruled it. As Herb Purdom tells it, 
in his exciting story, Macau. It's dark. It's raining on my hair, my good dress. Oh, very unimportant now. I only know it's a good night to die. Where do you begin a story like mine? I think it began when the devil gathered the filth and evil of the world. He shaped it into a city and placed it on the south coast of China. He named it Macau. <laughs> and because the devil enjoys a bad joke, he makes me queen of Macau's rottenness. And worse, he made me like it. Maybe you've wanted something. Wanted something so bad you'd kill to get it. I did. I wanted a city. This city. I wanted to own every grimy cafe and waterfront dive in it. I did get some of it. A lot of it. The more I got, the more I wanted. And I nearly got it, too. And six days ago, things began to go wrong. It was at the harbor front one afternoon. Out of my way, you scabby bums. Out of my way before I take this infection. <laughs> That's right, you stinking rabble. Make room. Make Good home. afternoon, Mrs. Rowe. So am I on, Margaret. Did you want something on the docks? Your men have been operating in the city. Your province is on the water, Marsick. You're out of line. So there's plenty left for you. I see. All right, Marsick. And don't forget that on the docks, I'm king. Yeah? Well, long live the king. Only don't bet on us. Goodbye, Marsick. Hey, wait. Uh, there's no reason for us to fight. I'll do Goodbye, any... Goodbye, Marsick. Yeah, of course. Only if I offended you, Mrs. Rose. I'm sorry. We could be friends. I'm on your side. You just be sure you're on my side. Well, lady, that man bothering you. What? If you're unhappy with the way that big character's heart acts, maybe I can help. His heart? Sure. Sure. It just keeps beating and beating. It needs a rest. Oh? Who are you? Johnny Hook. Oh, don't bother to introduce yourself. Everyone in Macau knows Mrs. Connie Rouse. Then you should know I need no help. I have pretty good references. A fellow named Vic Rouse once wrote me I had a job here if I wanted to claim it. You... You knew my husband? Yeah. Yeah, we were bunkmates in the AVG. A little smuggling together once. I heard he was killed. Two years ago. Where have you been? I just finished a hitch with Lou Chimer. The gorilla leader? Yeah. The one they call the White Tiger? <laughs> well, the commies call him worse than that. Mao would hock his hammer and sickle to see old Lu Chan hanging by his heels. I know. Lu Chan's guerrilla army is still holding nearly half of southern China. That's right. Look, my headquarters, the Red Angel, is near here. We can talk there. Well. Perhaps. If you're what you say, you may have a job. If not, well, at least you'll have a chance to taste Willie's punch of the devil. It's good. <laughs> You add a jiggle and a half of cognac and a dash of bitter. Then take a lemon, twist, and rub it gently. That, that, that's very important. You rub it gentle around the rim of each glass. See, most guys toss the twist into the joint, but okay, you know, it's too strong. All you want is just the stink of the lemon. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. You wrap the tongue around and punch it at that <laughs> Thanks, Willie. I don't know about the drink, but your mind will go do. Hey, that's all right. I told you. Well, dummy, what are you waiting for, a medal? Get out, get down to the bar. Sure, Miss Ross, sure. You know, that's what I like, a dame with sentiment. Why don't you just kick him in the stomach and be done with it? He is, Tommy. I'll bet he is. You know, you're pretty, you're smart. I can see why Vic married you. But how do you run a setup like this? Vic spoke Cantonese. He knew the people. You? It isn't necessary. All brain work, huh? Oh, well, honey, you got to be human, too. you got to understand feelings. Like this one, for instance. There. 
Is that all? No. No, I'm liable to kiss you again. For some. What? Well, sliding panels. Who's the Chinese gun -toter? The name is Fu Sun, foolish one. Huh? You look a little old to be playing games. Honey, aren't you being a little melodramatic over a kiss? Shut up. Oh, now, look. Shut up. You think you're tough, Johnny Hook. Too tough to obey a woman. Well, Fu Sun, teach Casanova the penalty from this judging me. Oh, now, hold up, sister. All I did... Just... <laughs> Give him another one, Fu Sun. I don't want him to make a mistake about me again. As you wish. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's softening for some. Pull his head back. He's dripping blood on the rug. <clears throat> All right, Johnny, you're not out. Let's talk a little. What's your name? Johnny Hook. The real one. John Butterfield. We'll call you Hook. You say you knew Vic. Describe him. Tall, dark haired. He had a scar over his right eye. How'd he talk? Drawled. He was a Texan. You wanted any place? No. Ever kill a man? Sure, in the war. Who didn't? Otherwise? A couple. Look, what's with all the talk? Why'd you quit Luchan? Luchan, you fought for the white tag? Sure. Sure, but my salary started coming in the form of promises. I like to get paid for my work. So? That is the economic necessity of life. But you must tell me of Luchan sometime. Later, Fusang. Johnny, you uh, wanted to know how I run this setup. Well, Fusang handles the Orientals. He speaks a dozen dialects. Go on. As a rule, I don't hire white men. I can't be trusted. Maybe I'm an exception. Maybe. We'll see. Your first job will be on a man named Peter Marsick. I want six of his boats destroyed tonight. He'll be supplied with bombs and a fast speed boat. <laughs> While I talked, I watched. I knew from watching him take Fu Sung's blows that Johnny was tough. I hope he was tough enough, for I was lining him up for the world's most dangerous murder. It is dark, little one. We can still see Johnny's boat ahead. You take quite an interest in him. Would you like some gum? No. It is good gum, made in your country. Chewing gum quiet, your nerves. There's nothing wrong with my nerves. Pull into this cove. We can watch from here. Yes. He is ready to make his run. I hope all goes well. Yeah. Shall I mount the machine gun in the rear? If he is pursued too closely, I can discourage them from here as they pass. Perhaps you better. But if it's the police, don't shoot. Of course. He started his run. The gun will be ready in a moment. He's at the line of boats. There they blow. An unfortunate waste of good boats, little one. I want to be sure Marsic never challenges me again. This will stop him. Indeed it will. Those boats cost Marsic a fortune. There. The gun only needs loading. Here comes Johnny. He's got his boat wide open. Behind him, it is clear. No. Little one, look. A police cruiser. Please? Stop him. But little one, you know we must not fire on the Stop police. that cruiser. The men are forward. Try for the engine's ass. No, little one, this is insane. Stop that cruiser or I'll ram it. Very well. No. They did it. They're on fire. They're jumping. Please, little one, let us go. Yeah. You are a fool. Shut up, Fu Sung. I run this thing. You are angry, little one. We will discuss it later. Ah, no more disaster. I'm out of gum. You just started a new stick. It is unfortunate, but I swallowed it. <laughs> Come in, Johnny. Well, honey, Marthick's boat's a matchwood now. Mrs. Rawls. Uh, Mrs. Rawls? I got away clean, but someone did a devil of a lot of shooting behind me. You idiot, you forced us to sink a police cruiser. I forced... 
You mean that was you behind me? Fu Sung and I. You're not with Lu Chan fighting the communists now, Johnny. Fights cost me money. Oh, how? The cops. Well, they won't be able to prove anything, but that's because I dumped a machine gun worth $600. I'll steal your new one. Forget it. You did a good job on the boat. Thanks. Little one, Inspector Kaiwan, downstairs in the club. Thanks, I'll be down. Johnny, you better get out of here and stay out for a day or so. Use the back stairs. All right. Oh, and Connie, uh, Mrs. Rawls. Yeah? Thanks. For what? My life. It's not much, but I like it. You know, if I can keep you around, I may die a natural death yet. I gave Johnny three minutes, and I went down to the nightclub. The Red Angel wasn't only a good front, it was something else. Something special. Just for me. It was smoky enough for a five-alarm fire. And the combined smell of liquor, perfume, and unwashed bodies was enough to make a buzzard back off. But to me, the Red Angel had never lost its fascination. I wouldn't have traded it for heaven. This is Rose, Inspector Kaiwan. We've met. On many occasions. Yes, indeed. The number of our meetings has not dulled my enjoyment of your beauty, madam. Uh, yeah. A drink? Thank you. No. It is my sad duty to try and discover proof of your activities last night. Yes? If you were I, would you use trickery or <laughs> threats? <laughs> Fusang has given me your alibi. Your boats, of course, have been prepared for our visit. That all? I would like to chat for a while. Perhaps I can trick you. You've had your visit. Unless you bring a charge against me, get out. Cops give the place a bad smell. Is it possible? Nevertheless, a year ago, you were more cautious with me, madam. You have given me hope at last. Hope? What hope? The most powerful drug in the world is power. The addict destroys himself. And you, madam, have become an addict. Good night. Escape, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, returns in just a moment. Tomorrow evening, CBS presents over most of these same stations, The Nation's Nightmare, first of six weekly programs exploring organized crime in America. First program in this series of hard-hitting exposés will be titled The Narcotic Evil. Gathered from major centers of addiction, information about government activity against this vice, words spoken by its victims, and the progress in the fight to correct it will be reported tomorrow night on The Nation's Nightmare over CBS. And now, back to Escape. <laughs> fascinated by the smell of evil. Even when I was a little girl, I used to pretend my dolls were... <laughs> well, no matter. Let's say I was bad to begin with. The only wages I wanted to earn were the wages of sin. Above all, I wanted to be bad in a big way. And in Macau, 6,000 miles from my hometown, I made it. That's only me, Mrs. Walsh. Well, come on in, dummy. Don't stand there. Yes, ma'am. Two drinks, Willie, and make them good. You know, not talk like that to me, Mrs. Ross. Call me a dummy. That isn't very nice. Oh, shut up. Just mix the drinks and turn on that blasted fan before I suffocate. Yes, ma'am. I'm uh, going to leave you, Mrs. Ross. I'm going home. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, the drinks, Willie. Dream about home tomorrow. I will. That's when I'm gone. I saved my money. Yeah, yeah. See? It's all in this wallet. I'm going home after ten years. Well, you really do have the money. Yes, ma'am. I'll make the trick. Do that. Evening, Connie. Oh, hi, Willie. How's the drinking business? Oh, people still doing it. They always do it. I'm going home, Johnny. Tomorrow. Willie. Hold on. The... Willie, Johnny's not interested. Get out. Sure, Mrs. Ross. Sure. 
are you trying to prove, Connie? What do you mean? Kicking that poor guy around to make you feel good. He's a dummy. He doesn't care. Help yourself to the drinks and hand me one. I'll call down and make amends to Willie. Yeah, you do that. There you are. Thanks. Who's on? Willie's on his way down. Give him the night off and tell him the drinks are on me. Yeah, champagne. And listen, he's carrying a bankroll. See that he doesn't have it in the morning. Mm-hmm. That's right. Oh, and that champagne. Make it the cheap kind. So Willie doesn't get home after all. He's a good bartender when he's sober. And I like these. Well, that's a good reason to bust the man's drink. Inspector Carwan has dropped his investigation. He knows it's you. He can't touch me. I'm too big. Yeah, yeah you're too big. But it's nothing to what it will be. And you too, Johnny. If you can bear the way I treat my bartender. No, oh, I'm a louse already. I may as well go all the way. A quarter of a million dollars? What? Help you make the trip? A quarter? Hey, how many of those drinks have you had? You want in? Do I want to breathe? It's a big order. Dangerous job. So is the war, only it didn't pay so well. Go on. Mao's communists are taking over in China. I'm going to help them for a quarter of a million dollars. And. And? Macau. Macau? You mean the whole city? The whole city. Well, well, I give you credit, baby. You go nuts in a big way. Well, I've made the deal. All right, break it down for me. It's very simple. You'll assassinate the guerrilla leader, Lu Chen. Johnny's face was the color of blue cheese as he stared at me. But I knew the power of money over men like him. A quarter of a million would buy better scruples than his. And in case he needed extra encouragement, I gave him an additional promise and a kiss. We both liked it. Oh, baby, baby. Johnny, again. You love me? Yes, I do. Johnny? Hmm? You'll do the job? Sure, sure. I'll start making plans right away. Good. Keep in mind what you're working for. A quarter of a million dollars. Me. I'll drink your drink, honey. The ice is melting. <laughs> I should stop now. I never win against you, Fu Sung. Uh, four of diamonds. This is all. you got to give it back to me. You, you stole my money. It ain't money. Give it back. Now, Willie, don't blame me if you got drunk and were rolled. Please, please, I... I see for ten years to get that money. Jack of hearts to you, Fu Sung. Hey, give it back to me or I'll, I'll, I'll kill you. See, I got a gun. Don't be a fool, Willie. Huh? She is right, Willie. Don't be a fool. <laughs> There are at least 200 men who would make sure you never left Macau alive. They would get you in an alley, in the street, somewhere. You know they would. All I want is my money. Maybe I'll call the police. Who's your next of kin, Willie? What? My next of kin? Your health is getting bad. Oh, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. I, I, I didn't want to blab the police. I, I, I was just kidding. I was sure you were. Get out of here, Willie, and leave the gun. Sure. Sure, Mrs. Ross, sure. Here. Ah, dummy. Got a salary ten dollars, Lu Sung. He saves too much. Three to you. Jim. Jim! I have the devil's own luck. <laughs> I guess I just don't live right. been a good night. The money flowed in. Good. Tell Willie to make me a drink. Go on, Frankie. Good evening, Mrs. Rawls. It is indeed a lovely melody. No, oh, hello, Inspector. Slumming? Slumming? I do not believe I understand this word. Forget it. Play some more, Frankie. I, I brought you word that I thought might distress you. 
Peter Marsic committed suicide an hour ago. So? So it is considered humane to be sad when an acquaintance meets violent end. Especially when I'm supposed to have blown up his boats and driven him to it, huh? Get out of here, Brad. As you wish. You seem to hold my work in great disfavor. Look, Inspector Carwan, I don't like cops. And I don't like you. So do me a favor and stay away from me. Good night, Mrs. Rawls. Oh, good evening, Mr. Hook, I believe. Yeah. Good evening, Inspector. Um, uh, Taiwan, I believe. Taiwan. Hi, Connie. That's a nice tune. What is it? Softly as the morning sunrise. My favorite. Thanks, Frankie. Come on over to the bar, Johnny. I've got a drink waiting. Wally, fix me one, will you? I need it. Sure. Well, Johnny, figured out your plan? Yeah. Well? Oh, don't mind Willie there. Tell me. I figured out a way to kill Luchan, but I'm not going to do it. Say that again. You heard right, Connie. I'm out of the deal. Yeah, Johnny. Thanks. Oh, boy, you're still as good as ever. Thank you. Glad you like it. Johnny Hook, you're not backing out of this deal. I'm already out. Oh, look, Connie, you had me tabbed right, I guess. For that kind of money, I'd kill a man. But not if it means the end of what a lot of guys I knew died for. Died for? This will mean more power for us than we ever dreamed. I don't dream. I have nightmares. How about you and I, Johnny? Doesn't that count at all? I told you once, Connie. Sometimes it isn't just brain work. You have to understand the way people feel. Oh, I'm sorry. You don't know what I'm talking about. Johnny! Johnny! That sentimental fool. You're forcing you me to... a drink, Mrs. Ross? No, I'm going upstairs. Clean up and lock up. And if you drink any of the liquor, pay for it. Ah, little one. I'm just finished. Would you care for some gin rummy? Johnny Hook has just betrayed us. He just left. You know what to do. Johnny... But how? Never mind how. Pass the order along. You know what you are doing. Once I give that order, he is a dead man. That's the kind of a man I want him to be. Do as I say. Yes. Good night, little one. I will tell them to make it quick. We'll never know what happened. Johnny would never know. But I would. I sat at my desk, staring through two blank eyes at the room. Only I was seeing Johnny walking Macau Street, past this alley and the next, always going closer to the one that held his desk. I looked out at the window and saw it was beginning to rain. Go away. I give the order, Mrs. Rowe. Then go away. What did you call me? Mrs. Rowe. I'm your little one. You're... There is no little one. You killed her when you plotted to betray my people. What? So Willie shot off his mouth. As you say, Willie shot off his mouth. All right, so I didn't tell you about it. I would have cut you in on it later. Even now you do not understand. You betrayed my people, the men who make up your organization, me... We shun is all that stands between us and communist slavery. Get a soapbox, patriot. Everybody's waving a flag tonight. I wished only to tell you that you were through in Macau. You forgetting I own this place? This and all the other places, the cars, the boats, the guns, everything? But I control the men. So I'll get new men. Now get out. Get out. Get out, I'm sick of the sight of you. Certainly. Only, it is just fair to tell you, Mrs. Rawls, the penalty for betrayal in our organization is death, as you know. I pass the order for yours tonight. How could it happen? One morning I was all powerful and my plans were set to make me owner of Macau. And then I was alone, my power gone, and I was just another woman. 
too. Other than that, the there outside the wet window was my desk waiting for me. Somehow I found myself driven to meet it. I went down and out into the rain. Well, hello there, cutie. How's about a nice warm drinky, huh? Hey, what's the matter? Too big to drink with a sailor? Snooty James. Which one? Which doorway was it? Clean, so clean. The cow glistened like a polished black diamond now. I wish I'd gotten up early more often. I never realized how wonderful it is to see a sunrise. I like walking in the early morning. Perhaps if I hurry, I can catch Johnny. Under the direction of Norman MacDonald, Escape has brought you McCowl by Herb Purdom, starring Michael Ann Barrett and Stacey Harris with Raymond Burr. Featured in the cast were Lou Krugman, Charles Lung, Paul Dubov, and Frank Gerstle. The special music for Escape is composed by Leif Stevens and conducted tonight by Wilbur Hatch. Escape with us to the outer limits of space and the terrifying experiences of five men who penetrated it. As Ray Bradbury, famous science fiction writer, tells it in his gripping story, The Earth Men. Immediately after station identification over most of these same CBS stations, yours truly, Johnny Dollar, played by Edmund O'Brien, investigates the Neil Breer matter for an insurance company. Finding his victim buried a week, Johnny Dollar goes to work uncovering one shocking fact after another. As his expense account mounts, so does the action and excitement. Stay tuned for Edmund O'Brien as yours truly, Johnny Dollar, next on most of these same CBS stations. Roy Rowan speaking. CBS, where you hear the FBI in peace and war every Thursday night on the Columbia Broadcasting System. Sounds like you've accidentally invented a thermochemical energy source. A scientific wonder becomes a nightmare. Someone's walking around. With enough explosive to turn the city into a pancake. A power that could mark the beginning of the end for the six million dollar man. Now let's see what Fibber McGee and Molly are up to. <laughs> the Johnson Wax program with Fibber McGee and Molly. <laughs> Makers of Johnson's Wax and Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coat present Bibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn, with music by the King's Men and Billy Mills Orchestra. The show opens with Love Is. I wonder how many of you ladies were in the midst of your spring house cleaning today. I'd like to say a few words, especially for your benefit, on the subject of protective housekeeping. That's a very important subject because it offers you a chance to save work and to save money. Let me explain just what I mean by protective housekeeping. 
Instead of keeping your floors, furniture, and woodwork clean during the year by scrubbing and dusting, you protect them against dirt and against wear with a tough coat of Johnson's paste or liquid wax. Then that coat of wax wards off scratches and dirt, makes cleaning and dusting much easier throughout the year, and makes annual spring house cleaning a much simpler affair. Dust and dirt cannot cling to a smooth, wax-polished surface. Fingerprints are quickly wiped away. Traffic areas on floors can be touched up without re-waxing the entire floor. When you consider that Johnson's Wax adds a rich glow of beauty to floors, furniture, and woodwork, that it has 100 extra labor-saving uses, then you should certainly try protective housekeeping with Johnson's Wax in your home. Insist on the genuine Johnson's Wax. Ever throw a kiss to a beautiful girl? Unsatisfactory, wasn't it? (laughs) So is a birthday without a birthday cake. And our hero is not the man to see his life partner neglected in this way. So, here at 79 Wistful Vista, cookbook in hand and a determined gleam in his eye, while his spouse stands by full of love and skepticism, we find Fibber McGee and Molly. Oh, now, McGee, please, don't go to all that trouble. Put that cookbook down. What? If you must have a birthday cake for me, go out and buy one. No, sirree, I'm going to bake this with my own ever-loving hands. (laughs) This is going to be a cake like you never flung a thing into. I'll bet it is a thing. (laughs) What kind of a cake is it going to be, dearie? Oh, shucks, I can't tell you that. It's going to be a surprise. Now, you go on in the other room and read a book or something. Oh, let me watch it. Ah, you'll keep trying to tell me how to do things. No, I won't, really. Okay, then. Sit down and be quiet. Don't smoke till you're speaking to... Or, I mean, just keep quiet. Now, let's see. Budget cakes, sponge cakes, angel food cakes, upside-down cakes, party cake. Ah, party cakes. Party cake, party cake, baker's man. Uh, now, remember your promise. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Page 24. Oh, here we are. Six eggs separated. Hey, Molly, where's the eggs? In the refrigerator. Why, that's no place to keep eggs. Takes twice as long to fry them when they're cold. (laughs) I never thought of that. I'll keep them in the oven after this, dearie. (laughs) Uh, Let's see now. Eggs, milk, butter, horseradish. That'll do, I guess. Heavenly days, you won't need all those pots and pans, will you? Look, now, you cook your way and I'll cook my way. Here, you hold three eggs and I'll put three of them back here on the shelf. What's the idea? What's the idea? The recipe says to separate six eggs. (laughs) Okay, there's a cup and a half of sugar. Four cups of shifted cake flour. (laughs) Quarter of a teaspoon of salt. Hmm, no pepper. (laughs) Two squares of chocolate. Okay, give me them eggs again. I guess they've been separated long enough. (laughs) One, two, three, four, let's see, five. Boy, that's a lot of eggs. I should have bought you a fur coat. It would have been cheaper. (laughs) Ah, me. Where's the egg beater? Right there in the drawer, right in front of you. Though I always use a fork myself. Yeah, that's the trouble with you women. Some unsung genius spends his lifetime inventing the egg beater to save you trouble. And what do you do? Ignore it and use a fork. (laughs) Well, now listen, you men are no better. What you mean? You spend your young manhood looking for a good cook to marry and then mess around the kitchen yourself. (laughs) Near, what are you doing? I'm squirting a little sewing machine oil on this egg beater. Dear, dear. It's kind of stiff. But listen, your cake will taste like oil. Oh, no, no, no. I took care of that. I mixed a little vanilla in with that oil. <laughs> yeah, that's better. Oh, boys. Come in. Oh, dear. Hello there, kids. How you fix for postage stamps? I don't know, old timer. How many you want? Don't want any. I'm selling them. Two cent stamps for one cent. Today only. Heavenly days. How on earth can you do that? 
Forgot to mail my Christmas cards this year, daughter. <laughs> Just found them and soaked the stamps off. <laughs> How many you want? For every 50 you buy, I throw in a little bottle of glue. <laughs> Hey, what you doing there, Johnny? Well, it's my birthday, Mr. Oldtimer. He's baking me a cake. He is, eh? You know how to cook, Johnny? <laughs> well, we'll soon know. What do you mean, do I know how to cook? Sure, I know how to cook. I'm not only a cook, I was the greatest vegetable and fruit man in Peoria at one time. I never knew that, McGee. Well, I've been covering it up. That's why. <laughs> I wrecked my career. I was a failure. <laughs> How's that, Johnny? It's any of my business, which it ain't, but I'm interested, and when a feller's interested, you can forgive a certain inquisitiveness because... Okay, 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 I'll tell you. <laughs> I was trying to raise a seedless watermelon, and I done it, too. And that's what finished me. Oh, well, if you succeeded, why did it finish you? Caused a terrific demand for seedless watermelons, and I couldn't fill it. Why not? I couldn't grow them. Why not? No seeds. <laughs> saying, one feller says to tell the feller, see, he says. <laughs> yes, sir, old timer. I had such a knack with flowers and vegetables, I could even bring them back to life long after they'd wilted. Why, well, take an old wrinkled beet and give it the McGee treatment, and presto, back from the dead. Dead beet McGee, I was not that. <laughs> Say, how about my cake? Dead beat McGee, the ding-dong daddy of the dirt doctors, drudging in the ditches from dawn to dusk over discolored, decrepit, and darn near defunct daisies, dog wooden deodars, dazzling daughters with my debonair displays of dilly dahlias, daffy daffodils, and dandy dandelions discovered and developed by dead beat McGee, the diggity digger and daddy dude from down on the delta and deep in Dixie, but shucks, I sound like a dad ratted pixie. <laughs> flour and salt together and fold into the oak mixture. Hey, you know where my tin snips are? What on earth you want tin snips for? I gotta cut down a teaspoon. It says oh. here to put in a fourth of a teaspoon of salt. <laughs> to make a fourth of a teaspoon. <laughs> Don't be silly. Just fill it a fourth full. Huh? Oh, say, I could do that, couldn't I? <laughs> you know it was silly all the time. Yeah, those bowlers from Peoria left there. <laughs> Baby, is this going to be a cake? I'll bet it'll be a cake. I'll bet this will make Prudence Penny feel like a nickel. <laughs> I would have made you upside-down cake, but I don't have much luck with those. 
The blood keeps rushing to my head. <laughs> Go see who that is at the front door, will you, Molly? I gotta finish mixing this batter. All right, dearie, and I hope it gets to first base. Huh? Oh. <laughs> I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Oh, can he bake a birthday cake, fibber boy, fibber boy? Can he bake a birthday cake, charming fibber? He can bake a birthday cake that'll make your molars ache, but he's a young thing and cannot leave his mother. <laughs> Oh, McGee, it's Mrs. Uppington, and she wants to... Ah, what is that old fuss? McGee, I said it's Mrs. Uppington, and she... Tell the old moose I don't... Oh! Hi, Uppy. (laughs) (laughs) Good day, Mr. McGee. Good day. May I ask what you imagine you're concocting there? Well, it's a cake for me, Abigail. This is my birthday. Oh, really? Well, congratulations, my dear. (laughs) I won't ask which one it is, because I know. (laughs) Oh, yeah? Well, which one? (laughs) Her last one, if she eats any of that cake. (laughs) Oh, I don't know, Uppy. I swing a pretty nasty casserole when I put my mind to it. (laughs) Really? Yeah, yeah, betcha. (laughs) Let me know when your next birthday limps around and I'll whip you up a cake, too. (laughs) Only give me plenty of notice. (laughs) Why, Mr. McGee? Well, you don't think we could get enough candles right here in town on short notice. (laughs) Well, I must say, Mr. McGee, yes, that I that's think... right. That was a very bad insinuation, dearie. I'm sure Abigail isn't many years older than I am. <laughs> Though I was a little flower maiden at your wedding. Remember, Abigail? Oh, indeed I do, my dear. <laughs> indeed I do. <laughs> Even though I was still a slip of a girl at the time, I remember asking an usher to get you a chair. You looked so tired. <laughs> well, uh, I was just tired from laughing so hard. What was the joke? <laughs> <laughs> Otis Cadwallader, you oh, know. Oh, that mug. <laughs> Otis was one of the little boys who was carrying the train of Abigail's wedding dress, and he had it a little too high, and he whispered that the bride was bow-legged. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I ever believed it, Abigail. Well, I should hope Until I saw you in your job purse. <laughs> Please, Mrs. McGee, I... I think the discussion of my nuptials has gone far enough. Yes, me too, girls. We sure <laughs> squeeze that subject dry. <laughs> Let's get back to birthdays. You want me to bake a cake for your birthday, too? Thank you. Time? No, Mr. McGee. I have all my special pastry made by an expensive caterer. Oh. My last birthday cake cost me $75. Oh, not really. Did you demand an itemized bill, Abigail? Itemized? Yeah, it was probably five bucks for the cake and 70 bucks hush money. <laughs> <laughs> Really, Mr. McGee? Well, I have never been snubbed like this in all my life. Honest, Abigail? You ought to walk down the street in San Diego some night when the fleet's in. (laughs) (laughs) Poor Abigail. Yeah. Well, how are you doing with your cake? Well, it's coming along swell, though it's kind of tricky folding these egg whites. They, they won't hold a crease. <laughs> hey, I haven't got enough sugar. No, I don't. That rat can't a guy bake a cake in peace around here? Come in. Why don't people... Oh, good day, Mr. Wimple. How do you do? <laughs> May I step in a moment out of the wet? Oh, is it raining? No, I've been crying. <laughs> Poor man. Come right in. What's the matter? It's my wife. Oh. We had a terrible argument this morning, and I'm afraid I lost my temper. Oh. I actually shook my fist at her. You did, eh? Was she scared? Fortunately, she didn't see me. (laughs) You know, I think you're just too meek, Mr. Wimple. You should stand up for your rights. A woman has no respect for a man she can dominate. Oh, I know that, Mrs. McGee. And I really went round and round with her once. Did it do any good, Wimple? <laughs> yes, for a while. But as soon as I got out of the hospital, it started all over again. <laughs> it's really discouraging. Oh. Well, what can we do for you, Mr. Wimple? I just wondered if you had a small piece of raw beefsteak I could borrow. My wife has a black eye. What? A black eye? Why, Wimple, you mean you actually... Oh, no, Mr. McGee. She tried to chase a dog out of our yard and stepped on the rake. 
flew up and hit her in the eye. Oh, well, that's too bad, but I'm sorry we haven't got a bit of raw beefsteak in the house. Personally, I never thought much of that beefsteak treatment for black eyes anyway, Wimple. Oh, I didn't want it for her eye, Mr. McGee. Huh? I was going to give it to that dog, bless his heart. <laughs> Poor Mrs. Wimple, that must have been a very painful experience. No, oh, I don't know. It's probably the only time in her life an old rake ever made a pass at her. <laughs> must have been quite a... Hello, folks. What's it? The... Oh, say, what goes on? Molly's birthday, Harlow. I... Harlow, Harlow. I'm running up a cake. Really? Well, many happy returns, well, Molly. Well, thank you, Mr. Wilcox. And the balance of the day to yourself. Here, let me give you a hand with that cake, Fibber. No, no, let go, Harlow. I, I don't want... Hey, look out! Oh. oh, now, Mr. Wilcox, see what you boys did? Spilled a big gob of batter on my linoleum. Yeah. Oh, that's all right, Molly. It's a simple matter to wipe it up with a damp cloth. That is, if your linoleum is protected with... Uh... We know. Johnson's self-polishing glow coat. <laughs> and you spilled that stuff on purpose so you could drag in a sales talk. The idea is if you had to prove to me, of all people, how Johnson's glow coat protects the linoleum. Yes, I'm sorry. I should have known I wouldn't have to tell you how it's so easy to apply and shines itself as it dries and how it brings out the original luster and beauty of the pattern. Why, what was I thinking of anyway? Aren't you ashamed? Yes, I feel pretty bad. Well, just for that, I won't give you a piece of this birthday cake when it's done. <clears throat> really? No. <laughs> oh, now I do feel bad. <laughs> oh, that's awful. No cake. <laughs> I guess that'll teach me a lesson. Well, happy birthday, Molly. <laughs> no cake. <laughs> The trouble with that guy is he's got a single-track mine. And it's full of freight cars loaded with Johnson's wax. <laughs> well, how about that sugar? Well, I'll go right away, dearie. No, dear. no, now, wait a minute. It's your birthday, and you're not supposed to do anything. I'll get it. Here, untie this apron. Thanks. I'll be back in just a minute. I'll run Can I borrow a cup of sugar until tomorrow? Hi, mister. What's cooking? And what? Oh, hi, sis. Is your mother home? Sure she is, I betcha. May I see her a minute? No. Huh? I said no. What do you mean, no? You tell your mother I want to see her, will you? You can see her, mister. Now, don't be obstinate, sis. I'm not being obstinate, I betcha. I'm being nice. Well, what's so nice about not letting me see your mother? She's taking a bath. <laughs> Well, why didn't you say so? Well, you didn't ask me. Hmm. Well, look, maybe you can handle this deal yourself. How's about the loan of a cup of sugar, sis? Well, I'm for graduated. <laughs> you mean granulated. Hmm? I says you mean granulated. Graduated means when you get out of school. I know it. I bought this sugar this afternoon on the way home. <laughs> I mean, you know. Well, how about it, sis? <clears throat> Mister, I told you once you can't see her. She's taking the bath, don't you remember? I'm talking about a cup of sugar. Forget your mother. I will not. She never forgets me. I, I didn't mean that you should. Look, let's start over. All righty. Hi, sis. Can I borrow a cup of sugar? <laughs> that isn't the way you did it before. <laughs> you asked if you could see my mother. Well, I'm doing it different this time. All I want is a cup of sugar. What you gonna do with it? Oh, I'm baking a cake. Oh. <laughs> no fooling, mister. What do you want with it? I told you I'm baking a cake. It's my wife's birthday. Can you really cook, mister? Can you really, hmm? Certainly I can cook. Come over and see the cake in a couple of hours. I'll, I'll cut you a slice. Gee, I wish I had a slice of it now, I bet you. Why? I'm... Oh, you know. <laughs> Wait here and I'll go get you some sugar, mister. The King's Men sing Three Blind Mice. Three blind mice, three little innocent mice. 
number one is thin. Number two is fat. Number three is so fierce he scares the cat. I'm number one. Number two. Number three. Three brave mice. Three hungry mice. Three hungry mice. They lived in a farmhouse out in the sticks with a farmer and his little old wife. The thin little mouse had a very long nose to sniff the slightest breeze. One day he sniffed with his very long nose and shouted, I smell cheese. The fat little mouse took hold of his tail. The thin one led the way. The fierce little mouse brought up the rear to chase the cat away. Three hungry mice, three hungry mice, scampering off to find the cheese and cut themselves a slice. soon as I finish squirting happy birthday to Molly onto it. <laughs> D-A-Y-T-M-O-L... Uh-oh. You don't mind if I just call you Mal, do you? <laughs> I started too big and I ain't got room on here for Molly. Oh, that's all right, dearie. I think it looks beautiful. Shall I get the candles? No, I'll get them. Where are they? In the hall closet. Okay, you get them. <laughs> I won't get men, uh, many either. Huh? <laughs> I don't... <laughs> Ma'am? <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't want to be like the girl who said she was 21, and when they brought on the cake, it looked like a prairie fire. <laughs> <laughs> that gag will never be 21 again either. <laughs> Can he bake a birthday cake, Fibber boy, Fibber boy? Can he bake a birthday cake, Charlie Fibber? He can mix a batter up into a nifty hunk of stuff, but Here's he's... Here's the candles, dearie. What? Here they are. Here's the candles. What? You mean you opened that hall closet without a... I don't believe it. <laughs> Let me go take a look. You start putting the candles on the cake. All right, dearie. I'll do that. Oh, dear. Who's that now? Come in. Oh, there, Mrs. McGee. Uh, good day. Oh, hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, mm -hmm. I see you've been baking yourself a cake. <laughs> Looks delicious. Oh, I didn't bake it, Mr. Gildersleeve. McGee did it. What? Why, that... He did? <laughs> Why, that little cake cooker. <laughs> well, I must congratulate the little rascal. Where is he? Well, he just went in the other room to check up on the... <laughs> Uh, checking up, eh? <laughs> I hope he survived it. <laughs> so he baked this cake, did he? Well, I see it's a birthday cake for you. Mm -hmm. Well, congratulations, my dear. Well, thank you, Mr. Gildersleeve. My goodness, this is an occasion. I'll just have to have a piece of this cake in honor of your birthday, Mrs. McGee. Oh, now you better wait for McGee, Mr. Gildersleeve. He might be annoyed if Oh, you... my little chum wouldn't begrudge me a little piece of cake. Come, come now, my dear. Hand me a knife. <laughs> thank you. Ah... Uh... Well, it cuts nicely, doesn't it? <laughs> Care for some yourself? No, thank you. Not now. I'll wait till... Oh, hi, it. Gildersleeve. Hello, uh, uh, McGee. Why? Uh, uh, he thought you wouldn't mind his taking a piece of your cake, dearie. 
Well, of all the dead dreaded nerves. You... I baked that cake for my little wife, Gildersleeve. You got a lot of brass barging in here and hogging the first piece. <laughs> Why? Uh, now, look here, McGee. <laughs> Whose birthday is this, yours or your wife? Well, it was my cake, and you didn't have any right to... Oh, it. now, forget it, McGee. Yeah. After all, it is my birthday, and I don't want any bickering. Well, shucks, if this big lard bucket had the manners of a well-bred hyena, he'd have known better than to come barging... Hey, look at Throckmorton. He, he's turning purple. Oh! <laughs> Heavenly days. What's the matter, Mr. Gildersleeve? Ah, oh, don't fuss about him, Molly. He'll do anything to attract attention. <laughs> oh. Quit clowning, you big ape. No, McGee, he's not clowning. There's something the matter with him. He's pointing to his throat, huh? see? Oh, do you suppose... Hey, Gildersleeve, what's the matter? Oh, oh. What did you put in that cake, you little criminal? I swallowed something. Get me a doctor, quick. Oh, my gosh, she did it. Quick, Molly, call an ambulance. We got to get him to a hospital. Oh, Hurry up. oh, now, wait a minute. Take it easy now. He just swallowed a nutshell or a cork out of the vanilla bottle. Oh. Or <laughs> Do something quick, McGee. Maybe it was ground glass. <laughs> Hurry up, Molly, call an ambulance. This is serious. Go on. Here, Gildersleeve, uh, lie down here on the kitchen table. Yeah. Loosen your collar and tie. Yeah. Now, take it easy. Oh. <laughs> What was it, McGee? What did I eat? Now, don't worry, Gildersleeve. You'll be all right as soon. Yeah. Go faster, driver. We'll have you in the hospital in three minutes, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh. And maybe this will teach you not to make a pig of yourself, Rocky. I know. I'm sorry, McGee. And I, I certainly appreciate all the trouble you're going to, to to save me, little chum. What do you mean, save you? I baked a diamond ring in that cake for Molly. That's what I'm trying to save. Oh. Take it up, driver. Save you. Ever and Molly will be back in just a moment. You know, every now and then it's a good idea to get back to fundamentals. The other day a lady asked me, why does Johnson's self-polishing glow coat make linoleum last longer? That's certainly a fundamental question and deserves an informative answer. Here it is. In the old days, women used to scrub their linoleum floors at least once a week in an effort to keep them clean. Now, every linoleum manufacturer will tell you that continual scrubbing actually ruins linoleum. It softens the finish and finally makes it warp and split. In the meantime, the colors fade. Johnson's Glow Coat eliminates this continual scrubbing. It actually covers the linoleum surface with a hard coat that protects it against scratches and scuffing feet and preserves the colors bright and fresh. Many women tell us that Glow Coat makes their linoleum last six times longer than when it was unprotected. And besides this protection and beauty, Johnson's Glow Coat saves hours of work because it is self-polishing, needs no rubbing or buffing whatsoever. If you don't have a supply of Johnson's Glow Coat on hand, be sure and add it to your next shopping list. Well, McGee, this should teach you a lesson to stay out of the kitchen. You know, it's no place for a man. Is that so? Well, don't forget to remember the highest paid cooks in the world are men. Why, of course they are. Betcha. Women are too smart to spend 12 hours a day over a hot stove. Huh? Oh, <laughs> good night. Good night, all. <laughs> This is Harlow Wilcox, speaking for the makers of Johnson's Wax Finishes for the home and for industry, inviting you to be with us again next Tuesday night. Good night. George, I'm getting ashamed of the looks of our car. I just won't ride in it till you get it polished. Now, that might be serious if it weren't so easy to clean and wax polish a car these days. Now that we have Johnson's Car New, the sensational auto polish that both cleans and wax polishes in one application. If you're getting a little ashamed of the looks of your car, just stop at your dealers. Buy a can of Car New and have the fun of riding in a new-looking car again. Ask for Johnson's Car New. C-A-R-N-U. This is the National Broadcasting Company. America's classic thrillers come to life. The Hardy Boys' Nancy Drew Mysteries. An adventure into suspense. There's got to be a way out of here. Can you used to go with her? Forget that. Oh, Professor, do ghostly footprints? The adventures of America's favorite young detectives come to television. Follow that ghost. The Hardy Boys' Nancy Drew Mysteries.
Now it's time to pay a visit to the only man in old time radio who wrote all his own material, Fred Allen. And here's the Fred Allen Show, presented by the makers of Shepherd Cheese and Tender Leaf Tea. And while Fred Allen is pinning on his Tom Marshall's badge for his trip down Allen's Alley, let's talk a moment about Shepherd Cheese. In our enthusiasm for the Sunday night toasted cheese sandwich and for Shepherd Chevelle, C-A-C-V-E-L, Chevelle cheese food as the ideal way to make it, let's not forget that after all, Chevelle is a main dish food, too. It has that fine, natural cheese flavor that's perfect for a cheese omelet or souffle. Yet Chevelle is mild enough to blend perfectly with many other foods, fish, seafood, vegetables, and tangy enough to spark up bland foods like spaghetti macaroni or noodles. All of these are fine Lenten dishes if you give them the genuine, distinctive flavor of Chevelle. Remember Chevelle, quick to melt, smooth to spread, easy to slice. And get it tomorrow in the bright red package when you shop. Chevelle is made by the Shepherd folks, quality cheesemakers for more than 40 years. So always say Shepherd, S-H-E-F-F-O-R-D, Shepherd for fine cheese. Commencing to this. <laughs> the makers of Shepherd Cheese and Tender Leaf Tea present the Fred Allen Show with Fred's guests, the Quiz Kids, Portland Hopper, Manava Pius, Peter Donald, Parker Fenley, the DeMarcos, Al Goodman and his orchestra, and oh yes, Kenny Delmar. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the world observes the 100th anniversary of the birth of Alexander Graham Bell. Tonight, paying tribute to the telephone, we bring you a man with two rings under his eyes. And here he is, Fred Allen. Thank you. Thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And, and uh, Portland, I'm sure I thought you'd never get to me the way you were going. I'm glad you mentioned, in the same breath with me, I'm glad you mentioned Alexander Graham Bell. Oh, he was a great man. Yes, he was, Portland. Just think, Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone. And if he was alive today, he probably couldn't even get one. <laughs> That's a light one. We start with little light ones. <laughs> You see what happens as we go along. <laughs> Even if it's nothing, you will see what happens. <laughs> Mama says Bell may have invented the telephone, but Dr. Gallup invented the pole. <laughs> well, that wasn't one for you, too. Well, never mind that. Tell me what, uh, tell me, Portland, what's in the news this week? Admiral Bird is leaving Little America. Why? Oh, he heard there was more snow back here. Really? <laughs> I read it was so cold at Little America, when the men played cards, every time they dealt a hand, they had to put a mitten on it. <laughs> I think we kept that joke up too late. It's a little... <laughs> that joke is a little tired, I think. It's been up too late. Why do we have cold jokes every week? Well, my writers... <laughs> See, now we've got the, the straight lines are beginning to get left. <laughs> See, uh... Be the whole end of radio. <laughs> as soon as as soon as the punctuation gets left, I'm quitting. <laughs> Would you read that again, Portland? Why do we have cold jokes every week? Cold jokes? Well, my writers haven't any overcoats. They uh, they write what they feel, you know. Radio writers must have a precarious existence. Oh, they do. Precarious. That's the first time I've ever seen that word in one of your scripts. Well, it's that new writer I hired. He's from Harvard. <laughs> he, uh, he had another word he wanted to put in. It had a hyphen in it. A hyphen? Yes, the censor took the hyphen out. <laughs> he thought it was an exclamation point that had fallen down. I hate to be a radio writer. Oh, yes. It's a precarious life, Portland. <laughs> Say, precarious again. That Harvard man sure earned his money this week, didn't he? <laughs> Tell me, uh, what's next? The prices at the movie theaters are coming down. Yes, I guess they're trying to help business. Instead of cutting prices, the movie theaters should put more butter on their popcorn. Not a bad idea. 
Less corn on the screen and more butter in the bag. That would be precarious. The, uh, <laughs> precarious? That Harvard man is overdoing he it. He certainly is. <laughs> and I think we're overdoing it, too, Bob. And we better start for Alan's L. What is your question tonight? Well, figures have just been published showing that the circulation of newspapers reached a record high in 1946. And so our question is, do you take a daily newspaper? And if you do, what feature do you like best? Shall we go? As the Gruen Watch said to the boulevard, let's run down. <laughs> Well, here we are back in Allen's Alley, Portland. Say, the senator must be cooking a turtle. The smoke is coming out of his chimney very slowly. Well, let's not. I see somebody wham my flat. Yes. Claghorn's the name, Senator Claghorn, that is. Say, Senator, your eyes are all red. I've been crying, son. Really? I've been bellering and boo-hooing. Yes. I must have slopped up 20 pieces of burlap. <laughs> What made you cry, Senator? I've seen a moving picture. I started crying at the box office. Crying at the box office? Got there just as the prices changed. <laughs> what? <laughs> what picture did you see? The yearling. It's the story of the South. Yeah. It's the Paul family. There's a little boy and a deer. The bears eat the pigs. Then there's a tornado. Blows everything away. Oh, now, wait. Oh, now. Now, wait, wait. Don't break down, Senator. Well, that dirty wrecking tornado, that wind was from the north. <laughs> don't, don't take it so hard, uh, Senator. Wait till I say, wait till I dry my eyes on my shirt tail. All right. You, uh, you like the, the uh, yielding, eh, Senator? I only found one boner in the whole picture. A boner? That little deer was a doe. Uh-huh. That's the first doe I've seen in the South for 30 years. <laughs> well, never mind that. What about this newspaper question? Well, every man in the South takes a daily paper. You mean? No matter how poor a man is. Yes? As soon as he's had his breakfast, his grits and backside, that is. Yes. <laughs> He, uh, he, go, uh, he goes out in front of his cabin. Yes. He crawls out on the ground. Yes. And he opens up his paper. And he reads it? No, he puts it over his head to keep off the flies. <laughs> the flies? Son, many a man in the South who can't read has sex on him. Go on. Go on. That takes care of the senator with his fly comedy. Let's see if Mr. Moody is still up. Moody, bud. <laughs> well, tell me, uh, Mr. Moody, how do you feel about newspapers? Well, it pays to advertise in them, I can tell you that. You, uh, you had an experience? Yep. When I was young and full of sap, <laughs> I, uh, I was the champion wild strawberry picker of Rockville County. I see. One prize I won was a clamshell ashtray and a trip to the city. You, uh... You went to the city? Yeah. Carrying the clamshell ashtray. Well, why? In case I felt like smoking on the way. Oh. I had some corn silk with me. Oh, I see. <laughs> but tell me, why why did you go to the city? They called it publicity. Uh-huh. I had to get photographs with the champion cranberry picker, Cape Cod. Oh, fine. Yeah. Me and the cranberry picker shook hands. You did, eh? His hands was wet, clear up to his elbows. <laughs> But uh, what about this ad you put in the newspaper? Why, one day in the city, my pearl handle jackknife with a picture of Lillian Russell on it was missing. I see. I put an ad in the newspaper. Uh-huh. I went straight from that newspaper office to my room at the Y. Yes. I put my hand, put my hand into my other overalls. Yes. There was my pearl handle jackknife. Really? Fifteen minutes after I put that ad in the newspaper. Yes. I had my jackknife back. <laughs> So that proves it pays to advertise. So long, well, Bob. So long, Mr. Moody. <laughs> well, I wonder what Mr. Moody's doing with a jackknife. He looks a little old to cut up. Well, let's try next door. Howdy, double duty. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mrs. Nussbaum. Say, you look taller tonight. For a lock, I'm putting on Adler shoes. <laughs> Or a lock, eh? This is an expression, a colloquial. Oh, I see. A lock is also a bike. Well, I know that. This is like a chickadee only singing. Fine. Also, a poem is a lock. 
Hark, hark, could be a lot. Oh, never mind. Look, please. <laughs> yes, what about your what about your daily newspaper? I am only enjoying the gossiping. You mean the gossip columnist? Over they are having blasted events. Yeah. Or just they are giving Right. Always somebody is sifting. Yeah. Or personalities is making wise crackles. Wise crackles, eh? Yeah. Hoot Snor is saying to Fred Allen in Mammoth's Chicken Shack, yeah. a boy's in the hand could get in gravy on the sleeve. Oh. <laughs> Fred Allen, you say? He's on the radio. Oh. He is just a bit cute expression, a comedian. Oh, I <laughs> Do you, uh, you ever hear this Alan on the radio? Every Sunday night I'm tuning in. Yes? I am hearing the program up to Titus Moody. And then? Some snook is knocking on my door. Oh. <laughs> Reading all these gossip items, do you ever find any mistakes? Only one. I see. Walter Vinfield is printing. <laughs> What dazzling glamour puss is with Pierre Nussbaum at the Menasha Skolnick opening? Uh, what, uh, what was the mistake? That's nice, but Pierre is no dazzling glamour puss. Well, who was with Pierre? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, uh, that brings us to Mr. Cassidy's candidate. I wonder what awaits us to hear at Mr. Cassidy's. Well, <laughs> well, Mr. Cassidy, what about this newspaper question? I... Ain't you going to ask me how I feel? Oh, say that's right. How do you feel? It's none of your business. Oh. <laughs> All right, never mind you. How do you feel about newspapers? Oh, they're dangerous, my boy. Really? It's because of a newspaper this very minute, my Uncle Martin's nephew lies at death's door. Well, what happened? Well, Martin brought his nephew over from Ireland. I see. The boy was called Dull David Deneen. Dull David, eh? Oh, you could put his brain in the thimble, you'd have room enough left for your thumb. Uh-huh. <laughs> he came over on a cattle boat. For two weeks after Dull David got off the cattle boat, he walked on all fours. Well, how did you get him to stand on two feet? My Uncle Martin ran at him with a stick. And when Dull David reared up, my uncle ran around behind him and tightened his suspenders. <laughs> that did it. <laughs> you say the boy was stupid? Stupid. Ah, oh, Martin lived in Brooklyn. He explained to Dull David all about the subway. I see. The devils, the next time they caught Dull David going down into a sewer, he thought it was Canal Street. <laughs> but what about the newspaper? Well, last week. Last week, me Uncle Martin sent Dull David out to get the evening paper. I see. He disappeared completely. Disappeared? Three days later, they found Dull David lying a crumpled heap in Prospect Park near the birdhouse. Gosh. He was scratched from head to toe and his hands were full of feathers. Feathers and scratch? What newspaper was Dull David sent out for? The Brooklyn Eagle. The Brooklyn Eagle. <laughs> Dull David at death's door and turn to the five DeMarco sisters. With Maestro Al Goodman conducting his Pier 6 Philharmonic, the DeMarco sing Huggin' and Chalkin'. Talking his hand, coming around the other way. I'm a jockin'. 
<laughs> and now a gentleman to verify today's date. March 2nd, so it's time to begin looking for that corner that spring is just around. Spring, summer, fall, and winter, tender leaf tea balls are the all-American favorite. You'll find a great many good reasons for that. First of all, finer tea, more flavor in your cup, because it's famous for flavor tender leaf brand tea. And then, cleanliness. Your tender leaf tea ball comes to the table in a sanitary envelope. No hands have ever touched it. You don't touch it yourself. A long string attached to the tea ball has a tag on the other end. And this feature is so ingeniously arranged that simply lifting the tag opens the envelope. The long string carries the tea ball to the cup, still untouched. The clean white filter paper is absolutely tasteless, insoluble too, so there's nothing to mar your pleasure in the goodness of the tender leaf tea itself. No wonder they outsell all other kinds. Tender leaf tea balls are better in every way. Your grocer has boxes of 8, 16, 48, and 100. Ask him for Tender Leaf brand tea ball. You have just heard a musical clue. The correct answer to what song was that is I'll Close My Eyes. It was played by Maestro Al Goodman and 25 reasons why this is not an all-musical program. <laughs> Stay far. Stay far. Stay Portland. Yes? Will you get me a glass of water, please? I want to take another Alka-Seltzer. Well, you've taken ten already. Is something wrong? No, no. I was on the Quiz Kids program this afternoon. The kids' sponsor gave me some samples. His 10,000 tablet get acquainted kit. <laughs> I'm just getting acquainted. Are the quiz kids going to be on your program this year? Well, they may try to squeeze me in, Portland. The quiz kids are living in Brent Cano's window. You know, their new book, The Quiz Kids, just came out. Have you a copy? I certainly have. And what I went through to get my copy. What happened? Well, Friday, I was home writing the script for tonight's program, and out of no place, there was a knock on the door. Come in. Hello, oh, Mr. Mr. Allen. Well, the quiz kid. <laughs> Say, Joel Kupperman, you're the only one I remember from last year. I know, Mr. Allen. These are all new quiz kids. All new? Fine. Well, tell me, who are you types? I'm Lonnie Lundy. I'm 11 years old, and I'm in the sixth grade at the field school in Park Ridge, Illinois. Well, glad to meet you, Lonnie. I'm Naomi Cook. I'm eight years old and in the fourth grade at the Grove of Cleveland School, Chicago. Well, it's a pleasure, Naomi. I'm Jack Rooney. I'm 14 years old and a sophomore at Loyola Academy in Chicago. Good, Jack. I'm Joel Kupperman. I'm 10 years old. Well, you don't uh, you don't have to introduce yourself, Joel. That's right. We've met before, haven't we? Yes, we... <laughs> <laughs> we sure have, Joel. Remember the good old days? Tell me, what ever became of the old quiz kids? Remember... Harvey Fishman, Bob Burke, Richard Williams. It's terrible, Mr. Allen. They grew up. Well, that's what happened to me, Joel. I grew up and look at me. That's what I said. It's terrible. <laughs> it sure is. Well, kids, how come you're calling on me? We brought you a copy of our new book. It's called The Quiz Kids. Here it is, Mr. Allen. There's a chapter in it about you. A chapter about me? Gosh, thanks, kids. Say, how about some ice cream sodas or candy? It's all right, Mr. Allen. The book is yours. There aren't any strings attached. No. <laughs> Not like the tender leaf tea, is it? Well, how about... How about... Uh, tell me, how about letting me take you... Uh, letting me take you kids sightseeing while you're here in New York? We've been sightseeing all week, Mr. Allen. Really? Say, what did, what did you see, Naomi? I spent most of my time at the Met. I'm an old opera fan. An old opera fan, eh? <laughs> Tell me, what impressed you most, Lonnie? I saw Mayor LaGuardia on the street. And seeing Mayor LaGuardia impressed you? Yes, I'm taller than he is. <laughs> 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 well, 
Well, that's true. Jack, what gave you your biggest thrill here in New York? I'm getting it right now, Mr. Allen, being on your program. Oh, Jack, don't tell me you're getting a kick out of seeing little old wrinkled me. No, sir. Senator Claghorn. <laughs> Jack, you mean? I'm from South Chicago. Oh. <laughs> Well, I guess you quiz kids are having a lot of fun traveling around the country and broadcasting your program from different cities. Yes, we're having a swell time, Mr. Allen. Say, Jack, you and Naomi and Lonnie are new to radio. How, tell me, how, how do you like it? It's keen. I think it's super. It's wonderful. Say, what is your favorite radio program? Jack, Jack Benny. Benny. <laughs> These children have been tampered with, I'm afraid. <laughs> We'll all be up at the district attorney's office for this night is over. Joel, uh, 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 tell me, why do you, Joel, why do you like Jack Benny? He was very generous to me in Hollywood. Benny was generous? Yes, when I was living at his house. Yes? Mr. Benny gave me the weekly rate. Oh, the weekly rate. <laughs> he rarely does that. Fine. Uh, Naomi? I like Mr. Benny because he's so sweet to me. Benny, sweet? Yes. The first time I met him, he asked for a lock of my hair. Really? He's still wearing it. <laughs> oh, that's why Benny uses those little bobby pins. I often wonder. <laughs> Lonnie, uh, why do you like this character? Well, if it wasn't for Mr. Benny, I wouldn't be playing the piano today. Why not? My mother wanted me to study the violin. I see. <laughs> One night... One night she heard Mr. Benny play. Yes. Next day I started taking piano lessons. <laughs> well, what about you, Jack? I like Mr. Benny. Why? It's got me there. Oh, you got <laughs> you got me too. Well, tell me now, what other radio programs do you kids like? We all like mystery programs, Mr. Allen. Oh, you mean like Mr. and Mrs. North and Murder at Midnight? Yes, they're real exciting. Boy, I'd like to be on one of those mystery programs. Me too. Hey, I'll bet you quiz kids could do a swell mystery program. We sure would like to try, Mr. Allen. I imagine you were so frightened at the line you didn't almost didn't read it. <laughs> I imagine, Naomi, <laughs> I imagine if you kids did a mystery show, it would sound something like this. <laughs> Good evening, murder lovers. Our mystery tonight is called Mayhem in the Penthouse, or the millionaire knew he couldn't take it with him, but he didn't know he was leaving it so soon. <laughs> the characters in our play are... First, a wealthy millionaire. I am Bascom J. Rooney, the Lumber King. At the age of three, I began saving the sticks for my lollipops. When I was 40, I cornered the lollipop stick market and made a sucker out of the candy in the street. The woman in the case? I am Fifi Lacoupe. Young, fascinating, and talented. I'm starting my career as a singer. Once the world sees me, do the God is free. <laughs> Next part? A music composer. I am Hoagie Lundy. Seated here at my piano, I've written hit after hit. My latest song is... Draw a hearty laugh from the slide trombone. Let the clarinet give with the morning song. Let the singer wear like his laughs alone. You got blues, oh brother, you got blues. Let that old piano play a thump on those black keys. Let the drama be the tempo of the mazzoo. Take the whole tree back. And the master criminologist. I am Commissioner Cutterman, formerly with Scotland Yard. I'll solve this crime or my name isn't Commissioner Cutterman, formerly with Scotland Yard. And now the curtain rises on our mystery. We are in Hoagie Lundy's fabulous penthouse, looking up at the Third Avenue L. 
Hoagie at... Hoagie at the piano has just finished playing the score of the musical comedy he has written for Fifi La Cook. Fifi, her eyes closed, speak. Oh, Hoagie. You like it, my dear? Hoagie, it's divine. It's music for my heart, Fifi. I love you. Hoagie, once the public hears me in your show, you will be the host of New York. And me... I'll be playing the piano in Fanny's Bowery Folly. <laughs> <laughs> Never, Hoagie. I swear. Yes, but I wonder if the millionaire Bascom J. Rooney will put up the money for my show. We'll see, no. Bascom will be here any minute. Come in. Good evening, folks. Ah, Mr. Bascom J. Rooney, the millionaire. Let me take your thing. Thank you. Tough with that Inverness. The lining is live meat. <laughs> Bascom. My dear, you look exquisite. Blue does something for you. Oh, Bascom. Well, Mr. Rooney, are you ready to hear the score of Fifi's show? I'm a busy man, Hoagie. Fifi, do you like the show? Bascom, it's divine. That's all I want to know. How much money do you need? $200,000. Take $400,000. Incidentals may come up. I'll make out a check. Here's my pen. I'll go into the library and get a blotter. Oh, Bascom, how can I ever thank you? Tut, tut, Fifi, darling. Let me write this check. Oh! Ah! Bascom! He's dead! Don't nobody move. <laughs> this way. Come right in. This way, Commissioner. See that no one leaves this room. Okay, Chief. I'll solve this crime when my name isn't Commissioner Tupperman, formerly with Scotland Yard. Okay, Chief. <laughs> now, Foyce, you want to grill the dame? Right, Hannigan. Now, Miss, what happened? Well, Hoagie ran into the library for a blotter. I was here chatting with Bastion. She was writing out a check in the shop. Too bad he didn't have a pen that could write under blood. <laughs> Chief, you're a panic. Control yourself, panic again. I'll try and hold in, Chief. Hey, this case is a cinch, Chief. They ain't got no butler here. The dame must have done it. Preposterous. Why should I kill Bastam Rooney? Yes, why kill the man who was going to launch his career? Heavens, Commissioner. How did you know that? I am Commissioner Tupperman, formerly with the Scotland Yard. There's your answer, miss. See, this Hobie character might have bumped him off. How could I have done it? I was in the library and the door was closed. See, it's an open and shut case. Hobie opened the door and shut it. I think you got something there, Hannigan. I'll examine the body. Good. Well, what are you to do, Chief? The boot entered the head at a 45-degree angle. Are you with me, Hannigan? Check, Chief. Along S to equal the muzzle velocity of the gun and wider trajectory of the boot, we get the fulcrum that gives us dipotenus. Check, Hannigan. You lost me in the middle of that second sentence. <laughs> well, Chief, what's your solution? Trigonometry proves that the shot came from the library. Impossible. I was in the library and the door was closed. And there ain't no bullet holes in the door either, Chief. Examine the keyhole, Hannigan. Jeepers, the chief is right again. Outside the keyhole, powder mark. Exactly. The shot was fired through the keyhole. Hoagie Lundy, you killed Vasco Rooney. Yep, the chief got you, Hoagie. You better come clean. All right, I can check. I get it. Oh, Hoagie, why did you do it? I knew once fast and back the soul Fifi would become a big star. Too big for a struggling young musician like me. I did it, and I'm glad. You hear? Glad, glad. See? I gotta say it, you're a genius. I know it. Come on, Hoagie. You'll get the high chair for this. Please, Commissioner. I love Hoagie. You can't take him away. All right, Hoagie, you can go. Oh, gee, there you go again. Every time we catch a murderer, you let him go. I know, Hannigan. That's why I'm Commissioner Tupperman. No longer with Scotland Yard. Oh, you mind you 
your membership at Keys and tend to leave feet on your shopping days. I want to thank the Quiz Kids for joining us tonight. Next week, our guest will be Broadway's favorite comedian, Milton Berle. Thank you and good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. It's happening all around the house, right about now. I'd like a Trisket. A trisket I'd like a Trisket. A trisket. I'd this like a trisket. trisket. I know my family, and when they'd like a snack, they'd like a Trisket wafer. Great with cheese. Or with a dip. Neat with jam. Or just by themselves. And they really are good. Trisket wafers, they're made from 100% natural whole wheat, and that's good too. A Trisket, a Trisket, baked only by Nabisco. Take a trip back to Dodge City with Marshal Matt Dillon in Gunsmoke, coming up next. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of Gunsmoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first time I saw Lena Wave, I should have resigned my job and gone to Texas on the fastest horse I could find. Handling a man is one thing, but uh, trying to handle a woman is another. Especially when she weighs some 200 pounds and is muscled like a mule and twice as ornery. Lena came to Dodge on a great draft horse with dark circles around its eyes. And she was leading an old jack mule that carried her boyfriend, Emmett Fitzgerald. And Emmett was a tired, pigeon-breasted little fellow with a green look in his face. They weren't a very handsome pair, but we were mightily impressed by him the day they rode up Front Street. I swear, Mr. Dillon, that woman must wear leather underwear. I don't know why she's leading his mule. The man doesn't look stout enough to run away if he wanted to. My, I'd sure hate to have her on my tail. Well, she's wearing a six-gun and built like a buffalo. Well, she sure isn't the gentlest-looking woman I ever saw. Oh, that poor little man, Mr. Dillon. He somehow gives me the feeling he's being carried around in a bird cage. Now, quiet, Chester. They'll hear you. Yes, sir. Oh, I never thought we'd make it, Lena. You mean you never thought you'd make it? Get off that mule. Sure, Lena. Here, I'll help you tie him up, Lena. Ow! You stepped on my foot! I'm sorry. Uh, Lena! That'll learn you to be a gentleman. <laughs> you up there! Stop that! <laughs> Who are you laughing at? Why? Nobody, ma'am. That's good. Because if I got the notion you was laughing at me or my man, I'd open you up. Oh, no. Oh, my, no. No, it, it, it was just something funny I heard the other day from a fella. What? What? What do you hear that was so funny? Well, I, I, I was sitting there and he come around the... And Think the... hard, mister. You remember, Mr. Dillon, you... Tell her. Please. Dillon? Why, you must be the marshal here. Oh, that's right, ma'am. Well, now, marshal, I'm proud to know you. My name's Lena Wave. 
Shake! Well, how do you do? Do. Over here, Emmett. Sure, Lena. Marshal? It's yours, Emmett Fitzgerald. Emmett? Glad to know you, Marshal. Emmett's a gambling man. Oh, is that so? I want you to know he's honest, Marshal. Ain't you, Emmett? Sure, Lena. Say it. I'm honest. I only caught him cheating once, Marshal. Ain't that right, Emmett? I was in bed two weeks. She liked to kill me. Well, I'm glad to know that. Uh, about your being honest, I mean. Emmett will be running a game tonight. Right over there is as good a place as any. The Texas Trail. Uh, sure, sure. Glad to have you sit in, Marshal. And you can come, too, yes. if you watch your manners. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Emmett, I'd better feed you so you can get enough strength back to kneel them cards. Come on. Sure, Lena. Chester's been in that game over there for two hours, Matt. He must be losing. Well, he usually does, Kitty. How anybody could concentrate with Lena hulking around, I don't know. <laughs> She does keep an eye on things, doesn't she? You know, Matt, I feel kind of sorry for her. Oh, she can take care of herself. What well, isn't that? It's being so big and not very pretty. After all, she is a woman. Uh, that's not too easy to tell, Kitty. You think she's in love with Emmett? Well, now, Kitty, I tell you, I haven't worked that out yet. Uh, I I'm sure I've been studying on it, oh, though. Oh, Matt. <laughs> Every woman needs a man of some kind. Well, she's got one. Yeah. I feel sorry for him, too. Oh, Lena will take care of him. I know. But I'll bet he'd like to take care of Lena just once. After all, he's human. I tell you, that is not my hand. I had three aces. You accuse Emmett of cheating, and I'll shoot you dead. Oh, excuse me, Kitty. I better go fish Chester out of that. That Emmett was dealing, wasn't he? I'll blow a hole in you, mister. Right now. All right, hold it, Lena. She's about to shoot me, Mr. Dillon. You bet I am. Lena, I don't know what it's like where you came from, but you shoot anybody around here and you're going to go to jail. You'd put a woman in jail? For shooting, I would. For fighting? What? This is what. When I hear he, he, he can put in jail for that, too, now. Now, here... The game's closed, gentlemen, for half an hour. I need some beer, Emmett. Come on. Sure, Lena. Like that, it ain't fair. Uh, here, Chester. <laughs> Let me help you out. Come on. There. Well, are you all right? Why didn't you stop her, Mr. Dillon? She might have killed me. Well, I, I I, don't know, Chester. I never fought with a woman. Well, I have, and I don't want no more of it. Well, you can't hit her. What can you do with her? Leave her alone. That's what I'm going to do. You know, Chester, Lena could get to be quite a problem. Well, she ain't going to be my problem. I'm getting out of here. Oh, hello, Doc. Hey, you gonna have some breakfast? Oh, eh, no, I've already eaten. We'll have some coffee, though. Oh, good. They had me up real early this morning. No? Who did? A couple of men Lena Wave got mad at. Huh? She used a bottle on them. Oh, were they hurt bad? Oh, she blooded them up some. It wasn't real serious, though. All they did was try to protect themselves. After all, what man's going to fight a woman? Yeah, that's true. But one of these days, some drunk's not going to realize she is a woman, and he'll shoot her. Hmm. If you wonder it hasn't happened already. <clears throat> oh, say, I hear Chester caught it all right when he accused Emma of trying to cheat him. <laughs> <laughs> well, he found out later that it wasn't true, Doc. 
The other boys were just playing a joke on him. They switched his cards while he, he was under the table looking for some chips that he'd dropped. Oh, wonder all oh, that. Oh, if you ask me, a man that'll leave his hand while he crawls around on the floor deserves anything that happens to him. Well, just about everything did. Mr. Dillon? Oh, here he is. He'll uh, tell you. Mr. Dillon? Oh, say, you better come too, Doc. Huh? Uh, what's the trouble, Chester? Lena Wave. She just shot a man over at the Dodge house. What? Oh, say, we better get... This man did, Chester? He sure is, Doc. Where's Lena? She's still there. Claims it was self-defense. Did you see it? Mm, yes, sir. I was right there. Uh, Lena was getting her room key at the desk, and this buffalo hunter come in and grabbed her. Well, he was pretty drunk. Uh, drunk? At this hour of the morning, he was drunk? Well, I guess he'd been up all night, Doc. Anyhow, he tried to kiss her. He must have been drunk. He got her gun hand behind her back, and then he pushed her up again in the desk. Oh, she was swearing at him something terrible. Well, how did she shoot him, Chester? Uh, well, sir, she just pooched around and squirmed herself along the desk till she'd rubbed her six-gun around on the other side. Then she just pulled it out with her free hand and shot him in the belly. She did? Oh, oh my, she's quite a woman, ain't she? She sure is. She's waiting with Emmett right inside here, Mr. Dillon. Everybody else took cover. They're scared to death of her. Yes, she... What are you here for, Doc? Eh? You can't do him no good. Eh, well, I... I... I just come to take a look at him, let's see. Oh, yes, he looks dead, all right. He's dead. Why did you kill him, Lena? Well, I had to protect myself, Marshal. Nobody else would, including Emmett here. I... I figured you'd take care of him yourself, Lena. You always do. Sure. But if you was a man, you'd do it for me. Oh, now, Lena, look how big he is. He ain't very big anymore. All it takes is a gun, Emmett. Sure, Lena. There are too many people carrying guns around here already. I'm going to take yours, Lena. What for? I killed him in self-defense. He wasn't even armed. Except for that Bowie knife. You're forgetting something, Marshal. What? I'm a woman. So? So? You mean to tell me a woman ain't got the right to protect her virtue in this town? What do you men come to, anyway? Well, by, oh, by, oh, yes, she's got a point there. Uh, Ain't no judge in the world that wouldn't call it self-defense. No, you're right, Lena. I keep forgetting. You know I'm right. Emmett, we ain't had breakfast yet, and I'm hungry. Come on. Sure, Lena. <laughs> You know, I've been thinking, Mr. Dillon. Oh, what about, Chester? Well, old Lena could have let that fella kiss her this morning, just a little peck anyway, and she wouldn't have had to shoot him. Yeah, she could have, but she didn't. I declare, she's enough to curdle cream. Well, I hope everybody leaves her alone from now on. Marshal Dillon? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm Nate Bannister. Well, I'm glad to know you. You won't be, if what I hear is true. Oh? Jim Henry was my friend, Marshal. Is that so? Nobody's going to shoot a friend of mine and get by with it. Not even a woman. He was drunk, Nate. And he was treating her bad. And it's no call to kill him. In this country, a woman's free to protect herself any way she can. Yeah. That's what everybody I've talked to say. Well? Don't sit with me. You gonna arrest her? No. Okay, then. Now, wait a minute. What? Where you going? I'm Marshal. I'm going to kill me a woman. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first... 
This Monday night on CBS Radio's Suspense, hear Jeff Chandler in Death at Strykerud Pond. It's an exciting trial in which a young man faces death because of his decisions made as a member of a World War II underground. It's a fascinating study in suspense, and it's yours to hear this Monday night over most of these same stations at the Star's Address. Monday, Suspense. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. Nate Bannister was obviously a buffalo hunter, same as his friend who had been shot that morning. He was a huge man with a heavy black beard and eyebrows so thick it was hard to tell if he was looking at you or not. I watched him as he stood in the doorway, having just said that he was going to kill Lena Wave. And I realized that a man that primitive was capable of doing anything, even shooting a woman. I wasn't sure how to stop it, unless I shot him first. The way I was brought up, Marshal, that's what friends is for. If somebody kill you, then they gotta kill them. You do any killing around here, Nate, and you'll be tried for it. Maybe. If you catch me. I'll catch him. Why you gotta protect women, Marshal? Just because they're so weak and puny. Is that Nate Bannister? Huh? You heard me. Why? Yes, ma'am. I'm Nate Bannister. Well, they didn't tell me you was so big. Who didn't tell you? How'd you know my name? You've been spreading it around that if the marshal don't arrest me, you'll shoot me. That true? Are you Lena Wade? I am. And if there's going to be any shooting, I want in on it. Now, wait a minute, Lena. I ain't going to get bushwhacked by no dirty buffalo hunter, marshal. Bushwhack? I wouldn't do that to nobody. Especially the uh, lady... Lady? Yes, ma'am. He called me a lady, Marshal. Well, you are, ain't you? Of course I am. Yeah, what's the matter with calling you one? Nothing. I kind of like it. Just because you ain't pale and skinny like ordinary women? No. Of course I ain't. Why, I... I never seen a woman like you nowhere... You're kind of admirable. <laughs> Listen to him, Marshal. Ain't he a one? Oh, I mean it. I sure do. Oh. I sure do. No, you don't. I'm too big. Too big? Why, you want to be like all them little scrawny women? They can't do nothing. They're no good. They ain't. Oh, no. A real man needs someone uh, 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 better than that. He does? Of course he does. Like me? Yeah. Like you. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> you was going to shoot me a minute ago. Oh, no. I didn't mean nothing by that. Hey, come on. I'll buy you beer. We'll talk about it. Well, okay. Come along, Marshal. Yeah. Don't you worry about nothing, Marshal. Uh, Chester! Yes, sir? That jug of corn whiskey's still out back. Yes, sir, it was last time I looked. Go and get it. Those two make quite a couple, Matt. Look at them. They've been sitting there most all day. Yeah, a pretty shaggy pair of lovebirds, if you ask me. How's Emmett taking all this? Well, he didn't find him till a couple of hours ago. No, what happened? Oh, where is he? Nate ran him off. 
He'd probably have done more, but Lena wouldn't let him. You know, Matt, I think underneath she's real fond of that little Emmett. Yeah? And <laughs> she's got a strange way of showing it. Women do sometimes. Well, it doesn't matter as long as she keeps out of trouble. She leads quite a life, doesn't she? Shoots a man in the morning and falls for his best friend in the afternoon. <laughs> she might have shot both of them if Nate hadn't started sweet-talking her. Well, he made her feel like a woman, that's what. Oh, sure. Nothing wrong with that, is there? It probably saved his life. All right, mister. Now you get away from What's her. What's the matter, Emmett? Yeah. You heard me. I thought you'd gone home. I ain't going home. Not without Lena, I ain't. <laughs> yes, you are. Lena and me is going to get married. I didn't say that. I ain't had time to tell you. I'm... I'm warning you, mister. <laughs> Excuse me, Kitty. Yeah. I better stop this. <laughs> Look, fella. I'm going to kiss her. Watch. No. Hold it, Emmett. Oh. <laughs> All right, Emmett. Give me that derringer. Sure, Marshal. Chester. Yes, sir. Here I am, Mr. Dillon. Get Nate's gun before he comes to. All right, sir. I'll get it. All right, then take him over to docks, huh? He doesn't look too bad hurt. No, sir. He ain't. I'll take care of him. Em. You shot him. I know. You shot him. Over me. Well, he was stealing you, Lena. And you went and shot him. I was kind of ashamed this morning when that other fella tried to kiss you. You're a man after all, Emmett. I couldn't stand losing you, Lena. Oh, I didn't care nothing about him. You didn't? No. I was just tired of not being treated like a woman. He called me a lady and kind of lost my head. That's all. Well, Emmett kind of lost his head, too, Lena. All right, Emmett. Come on. You're going to jail. No, Marshal, please. Come on. Get going, Emmett. All right. My husband goes to jail. So do I. Your husband? Of course. We've been married ten years, Marshal. I always knew it wasn't a mistake. Well, he's still going to jail. Please, Marshal, don't take him. Of course I'll take him. He just shot a man, didn't he? He was only protecting his lawful wedded wife. you got to let me go with him. Well, I can't leave him now. I've been waiting ten years for him to treat me like a woman. Oh, please, Marshal. Look, Lena, there's been nothing but trouble since you hit Dodge. Please, Marshal. When Nate gets patched up, he'll be gunning for Emmett here. Emmett will kill him next time. All right, all right, Leo. Look, I'll tell you what I'll do. Get out of Dodge, both of you. Right now. You mean it? If you hurry. Oh, thank you, Marshal. Hey, let's go, Emmett. Wait a minute. What? Huh? Take my arm. All right. Now, Lena. Come on. Sure, Emmett. Sure. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Virginia Gregg with Vic Perrin and John Daner. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke has been selected by the Armed Forces Radio Service to be heard by our troops overseas. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Mr. 
Mr. and Mrs. North of CBS Radio get into an arty crowd, an artful crowd, too, when mixed paints and mixed emotions make murder. Here are collector's item, Ham and Jerry's latest thriller, leading them a merry chase mid works of art before they nab their killer. It's on most of these same stations Tuesday night. On the same evening, you have a date for thrills with John Lund as yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Don't forget. George Walsh speaking. Eve Arden as our Miss Brooks teaches you how to laugh Sundays on the CBS Radio Network. Just as soon eat every day of his life. He really goes for those noodles, so I give him the Campbell life. Pete's idea of the perfect lunch is any lunch with Campbell's chicken noodle soup. There's lots of chickeny flavor and little round noodles for him, but not a lot of work for me. That's noodle okay. Give me the Campbell life. America's favorite miser is coming up next. It's the Jack Benny program. J-E-L-L-O. The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston and Phil Harris and his orchestra. The orchestra opens the program with Shall We Dance? it's a large dinner party or just a regular family meal, whatever the size of the gathering, everybody is sure to enjoy Jell-O for dessert. Jell-O is so festive and colorful that it graces the most formal party. And it's so easy to make, it's a pleasure to serve it often for family dinners. And the reason Jell-O is so popular can easily be explained. Jell-O has that extra rich fruit flavor, flavor that comes from true sun-ripened fruit, refreshing and truly delicious. Whether you choose strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, or lime. But bear this in mind that only in Jell-O do you get Jell-O's extra rich fruit flavor. So always get genuine Jell-O. Look for the big red letters on the box. They spell Jell-O. Shall we dance from the picture of the same name? And now, ladies and gentlemen, Jack Benny. Thank you. Thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking. And Don, I must say, that was the stingiest introduction you've ever given me. Why, I snub people with more words than that. Well, to tell you the truth, Jack, it's getting toward the end of the season, and I'm running out of adjectives. Yes, I know how you feel, Don, and I don't blame you. We only have six more broadcasts, and believe me, I'm looking forward to my summer vacation. So where are you planning to go? Well, Don, I've decided to go to the Orient this year. Mm -hmm. uh, Japan and China. You know, I've always wanted to see rice without old shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, that'll be a lovely trip, Jack, and you can make it in about uh, eight or ten weeks. Yes, yes. Say, Don, uh, how much would a trip like that cost? I mean, uh, including the boat fare and everything. Oh, you can do it easily for about six or seven thousand dollars. Not bad, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> 
About, uh, <laughs> you say about six or seven thousand, huh? Yes, uh, roughly, but it'll be worth every penny of it. Oh, no doubt. Uh, but look, Don, uh, doesn't it, uh, uh, doesn't it get awfully hot in China this time of year? I mean, <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, not even around uh, uh, stoves? <laughs> well, now, that's silly. Oh. Say, Jack, why don't you take a trip to Europe this summer? Have you ever been there? No, I haven't. Would make a nice vacation. Of course, they don't grow rice there, but I'll bet you can... Say, Jack, why don't you take a trip to Europe this summer? Have you ever been there? No, I haven't. Would make a... Have you ever been there? No, I haven't, Phil. See, a boat trip to Europe would make a nice vacation. Of course, they don't grow rice there, but I'll bet you can get it. Huh? <laughs> that would be ideal, Jack. It sure would. Say, Phil, does a trip like that, I mean, are the, uh, well, is it, uh... Oh, the whole thing wouldn't cost you more than three or four thousand dollars. Oh, including tip? <laughs> you probably pick some up. <laughs> I'm leaving my violin home. Oh. <laughs> you say that trip would cost about three or four thousand dollars. Yes, and that's with your boat trip first class. Well, that's reasonable, isn't it? Yeah. First class, too. But of course, Phil, so many of my friends tell me it's much more fun going over second class. They, I know they say it's more enjoyable. It's cheaper, too. Oh, is it? <laughs> is it? I... <laughs> well, I... I heard there's very little difference between first and second class. Now, wait a minute, Jack. That's wrong. For one thing, second class has no swimming pool. Well, good heavens, Phil. Who needs a swimming pool? You got the whole ocean. <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> Have a say. <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> Hello, Jack. Hello, Mary. <laughs> what, are you, what are you laughing at? Nothing. I just want to get it over with. Oh, I see. What are you talking about? My vacation. You know, I was thinking of going to the Orient, but it's so hot there in July. And then Phil suggested Europe, but it's cold there. Gee, I don't know what to do. But why don't you take a shower? That's hot and cold. <laughs> It's a fine way to spend a vacation, taking a bath. Well, you want to change, don't you? <laughs> well, yes, but not so radical. Is that so? <laughs> oh, hello, Kenny. Hello, Jack. Gee, you look all tired out. Well, why shouldn't I? I've just been all around the world. <laughs> you were? How was the coronation? Oh, keep still. Gosh, I only ask a foolish question and you get mad. <laughs> My error, Kenny. Just excuse me. Please. Say, Jack, I just thought of something. You know, I know where you can go for a swell vacation. Where, Don? Santa Barbara. It's only 90 miles from here, and there's a beautiful hotel right on the ocean. Say, that's a thought. I understand it's nice and quiet there. I mean, I can get a real rest. And what a luxurious hotel. You'll love it. Oh, that's the spot. Don, are the, uh, I mean, would it, uh... Oh, you can get a beautiful room there for $20 a day. Oh, I mean, oh. <laughs> say, $20 a day. But that includes your meals. But, Don, I'm not hungry. <laughs> Besides, I hear it gets pretty chilly there on the ocean. <coughs> you see, I'm susceptible. <coughs> What's the matter, Jack? He's got a cold in his pocketbook. <laughs> he must have opened it in a draft. You mean during the draft, and that was in 1917, folks. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Phil, you've got the wrong idea. I just don't know where to spend the summer. You'll spend it at home if you don't spend some money. I'm not worried about the money. I'm not worried about anything. I just want to take a vacation, that's all. A vacation. Well, you can take one right now. I'm going to sing. Well, go ahead. And for two cents, I'd go to Ocean Park. <laughs> you must think you're a letter. Oh, thank you. One 
to be eternally the one my worshiping soul possesses. At her call, I give my all. One Alone from the Desert Song, sung by Kenny Baker. And Kenny, that was very, very good. Very, very thanks. <laughs> Isn't he silly, Mary? Very, very. Hmm. And you will find the Jello is very, very tempting with its six delicious flavors, strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lime, and uh, lime and berry. <laughs> He needs about four more years of that. <laughs> Don, can you, can you do anything with the big red letters? Yes, yes. look for them on each and every box. Wow! <laughs> now, that, Don, that was Cleberry. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, going from the very to the sublime, we are going to present as our feature attraction this evening the play which you have been waiting for. In fact, the one that you selected by an overwhelming majority of votes as your favorite our new version of Eugene O'Neill's Ah, Wilderness. <laughs> you see? Now, I will play the part of the stern old father. Mary will be the stern old mother. And Kenny will be our son who is always stirring up trouble. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> see, I ad-libbed that one. I got it in my script, too. Copycat. I had it, too, but I rubbed it out. Kenny, don't be so hypercritical. <laughs> Never mind, let's go on with our play. Uh, where's Andy Devine? I rubbed him out, too. Andy. Kenny, don't be so hypercritical. Kenny, don't be so hypercritical. You didn't ad-lib that one. Mm. <laughs> Never mind, let's go on with our play. Uh, where's Andy Devine? I rubbed him out, too. Oh, hey, Andy! Here I am, Buck, and a rare to go! <laughs> That's fine. Now, Andy... <laughs> Andy, you can play the role of Kenny's uncle. Oh, gee whiz, ain't you got no kissing part? <laughs> no. Shucks, and I got my lips all puckered up. <laughs> well, that takes care of the lips, or the cat. <laughs> I'm sorry I haven't, uh, I haven't a part for you, Don. Oh, that's all right. I'll just sit around. You don't feel hurt about it, do you? No, I'm just terribly wounded. Oh, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> got a right to kick after that first plug you gave him. <laughs> now, this, uh, this play will go on. Hey, like... hey, what about me? Am I in this thing or not? No, Phil, you threw spitballs at me last week, and this is your punishment. <laughs> so I haven't got a part in the play, huh? No, you haven't. Well, if you hear a knock on the door, watch out. <laughs> now, listen, Phil, we're attempting real art tonight, and if you do one single thing to detract from or mar this drama... <laughs> As sure as there is a sky above us, I will thrash you to within an inch of your orchestra. <laughs> Don't get that close or they'll slug you. Oh. <laughs> well, anyway, folks, immediately after the next number, we will take you to that little town of Drop Stitch, Connecticut, and present our modest little masterpiece, Our Wilderness. Uh, say, Jack. What? Do I have to be Kenny's mother? Yes, I have to be his father, don't I? That's what I'm complaining about. Oh. Uh,
dog will bite you if you don't watch out, played by Phil Harris and his orchestra. And now we bring you our version of Ah Wilderness by that great American playwright, Eugene Ah Neal. Uh, the locale is a small town in New England, not far from Boston, and not near from here, yet quite a ways from Portland, which is certainly close to Hoffa. <laughs> That's the silliest thing I've said yet. <laughs> the, uh... And certainly got nothing. <laughs> the, uh, the opening scene... The opening scene is the home of our young hero where we find his distracted parents waiting for their wayward son. Curtain. <laughs> Music. <laughs> Yes, Teresa. <laughs> Where's our son, Wilderness? He ain't home yet. Last night he got in late, too, and told me he was out playing pool. Was he? He must have been. He had red chalk on his lips. <laughs> Wonder what time it is. Hmm, here it is, 17 minutes of nine. <laughs> and that son of ours still gallivanting around. Well, don't worry, Pa. He's a good boy and smart, too. He got the biggest marks in school and stood at the head of the class. Where he got the marks, he had a stand. <laughs> I tell you, Teresa, I don't know what this younger generation is coming to. On the way home tonight, I actually saw a young couple holding hands before it got dark. What's the matter with that? When I was young, boys never thought of doing the things they do today. That's why they didn't do them. <laughs> I never thought of that. You know, Pa, I've been thinking. You really got to talk to Wilderness and tell him the facts of life. He's going on 29. Hmm. <laughs> when I was his age, I was wearing long pants. About time he had him prepped. Well, I guess you're right, Ma. That boy of ours ain't a child anymore. Has he got a shaving mug? Yep, but he never shaves it. <laughs> You know, Pa, I had suspicion for a long time he's raising a beard. Well, if we can trick him into washing his face, we'll find out. <laughs> I wonder what time it is. 9.14 and he ain't home yet. I'd put a lamp in the window if the window was clean. Confound that boy. Who's there? Paul Revere, the British are coming. <laughs> That was over a hundred years ago. I told my horse that, but he talked me out of it. <laughs> hmm, I must be riding pompoon. <laughs> well, Teresa, you better get the bit. I'll wait up and talk to Wilderness. I'll wait up, too. We may have to gang up on him. That's right. Hmm, what's that? Forrest! Oh, Forrest! What is it, Uncle Ferncliff? I got bad news for you. You know that Thompson gal who wears high heels and puts ketchup on her fingernails? You mean Annabelle Thompson? That's the filly! Well, what about her? What about her? Boris, that son of yours has been writing her letters. My son writing her letters? I don't believe it. That's Ripley's worry. Quiet! <laughs> Be careful what you say, Ferncliff. I found one of them letters, and here it is. You did, eh? Well, read it. Read it. It says, Dear Annabelle. Wait. I can tell from them words. This ain't going to be fit for no woman's ears. Leave the room, Teresa. Give me that letter, and you leave the room. <laughs> read on, Ferncliff. I've got to know. <laughs> <laughs> it says... I gotta know what's in it. Well, it says, Dear Annabelle, roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you. Yours truly, Wildernut. <laughs> My son wrote that. Let me see that letter, Ferncliff. Here you be. Hmm. I wouldn't have minded it so much except for those last four words. And so are you. That's a going too far. Now, don't be too hasty, Forrest. Maybe he wasn't himself when he wrote it. He must have been. Every word is misspelled. Yeah. 
Yeah, he's only got what? G and sugar. Here comes our boy now. Forrest, you must talk to him. Ah, oh, father. Ah, oh, mother. Ah, oh, oh, wilderness. wilderness. <laughs> That's the title of the play, folks. Shut up. Wilderness, do you realize what time it is? 9.36. Exactly. <laughs> you had your mother all upset. Why, she was a-walking up and down in her bare feet with tears in her eyes. And why? There were cats on the floor. <laughs> Good heavens, is there a tax on that, too? <laughs> yep, and it ain't amusement. Wilderness, Uncle Ferncliff found a love letter you wrote to Annabelle Thompson. What do you say to that? Oh, gingerbread. <laughs> Watch your language, son! <laughs> Did you have a drink before you came home? Yes, Father, a malted milk. A malted milk, eh? Was there an egg in it? Well, I... I... Answer me, son! Was there an egg in it? <laughs> yes, Father. Oh! Forrest! Control yourself! That's the last straw. But I couldn't help it, Father. I couldn't help it. I was driven to it. I don't care how you got there. <laughs> There's no excuse. Oh, Pa, you don't know the aches of a lonely heart. I asked Annabelle for her hand, and she told me to go jump in the lake. Did you, son? Yes, but it wasn't there. You better be careful, my boy. I knew many gals when I was a young man. Oh, but your mother was different. Yeah, she got hooked. <laughs> I know how you feel, son. When I first proposed to your ma, she turned me down. Then I felt so bad, I drank a glass of iodine. Was there an egg in it? <laughs> Leave the room, Teresa. I'm going to have a talk with Wilderness about the facts of life. I hope you learned something. <laughs> Come here, son. You're going on 29 and approaching manhood. And there are a few things you ought to know. What is it, Dad? Wait a minute. Ferncliff, lock the door. Shut the window and close the transom. Okay, shall I turn off the steam? That's my asthma. How did they shut that off? <laughs> Now, first, Wilderness, I'm going to read you that letter you wrote to Annabelle Thompson. Oh, Dad. Here, Annabelle. Roses are red. Violets are blue. Sugar is sweet. And so are you. Gosh, did I write that? <laughs> it wasn't Eugene O'Neill. <laughs> I'll handle this, Ferncliff. Ah, oh, Wilderness, tell me. How would you feel if you got a letter like that? I don't know, Dad, but I can find out. How? I'm gonna sit right down and write myself a letter. Write yourself a letter, huh? And son. make believe it came from you. Can't you hear me calling when the leaves are gently falling? I'm gonna say things oh so sweet. Yeah, man. That will knock me off my feet. Where's my dad? With kisses at the bottom. Gee, I'm glad I got it. Baby. And close with love the way you do. And jello too. I'm gonna sit right down and write myself a letter. Letter. Ready, baby. And make me leave it. Are you going to take an encore, son? No, Father. Then sit down while I tell you the facts of life. Do you, do you mind if I leave for us? I heard them. <laughs> you can go, Ferncliff. Wilderness, you listen to your pappy and stay away from gals like that Annabelle Thompson. She ain't fit for a nice boy like you. Goodbye. <laughs> your Uncle Ferncliff is right, Wilderness. She ain't your type. She'll do till my type comes along. Wilderness, you must forget that gal. I know it ain't gonna be easy at first, but someday you're gonna thank me. But I love her, Father. Oh, pshaw. <laughs> there are plenty of other pebbles on the beach. Gee, how can you neck a pebble? <laughs> anyway, Father, I love Annabelle. And if I can't marry her, I don't want to live. 
I'll kiss myself. That's kill, you dope. <laughs> Calm down, son. Do you really feel that way about Annabelle? Yes, Father, I do. And you can't live without her? No, Peter. I ain't a-going to stand in the way. I may be wrong about Annabelle, but if she is the gal of your dreams, go to her, my boy. Go to her. But I fear it's too late. It's never too late. I'll fix it up for you, son. I'll call her on the telephone right now. What's her number, my boy? Spruce, tree, tree, tree. <laughs> Did you hear that, operator? Well, get it. Don't worry, son. I'll arrange everything, and I ain't gonna stand in the way of your happiness. Hello? Hello, is this Annabelle Thompson's house? Sure is! Hiya, Buck! <laughs> Why, Uncle Ferncliff, what are you doing at Annabelle's house? She ain't your gal. I told her that, but she talked me out of it. Oh, Everybody young and old enjoys dessert, and here's a dessert that will make a tremendous hit. It's ice cream, rich, delicious ice cream made with Jell-O ice cream powder, and made more easily and more economically, too. For when you use Jell-O ice cream powder, you actually use less cream and get more ice cream. All you do is combine a package of Jell-O ice cream powder, some sugar, milk, and cream, and you make it right in the freezing trays of your refrigerator. In just a short time, you'll have a quarter and a half of extra delicious mellow ice cream, the old-fashioned creamy kind. And if you prefer, you can use an ordinary hand freezer and get the same delicious results. Jell-O ice cream powder comes in five luscious flavors. You'll like all of them. And Jell-O ice cream powder makes more ice cream than most other ice cream preparations you can buy. So tomorrow, ask your grocer for Jell-O ice cream powder. <laughs> number of the 33rd program in the new Jell-O series, and we'll be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. I hope you all liked our play, Our Wilderness. Jack, I must compliment you. You did a wonderful job of acting. You really surprised me. Well, Don, I really surprised myself. I, I hope some picture producers were listening in. If they were, they heard a remarkable performance. I didn't like it. <laughs> now, I knew you wouldn't, Phil. You're just jealous because you weren't in it. I was in it, and I'm not jealous. Well, Kenny, you gave a sterling performance. Is that so? I was as mediocre as you were. <laughs> well, never mind. Huh? Oh, Jack. What? A wire just came in from Eugene O'Neill. Oh, what does he say? Uh, Jack Benny, NBC Studio, Hollywood. Just heard your version of my play, All Wilderness. All me. <laughs> well, that's the last time I'll ever do one of his plays. That's in the wire, too. Hmm, good night, folks. <laughs> The Jell-O program comes to you from Hollywood over the red network of the National Broadcasting Company. It's the first show of the new year, and the Captain Antoniel do it right. With their guests Marilyn McCoo and Billy Davis Jr., John Biner, Muhammad Ali, and Joe Namath. It's the new 1977 Captain Antoniel. You are the Lux Radio Theater brings you another classic story coming up next. From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Errol Flynn, Brian Ahern, Jackie Cooper, and C. Aubrey Smith in Lives of a Bengal Lancer. Lux 
presents Hollywood. This is the thrilling story of the men who bring peace and order to a far-flung corner of India. Suggested by the book by Francis Yates Brown and filmed by Paramount, we stage lives of a Bengal dancer with Errol Flynn, Brian Ahern, C. Aubrey Smith, Jackie Cooper, and Douglas Dumbro. Between the acts, you'll hear General Hugh S. Johnson, former NRA administrator and now celebrated columnist of the Scripps Howard newspapers. The music of the Lux Radio Theater is conducted by Louis Silvers. This program comes to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Flakes, those gentle, fast-dissolving flakes millions of women use every day. It's easy to see why Lux is so popular. Just pour lukewarm water on a few of these feather-like flakes. You'll see them fluff up instantly into glorious suds. These rich, buoyant suds float out every trace of soil and perspiration and leave your things fresh and sweet and lovely looking, too, because Lux is kind to colors and fabrics. These gentle Lux flakes keep your things new looking longer. They're the safe, thrifty care for stockings, under things, dresses, blouses, and sweaters. Yes, for everything safe in water. And now, the producer of the Lux Radio Theater. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. The region of the Kaiba Pass in the desolate mountains of northwest India is a land where time stands still. There at this moment, on mounted patrol, are some of the most extraordinary and superb cavalry the world has ever seen, the Bengal Lancers. Commanded by British officers, you'll find in their ranks native Mohammedans, Hindus, and powerful dignified Sikhs who wear their full black beards held close to their faces in nets, rattle iron bracelets at their wrists, and stick tiny daggers in their turbaned hair. On one side of their saddles hangs a sword, on the other a rifle, while their fingers embrace the primitive but deadly bamboo lance, whose steel head has bred respect for peace and the Union Jack in the haunts of the ferocious Afridi tribesmen. This story is told tonight by four vigorous commentators, Errol Flynn, Brian Ahern, C. Aubrey Smith, and Jackie Cooper. With a background as adventurous as anything in fiction, Errol rides tonight as Lieutenant McGregor of the Bengal Lancers. Brian Ahern, pilot and aviation enthusiast, is seen shortly in the much-talked-of Hal Roach production, Captain Fury. We hear him as Lieutenant Forsyth. Back in 1888, in the gold fields of South Africa, C. Aubrey Smith was pronounced dead of pneumonia. However, he, he had other ideas on the subject. And now in his 76th year, is a player with the Hollywood Cricket Club and its president. Commander of the Order of the British Empire, this great character actor is with us tonight as Colonel Stone. And Jackie Cooper, who's been an actor for 11 of his 16 years, is Hollywood's most popular and persistent trap drummer. He comes here from the set of Paramount's What a Life and is heard as Lieutenant Stone. Douglas Dumbrill returns to us as Mohammed Khan. And so we set our sights for India as the Lux Radio Theater presents Lives of a Bengal Lancer. <laughs> India, the India of the northwest frontier. Looming like frowning barriers are the mountains. Rugged cliffs, ideal for sniping, from which the bloodthirsty hill tribes swoop down, eager for battle against a handful of seasoned British soldiers. Here is stationed His Majesty's crack Indian Regiment, the 41st Bengal Lancers. On an almost impassable roadway, a small detachment of Lancers struggles upward into the hills. There's no sign of life above them, no movement on the cliffs, but suddenly... Column, halt! Well, there you are, Hendrickson. I told you they're up there. I never doubted it, Mr. McGregor. Well, what do we do? Just stand here and take it? We go forward slowly. But on no account do we return fire. But they're Colonel shooting Stone's at us, orders. man. What did he send us out here for? I don't know, McGregor, and neither do you, but the colonel does. Forward! Hendrickson, this is suicide. I don't mind getting pink, but I want at least one shot at the beggars. Where I come from... Where we... you come from, the Royal Canadian Mounted Alders get their man. You're not in Canada now, Mr. McGregor. There. That's Lawton. He's down. Now we can start something. No, I tell you. Colonel's orders. Hold your fire. But the old fool can't have foreseen this, Hendrickson. Look, Mac. 
I'd like to have you with me in war, but for peace, you're... You're going to... Excellent. Call him, Holt! Hendrickson, where is it? I- impulsive, that, that's what I was trying to say. Mr. McGregor, is Captain Hendrickson hurt, sir? He's dead. Open fire. Break every tree and rock on that cliff. Go on. I don't understand it. I gave definite orders to Hendrickson that our detachment was not to return fire. Perhaps there's some explanation, Colonel Stone. All we know, at least till they get back, is that there was a skirmish and we drove the Afridis back into the hills. Skirmish, yes. With Mohammed Khan himself. Mohammed Khan? Certainly. He was nibbling at my bait, too. If he'd come down off that hill, I'd have had him at last. Four detachments were standing by in the rear to surround him. Oh, that was your plan? Of course. Now I can't prove it was from Mohammed Khan. I don't touch him. I'm shocked at Hendrickson. I thought him a good officer. Perhaps, sir, if you'd explain to the detachment that they were only there as bait. Explain orders? Explain orders to subordinates? I'm surprised at you, Hamilton. What is it? Mr. McGregor, sir. McGregor? He was second in command, sir. Send him in. Mr. McGregor? Well, McGregor, why didn't Hendrickson come himself? Wounded? No, sir. Dead, sir. Dead? Killed by the Afridis. There's your explanation, Colonel. Most unfortunate. Most unfortunate the command was handed down to you, McGregor. You didn't know my orders. I knew them, sir. You did? And you deliberately disobeyed them? Why? We were losing men, sir. But you did disobey my orders? Yes, sir. And when Hendrickson was killed, I... Hendrickson knew my orders and obeyed them. Hendrickson was a good soldier. It is more than I can say for you. Then we'll go to your quarters, Mr. I say, easy on the bungalow, Mac. You're looking very sour, Mr. McGregor. Would you mind turning the other way? You disturb my music. You know, I'm finally getting the hang of this Afghan clarinet. Listen. Oh, will you please lay off that thing, Forsyth? Oh, certainly, Mr. McGregor. Oh. What's the matter, Mac? Been reprimanded? Yes. Oh, Ramrod Stone. I'm no soldier, apparently, because when I'm attacked, I fight back. Ah, I was afraid you'd get in trouble over that patrol business. Why, you knew Hendrickson had strict orders not to fire. I was speaking to Mr. Dawson, Forsyth. I beg your pardon, old man. The colonel's been on this border 20 years, Mick. He knows it pretty well. And I don't, I suppose. Well, I know enough to fight back when my men begin to fall. Stone's got nothing but a ramrod for a backbone. Oh, yes, I know he's a terror for drilling. But when it comes to the real thing, what's he got? Nothing. Bravo! Hurrah for Mr. McGregor! Why, Mr. McGregor? Yes, and here comes the other boot. And here, here are the day's orders all type, Colonel. Thank you, Major. Routine, routine. Uh. What's this, Major? Uh, the, uh, the the subaltern replacement for Hendrickson. He arrives tomorrow on the Delhi train. Ah. Oh. What are they sending us? Uh, Stone, sir. From Sandhurst. From Sandhurst? Yes, sir. Straight to the frontier from military college? Oh, he can't even be dry behind the ears. What did you say his name is? Uh, Stone, sir. Donald Stone. I see. Huh. You have a brother in the war office, haven't you, Hamilton? Yes, sir. And who asked you and him to interfere in my personal affairs? pair of you, maiden aunts, wangling my son into a cushy berth so his father will make things short for him, eh? Will you forget your my colonel for a moment, sir? Why not? Huh. You've forgotten it. Look, Tom, in two years you'll have to retire. Oh, you feel sorry for me, is that it? Not at all. It's only to keep the name of Stone in the 41st after you've gone. Keep the name in the 41st. Sentimentality. You don't know what you've done, Hamilton. He, he belongs to his mother, not to me. She took him away from me. Hated the army, everything about it. I haven't seen him since he was a little shaver. But the only decent thing she ever did was to put him through Sandhurst. And now you do this. I've a good mind to refuse him. Well, hardly fair, Tom, to ship him back without trial. Well, you'll have to measure up to my standards. And at the first sign of favoritism from you or anyone else, there'll be trouble. That's an order, Major Hamilton. Lieutenant McGregor. Yes, sir. Lieutenant Forsyth. Yes, Major. Meet the replacement subaltern at the Delhi train. He'll be quartered in the bungalow with you. Lieutenant Donald Stone is the name. Stone? The Colonel's son. Is what? 
He said his son. Well, well. Imagine old Ramrod having been that human. Boy, I never even knew he was married. Why, sure. Can't you see him proposing? Madam, you'll marry me Wednesday the 29th. Be at the church at 10. That's an order. <laughs> Furthermore, you're improperly dressed, madam. <laughs> Boom. Well, this is the living room. The washroom opens off here, Mr. Stone. Why, I thought you'd be living in shacks. This is positively luxurious. Oh, we uh, we try to be civilized, Mr. Stone. Uh, wait till that heat comes down now. Well, let's have a look at the staples, eh? It's all rather thrilling, don't you think? Thrilling? Oh, I mean, it's like Kipling and all that. Kipling? Kipling? Uh, who's Kipling, Mr. Forsyth? Kipling? Uh, let me see. Uh, I, I don't believe I ever heard of him. Oh, really? Oh, well, you're, you're pulling my leg, of course. Gentlemen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's always been my impression that we salute when passing a superior officer. Sorry, sir, we didn't see you. Who's this? A new subaltern replacement, sir. Colonel Stone, um, Lieutenant Stone. Uh, how do you do, sir? Ah, yes, yes. Mr. Stone, you've come to us direct from military training school, hmm? Without previous service? Is that correct? Yes, sir. Well, you've a great deal to learn. I trust you'll measure up to our requirements. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon, Good afternoon sir. Good afternoon. Doesn't he... Doesn't he ever say more than that to newcomers? Oh, yes. Sometimes he comments on the weather. Oh. You see, the colonel's pretty much of a stickler for red tape. I mean, distance between his men and all that, you know. Oh. Well, then, I, I'm no exception. I mean, he didn't single me out for anything? No, no. That's just his man. He's all right when you know him. Oh. You must excuse me. You know... Well, this is the first time I can ever remember ever seeing him. What? Do you mean it? I... I don't know quite what I expected. Well, you'll know next time. Oh, look. Wait. I nearly forgot something. Now, where did I put that? Oh, here. Uh, take this stone, this uh, paper to the colonel. We're just done. Regimental headquarters. Did he ask to have me take this to him? I said take it to the colonel. I forgot to give it to him. Yes, sir. Very good, sir. <laughs> nice work, Mr. McGregor. Well, what's funny about that? You are. <laughs> Rough soldier. Heart of gold. Reconciling father and son after years of separation. Oh, he's all right when you know him. Ah. <laughs> Since when? That paper was a blank, wasn't it? Oh, why don't you shut up? Oh, never mind, Mac. The mother instinct comes out in all of us. <laughs> I kiss the dear fingers so ah. toil worn for me. So bless you and keep you, dear mother McGregor. Oh, <laughs> Come in. Lieutenant Stone, sir. Oh. oh. Well, Lieutenant? With this paper, sir. I, I was told to bring it to you. Well, let's have it. Of, of all the... Where did you get this? Mr. McGregor, sir. He said... Infernal oh, impudence. I beg your pardon, sir. No, 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 no. no. Not you, not you, not you. Well, how's your mother? Quite well, sir. Good, good. She always hated the army, didn't she? Yes, sir. I don't understand how she let you go through Sandhurst. Well, she had to, sir. I kept after her. Oh. You wanted to be a soldier, eh? We've always been soldiers for generations. Still, you're not one yet, you know. Yes, sir. You shouldn't be here on the front yard. But I am, sir. Yes, and why? Influence, favoritism. But with me, the good of the service, the regiment, comes first. That's what Mother always said about you, sir. Yes, that's what your mother always said. Well, well, now you're here. Don't try to take advantage. I won't, sir. I didn't expect... And you understand, of course, the situation makes any sort of social relationship impossible. Yes, sir. Is that all, sir? That's all, Lieutenant. What's that? There? Well, that's the Mohammedan call to prayer. You always know when it's time to dress for dinner by that. Now, hand me that shaving mug, will you, Stone? Yeah. See the colonel today? Yes. Huh, so did I. I got another reprimand for sending in blank orders. I imagine you didn't do so well either. I'm sorry, Stone. Quite all right. What'd you do all day? Stable duty. What? So soon? I'm not complaining. Well, that wouldn't help you anyhow. You know, every time I look in this mirror, I remind myself of my old man. Ooh, back home. Where was that? Alberta, Canada, wheat farm. 
You know, I had a colt once. A lot of nerves. A lot of class, too. You could see when he was a yearling, he was no cart horse. Well, my old man hooked him to a plow, and he took all the spirit out of him. He said he'd break him in, and he did. You don't have to be so subtle, Mac. Huh? Am I the horse? What do you mean? I'm no two-year-old, Mr. McGregor, and if anybody thinks my old man is going to break my nerve, he's mistaken. Well, I wasn't thinking of you at all. Hey, Forsythe, lay off that thing, will you? And hey, let me tell you another thing. I don't need a nurse, Mr. McGregor. What on earth are you talking about? I... Forsythe, do you have to do that? Well, it's the softer side to my nature, like yours. Uh, Stone, get out there and tell him to stop that thing, will you? Tell him it's an order. Yes, sir. Mother McCree, I'd like to wrap that thing around his neck. McGregor! McGregor! What's the matter? Forsyth, he's on the veranda. There's a cobra right above him, swaying to the music. Where's the revolver? Oh, wait a minute. A cobra? Yes, right over his head. Well, never mind. I'll take care of it. He'll be all right as long as he keeps playing. Come on. Oh, Mr. Forsyth. Very pretty. You're improving. They're lovely little things, cobras. Especially when they're swaying three inches from your nose. Shoot it. Quick. Oh, no, no. How about a few variations for the right hand? Cobras have a softer side of their natures, too, haven't they? Finds an outlet in music. Of course, as soon as you stop playing... Well, I've heard of men living two and three hours afterwards. Knew one fellow who lived two days. What's the matter? Getting tired? Oh, come on. Two or three more notes, Forsyth. Come on, that's right. Now, if you'll move your own nose a half inch to the left. All right. Steady. <laughs> Thanks, Mac. Well, you win, mister. Here, for sale, cheap. One second-hand Afghan bagpipe. Mother McCree. Sent for me, sir? Yes. Take a seat. Mr. McGregor, I assume you're familiar with the roads northeast of Fort Jamrod? Yes, sir. Then listen closely. We suspect there's a coalition of several of the border states being formed against us. We think the ringleader is Mohammed Khan, chief of the Magala. I have a spy in his territory, a Ghazi horse dealer. He's now at Judput Pass, waiting to get a message through to me. I want you to get in touch with him, and you'll leave at once. Yes, sir. Take one subaltern and ten men. Yes, sir. What subaltern shall I take, sir? Any preferences? Mr. Stone, sir. No. No service experience. Take Forsyth. But Lieutenant Stone hasn't seen any duty yet, sir. If he's ever going to get any experience... Did you hear what I said, Mr. McGregor? You will take Forsyth, not Stone. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Here are your orders. And this time, please obey them. I will, sir. All ready, Mr. McGregor, Mr. Forsyth? Yes, right. all ready. Why wasn't I sent on this exposition? You've got to tell me. Ready, sir? Wait a moment. Wait a minute. Why don't you answer me? Now, look here, Stone. I'd have taken you along, but you haven't had any experience. What excuse is that? How am I ever going to have experience? I'm doing things here that I learned my first year in Sandhurst. Stable duty. I haven't asked any favors. I'm not asking now. But I resent being held back because I happen to be related to the commanding officer. No one's holding you back. He is. And you let him choose Forsyth. He didn't choose. I chose. I chose Forsyth. Very well. Very well. It looks as if I ever want to get any experience, I'll have to get it myself. Well... Now, what was all that about? Oh, well, whatever it is, we haven't time for it now. Mother McCree, that's me, all right. Biggest fool in the lances. Hm. Forward! The curtain falls on Act One of Lives of a Bengal Lancer, starring Errol Flynn, Brian Ahern... Jackie Cooper, and C. Aubrey Smith. During this brief intermission, we bring you that lovable family, the Brownings. It's after dinner, and we find the family in the living room. Mother Browning is reading, and the two girls, Dot and Midge, are chattering over their homework. What's your score now, Dot? Eighteen. What's yours, Midge? Oh, gee, mine's only nine. You've beaten me all hollow. What are you girls talking about? It doesn't sound like homework to me. It's our stocking scores, Mother. Your what? Stocking scores. You see, we're trying to make Midge remember to use Lux Flakes for her stockings. Oh. So we've made up a little game. Yes, we're supposed to Lux our stockings every night. Only I still forget sometimes. And then we keep track of how many days our stockings wear without getting run. And, Mother, Dot's worn one pair of stockings 18 days. Isn't that wonderful? Well, it certainly is. What's your record, Midge? 
Well, I'd have been all right, only I went and rubbed my stockings with a cake of soap a few times, and, and they popped into runs. Well, what could you expect? Scrubbing your stockings like that, Midget. Well, anyway, I'm better than I used to be. You just wait. One of these days, my score will be as good as yours. Well, if you ever remember to always use Lux, it will be. Those girls have the right idea. Try Lux Flakes for your stockings. You'll be delighted at the way it helps your stockings wear longer. Lux saves the elasticity of silk. It stretch and give. Your stockings won't break into run so easily, and they'll fit better, too. Yes, Lux helps stockings and all washables stay new looking longer. That's a good thing to remember. A thrifty thing to remember. Because a little goes so far. Lux is thrifty, you know. And now I see Mr. DeMille is ready to raise the curtain on the second act of our play. We continue with Lives of a Bengal Lancer. Starring Errol Flynn, Brian Ahern, Jackie Cooper, and C. Aubrey Smith. Several days have passed since McGregor and Forsyth left to seek information on the movements of the hill tribes. It's long after midnight, and in the lamplit regimental headquarters, Colonel Stone remains in conference with the Chief of Army Intelligence, Sir Thomas Woodley. Personally, I feel the Amir of Bhopal is only a tool in the hands of Mohammed Khan. Definitely, General. I've known the Amir of Bhopal 20 years, and I don't believe he'd join this war against us. Why... Every year or so, I take the regiment of Bhopal for the hunting. That means hunting wild pigs in this section. Why not drop in on him as usual this year? If our information is correct, Mohammed Khan will be there. <laughs> Nothing would please me more. Mr. McGregor has just returned, sir. Good. Ask him to come in. This is the man I sent to reconnoiter. McGregor? Well, McGregor? All safe? All safe, sir. Good. And you saw our man? Yes, sir. He says the Afghan chief is rounding up the border tribes against us. Mohammed Khan has agreed to furnish two million rounds of ammunition. Two million rounds? And did our man learn where Mohammed Khan hopes to get it? Yes, sir. By capturing our year's supply train, sir. Good work. Thank you, McGregor. Uh, may I speak, sir? Well? Why can't we slip out of here? Strike first. Wipe out Mohammed Khan before he attacks us. Uh, are you suggesting I begin hostilities before consulting Army Intelligence Headquarters? Army Intelligence? They're a bunch of old ladies, sir. They won't give us action. They'll send us to the Amir of Bhopal's for parade or pig-sticking. An excellent suggestion. What? Sir Thomas, may I present Lieutenant McGregor? McGregor, this is Major General Sir Thomas Woodley, Chief of Army Intelligence. Oh. Oh, yes, sir. How do you do? Uh, very well, thank you. Colonel Stone, your regiment leaves a door to hunt wild pigs on the estate of the Amir of Bhopal. Do you hear that, McGregor? Uh, yes, sir. Then let it be a lesson in diplomacy. Now get yourself a few hours sleep. We leave at five. Pig sticking. That's marvelous, that is. <laughs> oh, Mac, will you keep quiet? I was just falling asleep. Intelligence department. Action's just about to bust around here, and all we do is to go and ride over the private hunting grounds of a tin whistle prince, sticking lances into pigs. Wonderful. <laughs> Sounds rather fun. I ought to be good at that. Uh, oh, by the way, I've got some bad news for you. Your ward, young Stone. Well, what about him? What about him? <laughs> what about him indeed? What are you talking about? Well, every night since we left, he's been down in the native quarter of the town. Rolls home blotto about dawn. He does? Is he there now? Oh, he's out on the usual binge, I imagine. But we leave for Bhopal in two hours. Oh, my, my. What will stern father say if we leave without his son? You know, you really ought to do something about it, Meg. Oh, let old Ramrod do something about it. I'm going to bed. <laughs> I reasoned along similar lines. However, you might hang a lamp in the window or something. Native quarters, eh? Well, I suppose I'd better go and get him. So long, nurse. Oh, shut up. Mr. McGregor, you're late. Line's been waiting ten minutes for you. Sorry, sir. We... I mean, I overslept. Overslept? Report to me later. Join your squadron. One yes, moment, sir. sir. Well, Lieutenant Stone? He didn't oversleep, sir. Mr. McGregor spent the night digging me out of a native quarter and trying to get me sober. Mr. Stone, if I didn't need every officer, I'd place you under immediate arrest. Take a place. We leave for Bhopal at once. That's what all this fuss is for, eh? 
big reception, fancy speeches. Oh, Bopel will turn out in the morning for what? Well, I believe you said for pig sticking. Yeah, uh, shut up. If you don't mind, Mac, I rather like it here. It's like something out of Arabian Nights. I say, look, on that bench by the fountain, that girl. Oh, well, Mr. McGregor. Oh, oh definitely. She is beautiful, isn't she? I wonder who she is. <clears throat> that, my friend, is what I'm just going to find out. Uh, you? Well, I saw her first, didn't I? No, Mac, you know you're lying. I oh, saw no, her. No, wait no, a minute. No, I really, you know it, I saw her first. Loser, keep clear. But I say, really, gentlemen. <laughs> hey, look. Psst, look out. Here comes the colonel and that chief of the Oxford Brogue. Pull in your stomachs, gentlemen. Now, I'd like you to meet two more of my officers, Mr. McGregor and Mr. Forsyth. This gentleman is our friend and neighbor across the border from our station, Mohammed Khan. Mohammed? Oh, honored, Khan Saab. Khan Saab, a very great pleasure, gentlemen. And now, Khan Saab, if you'll grant me a few moments of private conversation, there are a few things I'd like to discuss. Well, I'll be at Mohammed Khan. The enemy himself. And I thought we came here for pig sticking. Mr. Forsythe, let me give you some advice. Never make fun of army intelligence. Thank you, Mr. McGregor. And now, I believe we had some unfinished business. Oh, yes, yes, the little slide number on the bench. Right, heads or tails? Uh, don't bother, Mac. Look over there. Your ward has beat us to it. Well, can you beat that? Well, well I suppose we'll have to rescue him again, Forsythe. Just what I was thinking. Come along, old man. Tanya Volonskaya. Did I say it right? Oh, you have a wonderful Russian accent, Mr. Stone. Oh, there. I knew you were Russian. Oh. Hello, Casanova. Oh, hello. You were telling me, Miss Volonskaya, about the opera? I'm sorry, Mr. Stone, but Major Hamilton wants you. Very important. Now, look here, Mac. I... I That's I... an order, Mr. Stone. Very well. Pardon me, Miss Volonskaya. I'll be back in a moment. Too bad he had to leave, Miss Volonskaya. Did I hear it right? Uh, uh, did uh, we hear it right? Oh, yes. That is correct. Uh, no manners, this younger generation, Miss Volonskaya. You forgot the introductions. Now, uh, this is Mr. McGregor, who is strongly imbued with the protective instinct. Oh, and this is Mr. Forsythe, who is a snake charmer. Oh, won't you sit down? Well, oh, thanks. thanks. You said something of snake charming? Did I? Oh, I much to talk about myself. Now, you take me. I'm from Canada, up in Alberta. A thoroughly dirty trick, Mac, and I won't keep still. You will keep still. These walls are like paper, and your voice carries all over the place. You made me walk right into a heavy discussion between the colonel and that Mohammed Khan chap with the Oxford accent. The old man was furious. Look, now, you two, please put out that lamp and go to sleep. I'll get even with you someday, Mac. You see if I don't. All right, then. If you want the truth, here it is. And this is the reason you've got to keep away from her. She's Mohammed Khan's. What? Yes, she came here with him. We found it out afterwards. She? I don't believe it. Oh, oh, oh. he doesn't believe it, Forsythe. Oh, go to sleep. Do we have to be up every night saving him from women? We've got to be up at dawn again for pigs. Pacing your tent will not settle your problems, Mohammed Khan. Perhaps not, Tanya, but it will help assuage my anger. Is the great Mohammed Khan angry at the unexpected? You don't understand. I laid a trap for this wise old fox of a British colonel to fall into. I wished him to attack the border while I remained peacefully here. His being here ruins my plans to seize the two million rounds of ammunition I pledged myself to furnish. You would like to have the old fox attack the border? What else have I been saying? Have you ever taken a cub? From a tigress. Is this a time for riddles? What do you mean? The wise old fox has brought with him his cub. He paid you marked attention this evening. Mm -hmm. Yes, the cub likes me. Now, if that cub were captured, taken wherever you want the old one to follow... <laughs> <laughs> My dear Tanya, forgive me. I'm continually surprised to discover intelligence in a woman of such great beauty. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we have not lost yet, my Tanya. If you could send him a message secretly tonight. At once, Mohammed Khan. Who is it? Who's out there? Open the door. Hey, that sounds like Major Hamilton. All times to wake a man up. McGregor! Forsyth! 
Yes, sir. Well, you'll go to the colonel's quarters at once. Yes, sir. Anything wrong? Mohammed Khan and his men have decamped, and they've taken young Stone with them. he's gone back to the border, we can be at Magala as soon as he can. This regiment can ride, sir. I'm quite aware my regiment can ride. But it's not going to ride. Mohammed Khan kidnapped my son to goad me into pursuing him. To draw the lancers out of position. He's mistaken his man. The regiment stays right here. Obedient to the intelligence department. Then let me go, sir. I could take a small detachment. And... Thank you, Mr. McGregor, but I'll allow no officer to risk his life when another's own disobedience and folly caused his trouble. Colonel Stone, you've been on the border a long time, I know. But perhaps you've never heard what Muhammad Khan does to his prisoners. I've been on this border 20 years, Mr. McGregor. You're unnecessarily dramatic. Am I? I was just beginning to think I was wrong about you. But I wasn't. You're nothing but a ramrod. You'll sit here while they kill your son by inches. Please, Mr. McGregor. Pending charges of insubordination, consider yourself under arrest. Mr. Forsyth? Yes, sir. You'll be responsible for the prisoner. Yes, sir. Come along, McGregor. Colonel Stone, you... That will do. Yes, sir. Major Hamilton? Yes, Colonel. You will see that everything goes on as usual. We must show no alarm. Yes, sir. It's strange, Major. But for the first time, I begin to realize I have a son. You will go to your quarters, Major. Spoke your mind. If there's any virtue in that. Regiment. Duty. You're improperly dressed. The old stuffed shirt. Why, I could... Ah, look here, man. Get some sense. You imagine it was easy for him to do this? Well, why not? He'd do the same to any of us. Well, you're wrong. I watched his face. He was as white as a sheet. Well, isn't that nice? That's being a man and a soldier, I suppose. Well, if it is, I don't want any part of it. Look, Mick. It ever occurred to you to wonder why a handful of men have managed to order the lives of 300 million people out here in India? Because he's here. And a few more like him. Men who put their jobs ahead of everything. Neither death, death, nor love can move them from it. And when his breed dies out, well, that's the end, dear Mac. Huh. You're on his side, are you? Well, I'm not. He can sit over there and hug his duty all he wants to. But I'm going to do something. I'm going after that kid. Oh, really, Mr. McGregor? <laughs> you place me in a most unfortunate position. Now, listen, Forsyth. I don't want any trouble from Maybe you. Maybe you never heard what Muhammad Khan does to his prisoners, Mr. McGregor. I'm going to go in native costume. I'll get by, all right. But I'm going. Oh, very well. When do we start? What, what do you mean, we? Well, you're my prisoner, you know. Can't let you out of my sight. We'll go after the kid. Oh, so I'm Mother McCree, huh? Well, I guess this makes you something, too. Come along, Mrs. Forsyth. Come along. We pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. just finished the second act of Lives of a Bengal Lancer, starring Errol Flynn, Brian Ahern, Jackie Cooper, and C. Aubrey Smith. During this brief intermission, we bring you our guest of the evening. But first, a word to the ladies. Look at your hands for a moment. Right now, while I'm talking, won't you? Are they as smooth and pretty as you'd like them to be? If they're not, maybe it's the fault of the soap you use for your dishes. Why not switch to Lux Flakes? Lux is kind to your hands, you know. It has no harmful alkali, absolutely nothing to dry and age your skin. It helps your hands stay soft and smooth the way you want them to look. Next time you buy soap for your dishes, think of your hands and say, Lux Flakes, please, in the large size box. And now, here's Mr. DeMille with our guest. Like the men of our play, tonight's guest, General Hugh Samuel Johnson, has had a career long characterized by service to his country. Serving with the Army in the Philippines and in Mexico under General Pershing, General Johnson, during the World War, handled the gigantic problems of the drafts and army supply and commanded the 8th Division. 
Famous as administrator of the NRA, he's also an author of books and articles on national events and a two-fisted columnist for the Scripps Howard newspapers. We switch our microphones now to Washington, D.C. General Johnson, come in. I like these radio presentations of great dramas. I think The Lives of a Bengal Lancer is the best movie I have seen. I saw it four times. My son, a captain in our regular army, has seen it oftener. Most of our soldiers saw it. I never heard any who did not feel about it as I do. My brother-in-law served for years in the Indian Army. He took into France a Punjabi brigade, the very type of troops here pictured. The Lives of a Bengal Lancer is true to life, if not to any particular story. To anybody who has served in the Orient, it wakes memories as poignant as is peat smoke to an Irishman. The motto of West Point is engraved on the ring of every man who ever graduated. Grant, Sherman, Sheridan, Lee, Stonewall Jackson, Pershing, and thousands of others. It is simply duty, honor, country. On that motto, a tradition arose. It demands and receives any sacrifice for the nation, even certain death. We can ever rely on it as the country has relied for almost a century and a half. The Lives of a Bengal Lancer tells a similar story of the British Army. It is no better and no worse than thousands of stories that the American Army knows. I don't usually cry at movies, but I bathe this one in weeping. It is a simple, honest tale of men who would rather be dead than not be decent. Nobody deserves credit for doing his plain duty. But every man who dies doing it deserves at least the tribute of a tear. The general salutes the soldier. Thank you, General Johnson. We return to Hollywood for Act Three of Lives of a Bengal Lancer, starring Errol Flynn, Brian Ahern, Jackie Cooper, and C. Aubrey Smith. fortified valley, nestled among the forbidding Afghan mountains, lies Mogala, stronghold of Mohammed Khan. In a crude room, richly hung with fine tapestries, the Khan, in native dress, is seated cross-legged on the floor. He smiles as he's told of the capture of two British officers. And one of them played most atrociously upon a Pashto reed pipe. When we arrested them as impostors, he dropped the pretense of being deaf and dumb and claimed he played the pure music of Arabia. <laughs> These English, what bravery to cross our mountains in such a fashion, disguised as our own people. I believe I shall have dinner in the great hall tonight, Hassan, and I will have these two English officers as my guest with Mr. Stone. I want the dinner to be faultless. In the English manner, I taught you. Candles, the good silver, the fine china... And yes, the 1870 brandy and the 1912 Medoc. It is done, Muhammad Khan. Oh, yes. I've seen some excellent cricket in my day, Mr. Forsyth. I was asked for 1910, you know. Oh, really? Ah, then that explains your tastes. A really splendid dinner, Khan Sahib. The mutton, how was it? Ah, uh, uh, well, now you make my position very difficult. <laughs> Pride of country, you know. <laughs> English mutton is acknowledged the finest. <laughs> More brandy, Mr. Stone? No, thank you. Oh, but you've scarcely eaten a thing. Come, Mr. Stone, a soldier should never refuse to eat, drink, or make love. My sentiments exactly, Khan Sahib. Eat, drink, and be merry. But tomorrow... But tomorrow we die. Khan Sahib, I'm getting fed up with this cat and mouse stuff. What's the score? Easy, Meg. You've caught us. Now what are you going to do with us? <laughs> Mr. McGregor wants action. Well, perhaps you shall have it. It will depend. Go on. I naturally regret that Colonel Stone did not rise to my bait and attack me when I uh, uh, removed his son. I now must admit I had underestimated the Colonel's intelligence. Well, what's that make us? It makes of you whatever you choose. In fact, I am prepared to furnish all three of you with horses and a safe conduct pass through the mountain tribes so you may rejoin your regiment. And what's the catch? You have but to answer two simple questions. Watch this one, Mick. <laughs> I want to know... By what route the yearly ammunition train is coming to supply the 41st Lancers and just where the 41st Lancers plans to meet it. Hmm. Well. 
When the furry household animal jumped out of the bag, it really jumped, didn't it? <laughs> well, gentlemen, you will not tell me? We have ways to make men talk, as you are all no doubt thinking, effective ways. And so, if you will not give the information voluntarily, I will have to call upon experts to assist you. My household guards, gentlemen. Does this mean we're prisoners, not guests? I regret to say it does. Well, that's splendid. Because I've been wanting to tell you all along what I really thought of that mutton. Precisely my thought, Mr. McGregor. Uh, I regret to say it, Mohammed Khan, but your mutton is distinctly inferior. The word, Mr. Forsyth, is rotten. Gentlemen, as you may have guessed, is the uh, the room where we obtain much of our most desirable information. Good God. Steady. Pull yourself together, Stan. Oh, really, sirs? Must I proceed to such unpleasant and absurd extremes as torture? Well, now these, these are the beginning. They look like mere strips of thin bamboo. However, driven under the nails and lighted, we find them very, uh, warm. <laughs> And persuasive. Lakra Jalau. Mr. Forsyth and Mr. Stone, I will ask you two to watch while we start with Mr. McGregor. Salutary, the effect of watching at times. You devil, shut up. Thank you, Mr. Forsyth. I dislike dramatics intensely myself. Now, Mr. McGregor, if you will sit down, please. Lakra Jalau. Warm, Mr. McGregor? Now, that ammunition train will be... Where, please? I don't know. Where? I don't know. Oh, but you do. Think hard. I don't know. I don't know. That you, Forsyth? Yes. Have a cigarette. Are they all through with you? I hope so. Seem to have got to the second stage with Stone. <laughs> I thought they'd busted the whip on me. You know, now I've been through it. The licking my old man gave me once was almost as bad. Oh, don't make. You didn't talk, did you? Not unless I was unconscious. Did I? Never knew you could swear like you did. Oh. Oh, I'm not so bad. <laughs> They're keeping him longer in there than they kept us. Yeah, seems like it. Hope he's had a licking from his old man. Well, not him. Don't you remember? Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, well, that's a new experience for him. <coughs> you know, somehow it, it hurts worse to hear it on him. Maybe that's because you think he'll talk. Well, don't you? I can't help it. Feel... Well, after all, he's got the old man's blood in him. Listen, they're bringing him in. Hope so. Oh, my God, my God, don't do it, don't, don't do it. Here, here, take his head back. On the bed with him. Right, up. up. Here, cigarette, kid. Leave me alone, leave me alone. Listen, did you talk? Leave me alone. Sorry, Stone, we have to know. I didn't talk, do you hear? I swear I didn't. All right, kid. All right, we believe you. Here, here, take the cigarette. Well, I guess Mohammed Khan found the Lancers a pretty tough bunch. Maybe one of you fellas can tell me, when do whiskers stop itching and get to be a beard? Now, that is really a problem for the philosophers, Mr. McGregor. Now, take my own beard. I would say that in another week I shall be um, about eligible for the French Academy. Oh, don't you fellas ever talk like human beings? When you're in jail, Mr. Stone, you cease to be a human being. Oh, listen. Listen, what's that noise? Take a look from the window. Right. It's another caravan, probably. Well, what's the matter? Stone. What? Didn't you tell us that they didn't make you talk? I told you I didn't talk. I gave you my word, didn't I? What you see out there? It's another caravan, all right. They're loaded with ammunition boxes. Hundreds of them. And all bearing our seal. Our ammunition? Two million rounds. Captured by Muhammad Khan if it turns back against British soldiers. You hear that, Stone? That's what you've done. Oh, don't, don't. I couldn't help it. I no couldn't. No wonder they didn't take us back into that torture chamber. They didn't have to. 
Because you told them. Because you didn't have the nerve to stand a little pain. Well, you think of the pain you'll cause our men, our messmates. Oh, stop it. One of us gone to pieces is enough. <laughs> Don't take it too hard, Stone. It's not your fault entirely. But I can see now how right your father was. The Lancers are soldiers, well-seasoned soldiers, toughened by service. You're a kid and the Lancers are men. Your father wanted to make a man of you. Wanted to get you so that you could take it. Take anything and never let the army down. That's the only thing we want out here. Chance to do a job and to do it well. Well, I guess you know that now, kid. Watch it. Good evening, gentlemen. Well, well, <laughs> the old mutton server. My friends, I thought you might be interested to know your clever Colonel Stone is about to pay me a visit. Some call it an attack against me with the 41st Bengal Lancers. They are now only two hours away. I expect to make his reception a memorable one. But I hope to capture the Colonel alive so that I may see his face when I present him with his son who has betrayed him. Good evening, my friends. 300 lances. Against that ammunition. Oh, the Colonel wouldn't do anything so foolish. He has to. Once that ammunition is distributed, it means a general war. He's got to try to recapture it or destroy that ammunition. Wait. Well, I've got an idea. I think so. What do you see out there, Mac? I was just measuring the distance from here to the place where they're storing that stuff. Oh, about... Uh... About 200 yards, I'd say. No, 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 near 100. Yeah, I ran the 200 at Cambridge. Is that so? Well, I run the, ha run the 110 flat at McGill. This is a job for 100 yards. Toss you for it, Mac. Oh, no, you don't. I'm your superior officer. You take your orders from well, me. You forget you're my prisoner. You take orders from me. No. Shh, someone's coming. It's the guard, without food. Now. Here's our chance. Get behind the door. Get it, Mac. Right. Oh. Well, so long, Mac. Oh, no, you don't. If anyone's going... I'm sorry, Forsyth, but I said this was my job. So long. Mac, Mac, come back. Shut up. You want to give him away? What's he going to do? He's going to blow up that ammunition shed, if he can. Blow up the... Mac! Get away from that door. Oh, no, no, I'm going after you him, you hear? You'll you'll get what Mac gave me. Oh, but he's going to die for what I did. Let me out, let me out. You, oh. you asked for it, Stone. Now, listen. McGregor went out there to blow up that ammunition and himself with it, so that your father can hold up his head. You might think you can run out on that, but you can't. You're going to face it. All your life you'll face it. And your father's never going to know. And that's the debt you owe McGregor. You hear? I hear. I hear. Yes, then you pray that Mac has luck in blowing that place up, or you'll have no father to keep the secret from. Go on, pray. Pray, I tell you. Oh, God. God, let him get away. It's a miracle I'm asking. But he's there to die for me, for what I've done. It's I who should die. There he goes. Him. There he goes. Miracle. Miracle. Oh, keep going, miracle. Miracle. oh, keep going, Mac. Miracle. Keep going, man. Go on. Go on. He's, he's there. Boy. He's there. Good boy, Mac. Good boy. And by the command of His Majesty the King Emperor, and in the presence of this regiment, I confer upon you, Lieutenant Sir Forsyth, the Distinguished Service Order. Thank you, sir. Second, Lieutenant Donald Stone, 41st Bengal Lancers, for conspicuous gallantry in action. During the recent siege of Mangala, he broke from the cell in which he was imprisoned and attacked the enemy from within, killing their leader, Mohammed Khan and thus demoralizing hostile forces when the success of our arms is in the balance. Lieutenant Donald Stone, by command of His Majesty the King Emperor, and in the sight of this regiment, I confer upon you the Distinguished Service Order. My boy. Thank you, sir. Captain Alan McGregor, 41st Bengal Lancers, deceased. The sacrifice of his life, he destroyed enemy ammunition supplies, contributing thereby to the success of our arms in action before the siege of Mogala. His Majesty the King Emperor has been most graciously pleased to confer posthumously the Victoria Cross upon the late Captain Alan McGregor. In accordance with the custom of this regiment, 
I place this cross upon the saddle cloth of his horse. Move to the right in column of horse. Home, horse. Right, horse. And the left, quick, horse. McGregor, McGregor. Yes, to take it. To take anything. Never let the army down. That's the only thing we want out here. It's a chance to do a job. And to do it well. Well, I guess you know that now, kid. on the last act of Lives of a Bengal Lancer, starring Errol Flynn, Brian Ahern, Jackie Cooper, and C. Aubrey Smith. In a moment, our stars return for their bow. But first, I wonder if you can guess how many teaspoons of flakes one large-sized box of Lux holds. I'll wager you won't come anywhere near the right figure. Well, measured out spoonful for spoonful, there are nearly 400 rounded teaspoons of flakes in one large-sized box. Nearly 400 teaspoonfuls. Think of that. And just a few flakes make such wonderful suds. Gentle but effective. One box of Lux will do many, many things for you. And that's a good thing to remember while you're thinking of spring house cleaning. It would take a long time to list all the things Lux flakes will keep fresh and bright in every room of your house. But just to give you an idea, in the bedroom... The blankets and bedspreads, pillows and slip covers. In the living room? Rugs and upholstery, lampshades, piano keys, curtains. The kitchen? Glassware and dishes, of course. The refrigerator, furniture, and linoleum. And the woodwork all over the house. Why, if you don't know how much Lux Flakes can do for you, you'll want to get acquainted with them now. You'll be amazed how much easier Lux makes your housework and how inexpensive it is. A little goes so far. Lux is thrifty, you know. So get the generous large size box tomorrow. And use it for everything safe in water alone. And remember, while you work with gentle Lux Flakes, you'll be saving your hands. And that's mighty important to any woman. Mr. DeMille. In Messrs. Flynn, Ahern, Cooper, and Smith, we have respectively a famous sailor, an airplane pilot, a trap drummer, and a cricket player, which leaves the field open for any topic that may pop into their distinguished heads. Uh, by right of seniority, Mr. Smith, you take the lead. Very well, then. I'll begin by suggesting that Brian and Errol report a little more consistently for cricket practice. Do they play that sissy game? Sissy game? Young man, just you come round to Griffith Park some Sunday afternoon and observe. You'll be playing a different tune on that drum of yours. Sissy game? Got any ducats? <laughs> you don't need tickets, Jackie. Few people seem to know it, but they can witness a fine exhibition of cricket... And some of Hollywood's greatest stars playing it, for no charge at all, by just coming around to the public park. And incidentally, enjoying a nice cup of tea on the house. Perhaps that's it, Brian. Maybe you and Errol don't like the brand of tea we've been serving after the game. Oh, I'm awfully sorry, Mr. Smith. Rough games like cricket are all right for you youngsters, but we're getting on, you know. All the playing Errol and I have been doing lately has been on the sound stages. But what about that trip you just made to Dodge City, Kansas, Mr. Flynn, for your new picture? Ah, yes, Errol. I hear you had a wonderful time there. Hope I get a trip to Mexico for the premiere of Juarez. Uh Ah. Wait till you hear the rootin', tootin', and shootin' when Mr. DeMille opens Union Pacific in Omaha a couple of weeks from now. Mm, Kind words, Errol. But you gave us something to shoot at in your Kansas expedition. Well, sir, I can honestly say I was never so impressed in all my life. Actors, newspapers, photographers, all of us travel to Dodge City. That's a town of about 10,000 people, but when we got there, we found an additional 90,000 visitors. Well, I've been in this country over four years now, but I never really saw America until that trip. I mean the real America, the people who go to see the pictures we make. I've never seen such hospitality or real down-to-earth courtesy as we saw on that trip. And here's one very important discovery for me. After making it, a broadcast like this has taken on an entirely new meaning. I used to just talk into this little black microphone here and hope for the best, but now I feel that I know the people we're playing to. And knowing them, I can't help feeling that I know the finest people in the world. Good night. And so say all of us. Good night, and thank you, C.B. Good night. Good Good night, night. Mr. Mills. Good night, Lancer. 
Report here for duty soon again. Don't miss the news that Mr. DeMille brings you shortly about the stars and play coming next Monday. Tonight's cast included Ian McLaren as Major Hamilton, C. Montague Shaw as Sir Thomas Woodley, Nancy Leach as Tanya, Lal Shandmera as Vizier, Eric Snowden as Captain Hendrickson, and Ian Purvis as Mr. Dawson. Errol Flynn appeared through courtesy of Warner Brothers. Brian Hearn's new Warner picture is Juarez. C. Aubrey Smith is seen in the RKO film Five Came Back, and Douglas Dumbrill in Captain Fury. Lewis Silvers is from 20th Century Fox Studio, where he's directing music for The Return of the Cisco Kid. Be sure to listen to the new Lux Daytime radio program, The Life and Love of Dr. Susan, the story of a young and attractive woman doctor struggling to make life worthwhile for herself and her two small children. You can hear it over most of these stations in the United States every afternoon, Monday through Friday, at 2.15 Eastern Time, 1.15 Central Time, 3.15 Mountain Time, and 2.15 Pacific Time. This new daytime program, The Life and Love of Dr. Susan, comes to you in addition to the Lux Radio Theater. Now, Mr. DeMille. Tonight's play was concerned with a type of warfare that's found only in one corner of the earth. But there's another battle which concerns all of us, the war against rackets. Seldom has this modern crusade been pictured more effectively than in the hit film, Bullets or Ballots, the exciting melodrama you'll hear a week from tonight, the story of a city detective's fight against organized crime. The star will be the same powerful performer you saw in the picture, Edward G. Robinson, and opposite Mr. Robinson, Mary Astor, Humphrey Bogart, and Otto Kruger. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Edward G. Robinson in Bullets or Ballots with Mary Astor, Humphrey Bogart, and Otto Kruger. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Our Lux Radio Theater presentation of Lives of a Bengal Lancer has come to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Flakes, the gentle, thrifty flakes known to women the world over. As Mr. DeMille told you, our play next Monday night is Bullets or Ballots, and starred in it, you will hear Edward G. Robinson, Mary Astor, Humphrey Bogart, and Otto Kruger. Join us again next week in the Lux Radio Theater. Be part of the large audience that gathers each Monday to enjoy an hour of dramatic entertainment and to meet Hollywood and its famous people. The announcer has been Melville Ruick, and this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Let's eat. Oh, those golden Grahams. Oh, those golden Grahams. Crispy, crunchy Graham cereal family breakfast treat. Oh, those golden Grahams. Oh, those golden Grahams. Golden honey, just a touch with Graham's golden wheat. It's a great tasting part of a complete breakfast for the whole family. Try those golden Grahams and have a golden day. The warrior of the woodland... Ranger Bill is coming up next. Ranger Bill, Warrior of the Woodland. Ranger Bill, Warrior of the Woodland, struggling against extreme odds traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. 
pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. I think that I shall never see a poem lovely as a tree, a tree whose hungry mouth is pressed against the earth's sweet flowing breast, a tree that looks at God all day and lifts her leafy arms to pray, a tree that may in summer wear a nest of robins in her hair, upon whose bosom snow is lain, who intimately lives with rain. Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. Hi there, boys and girls. Didn't expect me to start off with a poem today, did you? Well, when the poet Joyce Kilmer wrote Only God Can Make a Tree, he made a profound statement. A tree is a wonderful creation made by the Lord's hand, and we use trees for a great many purposes. Trees are one of our most valuable assets, and much is done by us to preserve them until the time that they're ready to be cut down. Then we leave seeding trees to start the forest anew. We have tree farms where we grow thousands upon thousands of trees to reforest areas that have been cut for timber and the byproducts of wood. And believe me, out our way, you see plenty of action if and when we find our trees in danger. Well, our story today can have no better title than The Falling Giants. Boy, oh boy, Dad, it sure is nice of you to bring me up here to see the giant pines. Well, I'm glad to do it, Mike. I wish that we could take more trips like this together. You really like them, eh? Big pines. Oh, I think they're terrific. How old do you think they are? Oh, that's hard to say, son. Say, there's some kind of an exhibit along the road ahead. Let's stop and take a look. Swell, Dad. It must be about these trees. It is about the trees. How to tell their age. Say, this is neat. Yes, this is a fine exhibit. Some of these trees have been here for over a hundred years. Yeah, there's a couple of seeding trees that are older than that. Boy, these are something. Yes, son. These trees are one of America's most valuable assets. Well, they're worth millions upon millions of dollars. Can we walk down and look closer at them? Well, I guess so. I don't see any signs that say we can't. Well, here comes a ranger. Let's ask him. Good idea. Howdy, fellas. Hi, How ranger. Do you do? Uh, say, ranger, is it uh, all right if we walk down among these pines? Uh, sure is. Uh, that's what they're here for. Just to admire. Thanks a lot. Uh, you're welcome. Hey, uh, where are you from? The Central City. <laughs> I know you wasn't from around here. Uh, by the way. Uh, don't strike any matches around the trees. Oh, we wouldn't do that. We've seen what fire can do to trees. I wish everybody felt that way. Uh, say, uh, you haven't got any candy or food in your car, have you? No, we haven't. Why, uh, have you got a taste for some? <laughs> <laughs> nope. But the bears around here have. They tear your car to pieces trying to get at it. Well, enjoy yourselves. What was that? I don't know exactly, but it sounded like one of these big trees took a fall on his face. What are you going to do? Have me a look. Can we come too? Sure, but you'll have to move fast. Want me to take the wheel now, Brian? <sighs> yeah, maybe a better, Keith. Suddenly getting kind of sleepy. Well, there's a... Good shoulder ahead by those giant pines. Yeah, I'll stop there. Oh. It'll be good to hit the hay. Ryan, that tree's going to fall. What? You're joking. It. Will you? Hey, look out! <laughs> Look 
Look at that. Yeah. Oh, it's a good thing we got out of there and faster we did. We'd have been killed for sure. It fell right across the cab. Let's get out of here before more come down. You said it. We gotta find some way to tell our rangers. What's wrong with this tree, Ranger? I don't know, Mike. You, you can call me Stumpy. You mean the tree just fell over for no reason at all? Yep. That's what it looks like to me. But this is the first time I've seen this happen. I've been in these forests a long time. Wow. Do you, do you think more will fall over just like this one? Well, I hope not. I'm not going to stay around to find out. Come on, let's get while the getting's good. Well, you... You're not just going to forget about this, are you, Stumpy? I'll say I'm not. As soon as I get back to my patrol car, I'm going to radio Bill, my boss, and get him out here right sudden-like, if not sooner. Stumpy must have flipped his lid. How could a big pine tree fall over like a tent pin and for no reason? <laughs> I don't know, pal. I'll admit it sounds crazy, but it must be so. You're right. The old-timers pull off a lot of tricks, but when he doesn't joke about the trees. Right. Hey, hey, look at those two men waving us down. Uh-huh. What's the matter, fellas? Boy, are we glad you came along. Tree fell on the cab of our truck and crushed it like a sponge cake. Dead? I'll say it did. Where's your truck? Oh, uh, back up the road about half mile and a half. Okay, hop in. We'll take a look. Where's the tree, old-timer? Down inside the stand, about a block. Who are these fellers, hitchhikers? No, a tree fell across the cab of their truck and crushed it. There's something mighty peculiar going on around here. Right. Are these two uh, visitors? Yep. They stopped to look at the trees. Uh, and this is Mike and his paw. The name is uh, Leonard Smith, Mr. Jefferson. Uh, Mr. Smith, will you take these two men to Naughty Pine with you right away? I'd be glad to. Well, can we stay around and find out what's going on? I'm sorry, it's too risky. Now get going. My car's right over here. Uh, you let us know what's wrong? Sure. Don't send a tow truck, because this area's going to be closed until it's considered safe again. Oh, okay. Let's go, Mr. Smith. Yeah. Where do we go from here? You, uh, say there's no apparent reason for the tree you looked at to fall, old-timer? Nope. None that I could see, sonny. Uh, none at all. Maybe we should go back and look at the other one, too. Uh, we will in due time, Henry. The first thing is to seal off this area before someone gets killed. Uh, Stumpy, uh, you go down the road about two miles and block it off. Henry will... Uh, Take you there in the car. Uh, Henry, you can take me up the road first to where the tree fell on the truck. Okay, let's go. Sovereign catfish, look at the cab. <laughs> Why, it's flattened like a pancake. You said it, youngster. Paul Bunyan really stepped on it. Man, are those guys fortunate to be alive. I'll say they are. Now, you understand what you're to do, huh, pal? Sure. I'm to go back to headquarters and send out a dozen rangers to seal off the area. Mm -hmm. And then bring out the equipment truck. Right. And don't forget to drop the old timer off where I said. Okay. I'll get going.
What's the matter, Ranger? Uh, this road is closed, driver. What? Since when? Since I got here about ten minutes ago. Now, see here, Ranger. Who do you think you are closing off this highway just like that? Just because you're wearing a law badge doesn't give you the right to abuse us citizens. This bus has a schedule to meet, and we got places to go and things to do. And I don't see who you think you are to stand there and say we can't go down this road. You rangers get mighty uppity to my way of thinking. Will you glance down the road about a hundred yards and tell me what you see? <gasps> Why? Why, it looks like a giant pine falling what crushed the cab of that truck. Bless my soul if it isn't. Another tree has fallen down at the visitor stop. That's why you can't go through here with this busload of people. I, uh, I'm awful sorry, Ranger. Uh, my husband always tells me I got a big mouth. I'm beginning to think he's right. You'll have to turn around here on this wide shoulder, driver. Go back to Route 97 and take it into Naughty Pine. Sure. Say, what's making the trees fall? I don't know. That's where the danger is. Who knows what tree will be next? Now, uh, you can turn around right here. Yes, sir. Thank you, Lord, for keeping the trees here standing straight up while that busload of people were parked here. Stumpy, right tolerable, in fact. I reckon you are. Looks like you've been eating three squares a day. <laughs> yep. I tell you, Stumpy, prospecting for uranium is a sight better paying than scratching for gold. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Where are you headed for? Oh, around straight up mountain country. Thought I'd cut through the big pines and save me and Gertrude some walking. Well, uh, Luke... I'm afraid I'm going to have to disappoint you. Yeah, well, how come? Woo, please, say, where's them rangers going in such an old-fired hurry? Somebody rob a bank? Nope. They're going to where Bill's at and get orders. This area is closed off. Uh, not to old Luke, thing. <laughs> old Luke or young Luke makes no difference. Them big pines is falling down for no reason at all. Of course, if they hit you on the head, you old otter, it wouldn't hurt you none, but they might hurt Gertrude. Oh, go on. There's <laughs> no use of sulking. Those are mortars. There ain't nobody going to get in here. Uh, 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 some days it just don't pay for a fella to open his eyes at sun up. Come on, Gertrude. The extra walk will hurt my feet more than yours. See you later, Stumpy. Okay, Luke. Uh, stay on the little beaver trail until you get to the three forks. And if a tree even looks like it's leaning too far over, run like the devil himself was after you. That's right, operator. I'm Morton Stengard. Yes, yes, I'll wait. Uh, Gray Wolf. Uh, yes, Bill. And the ground crew is here yet? Ah, uh, truck just pull up now. Tell Stumpy to take one crew and have them tear open the tree that fell in the forest. Now you take another and the winch truck and get the tree off the truck. Tow the truck out of danger and call Bill Nolan and tell him to tow it into town. Then tear the tree apart so Mort can have a sample when he gets here. Right away, Bill. Hello, Bill. Uh, hold on, Mort. Uh, Gray Wolf. Here, Bill. Uh, tell the other two crews to stand by, ready to move out at any time. I tell them. All right, go ahead, Mort. Sorry for the delay. You go ahead. It's your nickel. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I did call you, Mort. Uh, how soon can you get here with your mobile lab? Well, that depends on how urgent it is. I'm already working on a problem for Colonel Anders. Well, we've got 
pine trees falling down for no apparent reason. You don't say. That's urgent enough for me, all right. I'll be out there early this evening. Fine. I'll clear with Colonel Anders to take you off the hook. I'll appreciate that, Bill. See you later. I've got the map spread out on the table, Bill. Okay, Henry. Uh, a mic. A mic. Yes, Bill? I'll leave the sides of the tent up in case we have to get out of here in a hurry. Sure, Bill, sure. I forgot, this tent isn't made of steel. Fellas, I'm Gordon Payne from the Daily Herald. Well, howdy. We're the two truck drivers, and this is Mr. Smith and uh, his son, Mike. Hello, How do you do, well, Mr. Smith? Yeah. How about your story? Well, sure. We'll tell you about the truck, and Mr. Smith can tell you his experience. Well, the, the ranger, Stumpy Jenkins, said that, well, as far as he could tell, the tree had no reason to topple over, Mr. Payne. Hmm, well, thanks, fellas. I'm going to call this in and then go out there. This sounds like a big one. I don't think you'll get through. Oh, no? Why not? Well, there have been rangers' cars and trucks potting through there all day. They ain't got that place sealed tighter than a tire in a rim. Well, they'll have to let me in. I'm the press. Tom, you've got to let me pass. Sorry, Gordy. No can do. Ah, uh, now, is that any way to treat a buddy? I've done a lot of stories on you fellas. Good ones, too. Well, yeah, then you should know better than to ask. When Bill says keep him out, well, that's just exactly what he means. See, Tom, let's see if you can stop this guy. He's Winthrop Kane, the lumber millionaire. Where's Bill Jefferson, Ranger? Well, about two miles up the road in the heart of the trouble, sir. Yeah, it's a foolish question, I guess. He's always in the thick of it. Open up the roadblock and I'll drive through. Can't do that. What? You know who I am. <laughs> what was that? Another tree went down. That's why you can't go in there. Uh, all right, can't you contact your boss? I want to talk to him. I've got millions tied up in trees, and I want to know what's going on. You might as well call him, Tom. Here comes Todd Jackson from the Department of Interior. Uh, I guess so. Looks like these trees have made enough noise to be heard in Washington. Bill, another one just went down. Okay, Henry, uh... Put a red pin on the map. Sure. What's it look like, Mark? Nothing, Bill. Absolutely nothing. You... you can't find anything on those specimens? That's right. I've made slides from these samples and put them under the high-powered microscope. All I can see is healthy wood fibers. Well, how do you like that? No disease? No bugs? Bacteria? And yet they fall over like something's... Broken their backs. Well, perhaps you'd like me to go out to the actual spot and take a look. Yeah, but uh, it'll be risky. I'm game. I'll get you a steel helmet. We'll get started. Right. Uh, Henry, uh, answer the radio. Come on, Mort. Bill? Uh, yes, pal? It's Tom. Hold it, Mort. What's he want? He says Mr. Kane and Mr. Jackson and the press want to see you. Well, tell them in about an hour. They want to come in. No. Absolutely no. How about the governor? Same answer. One of these trees can kill him just as easy as anyone else. I don't believe this is true. I don't see that. Sorry, uh, Sorry, gentlemen. The boss says no. Well, well we might just as well sit down then, gentlemen. Bill Jefferson means what he says. But, Governor, how can he say that to you? That's what I want to know, too, Philip. Winthrop, Gordon, when a man's trying to do a good job and you know he's capable, knows far more than any of us do about the problem, I say the best way we can help is by being patient. Obviously, Bill hasn't found the answer yet, or he'd tell us. Now, let's not make his job any more difficult than it is already. Hmm? Well, thank you, Governor. It's mighty generous of you. 
Not at all, Thomas. I'm not walking under any fallen trees. <laughs> Close. And how? Let's get out of here. Right. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> this? Are you sure one of these giants hasn't hit you on the head? <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, Mark, we're never too old or too experienced to run up against something new. You mean like this? <laughs> yeah, like this. <laughs> you know, I have the unusual desire to run around this forest and push on all the trees to see how many of them will fall down. Oh, man, you're rough weight. You got any better answer? No, no. I guess your roof doesn't leak. <sighs> Maybe I'm going to wish it did before this is over. Well, since we can't find any bugs pushing over the trees, and disease is making them tired of standing, what next? I guess I'll have to go down and talk to the big cannons. I hope they'll... Not a roar too loud when I tell him I haven't any answers. That's it, gentlemen. I haven't been able to find out the cause of this unusual phenomenon. You haven't, eh? Well, you'd better. I've got millions sign up in trees, and I want an answer. You'll probably wake up in the morning and find all my trees laying on the ground. I rather doubt that, Mr. Kane. It uh, appears that this condition is confined to this immediate area. But you don't know, do you? That's right. I don't. Well, you'd better have an answer soon, Bill. The Secretary of Interior is quite disturbed by this. He's worried that it's a new disease that could sweep forests all over the country. Well, would you prefer that I lie and tell you some drummed-up tale about gremlins pushing over the trees? Gentlemen, Bill's right. Let's not panic because we haven't found the answers sticking out of our pockets. And that may very well be for you to say, Philip. It's not your money that's invested in timber. Winthrop, that's a very unkind remark. I'm interested in not only your timber, but in the timber owned by other people in this state. In fact, I'm very much concerned about every tree in the state. They're our basic and essential natural resources. Yeah, perhaps you're right. But I want some answers, and I want them soon. Gentlemen, I'll have the answers within 24 hours, or else I'll resign from my post as chief ranger. <laughs> What's the sense of staying up anymore tonight? That's the fifth one so far tonight. Bill, you're dog tired. You'll get sick going on without sleep. Uh, perhaps. I'll be sicker if I don't find the answer to this. I know. Henry, get one of those large battery lights, will you? I want to have one more look at the trees. If I don't find anything, I'll turn in and try it again in the morning. Why are you digging around with broken roots? Maybe I'll find something. No. It's awfully peculiar that the anchor roots and the tap roots gave way. But the hair roots are still in good shape. Yeah, I know. That's why I'm digging. Is it a root infection that eats away the main roots that hold the tree? That could be. Hey, uh, why can't I dig too instead of standing around here shivering? Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, start around on the other side, Henry. Uh, there's light enough for both of us. Sure. Here, I'll step across this stump hole. It's too far to walk around. Hey, Bill, help me! Uh, sure. Uh, what, what happened, Henry? Wait, hurry, hurry, there's a fire under here. Here, give me your hat. Here you are. Oh, boy, it's hot. Oh, boy, I burned my ankle. Huh? 
How could you burn your ankle? Here, uh, let me see. You don't blame me. Here, take a look. Huh? Come oh, look at it. boy. Great Scott. You did burn your ankle. Come on. Let's get back to camp. Here, here. I'll carry you. Uh, I can walk. What's the matter with you? Are you glad I got burned? Henry, look where your foot went through the shallow earth. Why, it's burning under there. Like a peat bog fire. Sure it is. Why didn't I think of that before? It's a root fire. It burns down deep. We've, we've never had this before. Oh, what a way to find it. Come on, pal. Let's spread the word and get the boys busy fighting the fire. Phil, what are those men doing with those long rods? Why are they driving them down at an angle uh, next to the trunk and roots? Well, that long rod has a thermometer on the end of it, Mr. Kane. Uh, we can tell if there's a fire in the roots. This really is rare, isn't it, Bill? Yes, Governor, it's very rare indeed. How does it start? Well, uh, lightning could do it. A strong bolt dries into the ground, and the soil is of a peat-like composition. Strange thing about it is that the fire spreads underground and it can go undetected for months. But this one is even more weird because usually the fire is confined to trees in the immediate area of the first one to have a root fire. Well, then it could be freakish enough to be more than one fire, eh, Bill? That's right, Gordon. This area is noted for receiving heavy bolts of light. Not into the trees, but into the ground. How can they put it out? Well, that's not easy. Every tree will have to be tested in this area, and then we'll have to rip up the ground with chiseled plows and flood the underground area with thousands of gallons of water. It'll take time, a lot of time. I know you'll handle that part all right, Bill. Thank you for finding the answer. Yes, many thanks, Bill. Gentlemen, don't thank me. Thank Henry. He's the one that got the hot foot. Perhaps we should call this story Henry's Hot Foot instead of the Falling Giants. Well, see you next week for more adventure with... Ranger Bill! Introducing the Kodak Instant Camera with a twist. Meet the Crank. Can you feel a brand new day? Imagine instant pictures with color. Color. Color by Kodak. Just crank, 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 and in minutes you get bright, colorful instant pictures with a textured satin lux finish. See your photo dealer and shake hands with the Crank. The Kodak Instant Camera with a twist. The first couple of radio comedy are Burns and Allen are up next. Hello, Dad. Oh, George, hey, George, I have the most exciting news. Guess what? My brother Willie's in the Army. Your uh, brother Willie? Yes. Well, if everybody buckles down to their jobs, I think we can win the war anyway. <laughs> oh, George Burns, how could you talk that way? My brother Willie will be a wonderful soldier. I'll bet he is in the Army two weeks before they make him at least an ensign. <laughs> or maybe even a Commodore Uh-huh he, he had to give up that big new job he just got But I guess the Army needs him even more uh, What big new job? Oh, it was a very important position They asked him to clean out some bottlenecks In one of the biggest plants out here Really? Uh, which, uh, which plant? Seven Up Seven Up <laughs> And, uh, now he's in the Army Well, practically He takes his physical today 
And then he'll be off to some remote corner of the earth. Alaska or China, the Bluebeard Islands or the, uh, Burma. The uh, what islands? The Bluebeard Islands, the, Burma. The, the Bluebeard Islands? Yes. Uh, you don't mean the Solomon Islands. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the place. <laughs> uh, uh, I know it had a bunch of wives. <laughs> wonder you didn't call them the Tommy Manville Islands. <laughs> well, anyway, Willie is going to phone me later and tell me where they're sending him. Meanwhile, I've been out shopping all day. Buying things for Willie to take away with him. Uh-huh. Eh? Stuff the army doesn't buy for their soldiers for some silly reason. You know, like a waffle iron or a smoky sand. Uh, that's the kind of stuff you bought him? Oh, sure. I bought him a bridge table and a rolling machine and an electric fan. Stuff that'll come in handy. Yeah, oh, I handy say stuff, it will. Yeah. <laughs> Especially the electric fan. Suppose they send him to some hot place like Africa. Can you see that poor boy out there in that steaming jungle suffering from the heat? And then he turns on my electric fan? <laughs> Where does he plug it in? Uh, then I bought him a billiard cue. And a, a billiard cue? Well, that's nice. Especially when they put him in a tank. Uh, anything else? Uh-huh, a yo-yo. Just in case they send him to Egypt. A yo-yo? I, uh, I don't get it. Oh, George. You know how lazy my brother Willie is? Yeah, but I still don't get it. Well, he always wanted a yo-yo, but he's too lazy to make it go up and down. Well? Well, in Egypt they ride on camels, so Willie just holds a yo-yo on the camel. Camels up and down. It certainly was silly of me not to figure that out myself. It was. It certainly was, dear. Yeah. Can you figure out why I got him a parachute? Just in case they put him in the air corps. Well, that's wonderful, George. You're very good. Well, thanks, thanks. What did you have to pay for this parachute? Not a cent. The man at Bender's Bargain Basement gave it to me. He gave it to you? Yes, and it's a very lovely parachute. When it opens, a big sign on it says, Prices are coming down even faster than this at Bender's Basement. <laughs> well, uh, the boys will certainly envy you. What, what if your brother get sent right into the front line. Oh, oh, I thought of that. That's why I got him a Swiss yodeler's costume. A Swiss yodeler's costume? Certainly. If he gets into the front lines, he'll be very anxious to appear neutral. <laughs> very, very smart present. Yeah, sure. And then I bought him a big knife and a hatchet, just in case they sent him to the Solomons or New Guinea or some of those islands. Well, that's the first sensible present you got. A knife and a hatchet will be uh, very handy if you have to cut your way through jungles. Well, that's not why I got them. No? No. A lot of bananas and nuts grow on those islands. That's... Well, that's right. But what's that got to do with a knife and hatchet? Willie likes banana splits with chopped nuts. <laughs> Well, uh, Gracie, I'm afraid he won't have time if he goes to the Solomons. The boys there are pretty busy chasing the Japs. Yeah, you know, I've read about that. You know, George, this must be a very confusing war for the Japanese. A confusing war? Why? Well, they call themselves the Sons of Heaven. Yeah. And the Marines are sending so many of them to the wrong address. <laughs> It's really a very confusing war, you know. Oh, uh, excuse me, dear. Hello? Oh, hello, Willie. <gasps> Is that so? Oh, congratulations. Now I'll have to get you a different kind of a present. Yes. Oh, goodbye, Willie. Oh, well, Gracie, where are they sending him? Siberia? India? Panama? George, uh, what kind of climate have they got in 4F? <laughs> Good morning, Sir John. Ha! Good morning, indeed. Anything gone wrong, Sir John? Gone wrong? Young man, I was born right here in London. I've been living here at the Savoy Hotel for 15 years. Now, would you mind telling me since when it has become the custom to get the roller skate up and down the hall at 3 o'clock in the morning? I'm most awfully sorry, Sir John. We don't know what to do with that Gracie Allen. A bit balmy, you know. We've taken away her bicycle. Oh, dear. Uh, are you there? Uh, room clerk speaking. Yes. Who? Miss Gracie Allen. Yes. 
Oh, you're leaving for America this afternoon. Very well. I'll send the boy right up for your luggage. Uh, thank you. Uh, bell boy. Yes, sir. Uh, go up to Miss Allen's room, 320, and get her luggage. She's leaving for America. All room clock. Get one of the other bell boys to go up. Hey. Every time I go up to her room, she gets angry because I won't give her a tip. Oh, go on, boy, and hurry. Oh. She's really leaving for America? Mr. Finale. Yes. That girl with the skates. That, that Gracie Allen, she's leaving for America. Oh, oh, Miss Douglas. Yes? That Bonnie Gracie Allen is leaving for America. Oh, Cynthia, darling. Yes. That crazy Gracie Allen is leaving for America. Oh, I'm awfully oh, glad. No, no. Don't worry, she's just coming out of the nest now. <laughs> Gracie, Gracie, before we left home, I told you you were the silliest girl in America, but I want to apologize. Oh, you don't love us anymore. Hmm. Now that I've traveled all over Europe, I've changed my mind. You're not the silliest girl in America. You are the silliest girl in the whole world. Oh, Daddy, Daddy, I bet you tell that to all the girls. White House, the guards present... and I'll take care of the luggage. Porter! Porter! Yes, sir? Will you get those bags and follow me? Yes, sir. The cab fare will be three and sixpence, please, miss. Uh, here's a 20-pound note. A 20-pound note, miss? Haven't you got any small change? Oh, yeah, here's some small change, too. Oh, thank you, miss. <laughs> thank you. Gracie, Gracie, come on. Oh, wait a minute, George. I just want to take one more look at my native land. Your native land? You were born and raised in America. Oh, yeah, isn't America wonderful? They raised me, and they raised corn, and they raised wheat, and oh, hooray for America. There's something about a soldier. Come There's something on, come about on, follow the porter. Oh. Walk this way, miss. Gracie. Why are you limping? Oh, well, I've got to live. The party said walk this way, and this is the way the party walks. Hippity-hop, hippity-hop. Oh, Mr. George Burns and Gracie Allen. I'm the London Times. I like a statement. Who do you think of the British Empire? Empire? Well, we don't know, mister. We haven't seen any of your baseball games, but Gracie, maybe George... Gracie, Gracie, the man means empire, not umpire. Well, that isn't my fault if he has an impediment in his feet. Oh, you see, Miss Allen, we don't play baseball here in England. Our big game is cricket. Well, I'm certainly glad we didn't go big game hunting. Big game hunting? Well, imagine shooting a little cricket with a great big gun. Listen, the kind of cricket... Yeah, I know, I know. You don't even need a great big gun to shoot a cricket. You just lie in the thicket and you see a cricket and you're a cricket. Goodbye and good luck. Oh, tip tip kitty oh toodle-doo, 23 to do and you said something when you said Dickie. Hey, hey. Gracie, it's a matter of days before you finish up in a nut factory. Oh, well, George, how much are they paying an hour now? 20 cents. Oh. Oh. They're not putting the automobile in the water. Oh, no? They're putting it on the boat. Somebody is taking their automobile to America. Well, that certainly is ridiculous. Ridiculous. Well, yeah, that certainly is ridiculous. Imagine trying to drive an automobile to America. Oh, you wouldn't catch me driving a car across the ocean. Unless I was sure the tires didn't leak. And then well, all right, don't worry about it. If you did drive an automobile across the ocean about every mile, you would probably find a service station. Oh, well, I'm not worried about that. What I'm worried about is there's no hot dog stand. Hot dog stand? Yeah, my dog Herman loves hot dogs. And I love my dog, Herman. And, George, if you love somebody and that somebody loves hot dogs, you'll drive farther for a hot dog than you would for a service station. Or would you? Gracie, your dog, Herman, is not with us. Oh, well, then let's take a boat. Yeah, let's take the boat. Sorry, madam, but you'll have to hurry because this boat goes to America in five minutes. Oh, now that's what I call seeing a big boat like this going to America in five minutes. That's a fact. Come on, come on, Gracie, there's the whistle. <laughs> well, all I can say is it's a pretty terrible whistle. I said it. I didn't say anything. Well, then talk a little louder. I can hardly hear you. Come on, hurry up. Hurry up and run up the gangplank. Oh, oh boy. Well, we finally made it. Gracie, hey. well, look, they're taking in the gangplank. I guess everybody is aboard. Oh, well, then I better tell the captain. Huh? Hey, captain, all aboard! Oh, all quiet. Aboard! 
Oh, Wyatt. Well, Gracie, now we're safe on board. Let me have my money back. What money? What money? I gave you 40 pounds to hold for Oh, yes. Well, I gave the taxi driver 20 pounds. I've got 20 pounds left. 20 pounds? Yeah. Gracie, 20 pounds is $100. You gave the taxi driver $100. Yeah, and some change, too. Change, too. Gracie, while you're at it, why don't you throw the other hundred dollars overboard? Oh, well, George, I think it's a silly thing to do, but it's your money, so here goes. Whee! Somewhere, someplace, there must be someone who could do something for George. Well, George, I think it's a silly thing to do, but it's your money, so here goes. Whee! Well, George, I think it's a silly thing to do, but it's your money, so here goes. Whee! Well, George, I think it's a silly thing to do, but it's your money, so here goes. Whee! Well, George, I think it's a silly thing to do, but it's your money, so here goes. Whee! Well, George, I think it's a silly thing to do, but it's your money, so here goes. Whee! Well, George, I think it's a silly thing to do, but it's your money, so here goes. Whee! Well, George, I think it's a silly thing to do, but it's your money, so here goes. Whee! Well, George, I think it's a silly thing to do, but it's your money, so here goes. Whee! Well, George, I think it's a silly thing to do, but it's your Gracie, isn't this a perfect night to be walking around on deck? Oh, yes, George. A beautiful boat, a full moon, and the stars, and the calm of the ocean. Oh, oh, I could get romantic if I only had somebody to miss. And really, George, there's nobody in the world I'd rather miss than you. Thanks. It's little things like that that make me the happiest boy in the world. Oh, Georgie, will you do me a favor? Mm. As we're walking around the deck, will you take deep breaths for my daddy? Take deep breaths for your daddy? Yes, because the doctor said daddy needs to see air. It'll do him a world of good, but he couldn't afford to take this, this big trip, you know. Well, all right. If you'll just keep quiet, I'll take deep breaths for your daddy. But you'll have to walk slower. You know, daddy can't walk fast. But, Gracie, supposing I get seasick? Well, then you can do that for my brother. It'll do him a I hope so. Good evening. We're both headed for America. See you again next time round the deck. Yeah. <laughs> she's awfully silly. We're both headed for America, and she's walking in one direction, and we're walking in another. <laughs> Gracie, Gracie, I'm still taking deep breaths for your daddy. Oh, thanks, Pop. You're looking better already. Gracie, why don't you walk along the edge of the boat? You might get sleepy and drop off, I hope. Oh, a moonlight night and these compliments. If I didn't know you, I'd think you were a gigolo. Georgie, would you like to kiss my little hand, madame? A little later, yes. Oh, say, mister, mister, stop pushing that little poodle around on a wooden leaf. Gracie, that's a sailor. He's mopping the deck. That's not a poodle. Oh, I mean the poodle of water that he's pushing around. Oh, well. Good evening, sir. Hmm, kind of busy, eh, sailor? Ah, oh, we miss you. I will be working all night tonight. I will probably use up four or five mops. Say, Sailor, I know a mop you won't use up. That's May West mop. May West mop? Yeah, why don't you come up and see me sometime? Come on, come on, Gracie. <laughs> oh, that said he was an old-fashioned sailor. He wore bell bottom pants. Gracie, I do, do me a favor and do very little talking. Here comes the captain of the ship. Oh, where? Oh, do I need me? Oh, I'm dying to meet him. You know, I heard somebody say today the captain was forward. And with a forward captain in a moonlight night, he might kiss my little hand, madame, huh? Yes. Uh, good evening, Mr. Brown. Good evening, Miss Allen. Uh, good evening. Hello, Captain. You've certainly got a lovely boat. Oh, but yes. The Ile de France is a fine boat. Oh, oh look, he's the Ile de France of puppies. Puppies? They're hanging alongside of the rail. And their ears are sticking out. Oh, Gracie, oh. those are not puppies. Those are lifeboats. Oh, Miss Those are not ears. They are oars. There are 24 oars in every boat. Well, that's nothing. There's 24 oars in every day, and I'm not worrying about that either. Yeah, Gracie, <laughs> excepting February, which has 28. <laughs> oh, that was very funny, George. Go ahead, Captain. Now it's your turn to talk. Uh, look, Captain, don't mind her. The moon has been beating down on her head for the last two hours. Oh? Uh, say, Captain, what is that way out there? A sailboat? No, 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 no. That is an iceberg. Hmm, look at how high the thing is rising. Oh, I heard that on the radio, the rise of the iceberg. Hey, Molly, how is Mrs. Blair? Uh, quiet. Come on, Captain. Well, uh, great. Uh, come on, Gracie. You know, Captain, we'll see you later. No, 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 no. If you do not mind, I'd like to walk right along with you. I do not want to miss a word of this. Eight o'clock and all is well. Oh, George, ha, ha. There's big foolish talk. He says the eight o'clock and all is well. <laughs> no. <laughs> Miss Allen, he means all is well on the boat. Oh, Captain, he's wrong. All are well on the boat. All right, Gracie. All are well on the boat. All are not well on the boat. I don't feel so well, and nobody can tell me that fellow who eight o'clock feels good either. And, Captain, you look a kind of sick yourself. Gracie. <laughs> well, after that, I think we all need a little drink. Let us go into the bar. Some of the passengers are having a little entertainment. I will tell you, I have George Burns and Gracie Allen with me. Oh. And, and I saw them a few days ago at the Palladium in London, and if you coax them, 
Maybe they will sing a song. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, say, boy, do you know Yankee Doodle Blues? Yes. Yeah. And, boys, play the middle part loud, because that's where George always goes flat. Say, here's a word I want to say. I'm not as good as talking. <laughs> say, have you ever been away? Yes, and the Rudy Valley. Have you ever missed the hero USA? Where's Roger Rudy Valley? When you get that itching in your shoes. <laughs> you better try a cough drop. Go to any other land you choose. Oh, he's singing Dixie. And see how quick you get the Yankee Doodle Blues. I'm singing, there's no land. As grand as my land. From California to Manhattan Island. North, south, that sunny skyland, oh, I love every night. Oh, playing Yankee Doodle, that melody that keeps ringing in my ears. Yankee Doodle, that's the melody makes you stand right up and cheer. I'm coming, USA. I'll say I love you. Make me lose those Yankee Doodle blues. Say that you're the wonderful with all that ancient junk. Well, it's not as good as Kokomo, and Kokomo is the bunk. I couldn't see or run, and it was covered by a fog. I had to move from Paris, so I couldn't need a fog. From there, I went to Old Cologne and started on the round. But Old Cologne, the smell of sweet and pretty as a sound. A Russian vulture, did he try to get my sound? And then I wore my welcome out for sliding on the house. Hello, Miss Liberty. I'll say your affair. And then the customer officer said to me, Why do you declare I am the Yankee Doodle? That melody keeps on ringing in my ears. Yankee Doodle. That's the melody makes you stand right up and chill homecoming. You were saying night and day. I'll always say, I'll always say, I have a crush. My brother would say, I love you. Make me lose for Yankee Doodle. you want a really fine smoke, try a vintage cigar, a vintage white... See, tell him your name. He looks through your trunk and sees what's in it. Well, my trunk is locked, but if he can look through my trunk and see what's in it, he certainly ought to be able to guess my name. Listen. Oh, that's a good trick, mister. Uh, and if you can do it, then I'll show you the one with two decks of cards. Uh, Gracie, why don't you do a trick where you stick your little blue hat in the neck of a bottle and don't take it off? Oh, well, that's one of my old tricks. Uh, miss, I'd like to see what you brought back from Europe. Well, oh, you don't have to bother. I didn't bring back anything for you. Huh? Can you imagine that, George? I never met that man in my life, and he thinks I brought him back a present from Europe. Gracie, the all government I... only allows you $100. Oh, well, then why doesn't he give it to me and let me go? Uh, look, miss, did you buy any gowns? 
from Paris? Well, of course, several of them. May I see them, please? Oh, I know you'll love just one of them. It's a black lace with a low back, you know, sort of a dance frock. But well, I wouldn't think of letting you see me until I get my hair fixed. Have you got a mirror around? Oh, see, the, the officer isn't interested in seeing how you look in the gowns. All he wants to see is the gowns. Oh, well, it doesn't take all kinds of people to make a world. Can you imagine a big man like that interested in gowns? Miss, did you bring back any perfume? See, what did I tell you, George? He even likes perfume. Well, see, there's a heavy duty on French perfumes, and if you brought any back, you'll have to pay a tax on it. Oh, well, in that case, I didn't bring any. Well, I'm mm. sorry to say, miss, but I smell Christmas night. What did he say, George? He said he smells Christmas night. Well, if I were in his place, I wouldn't brag about it. Gracie, Gracie. Uh-huh. I see you're wearing a mink coat. Miss, where did that mink come from? Where did that mink come from? Where did mink? Where did the plush coat come from? Where are the plushes? Officer, where... we just located Miss Ellen's truck. We found it under the wharf. Uh, under the what? War, war, war. Well, you don't have to bark at me. Just talk. I understand you. Why don't you say something to him, George? Well, you keep quiet. Oh, thanks, my hero. Now, Miss Allen, if you just open your trunk, I'll get you out in no time. Oh, well, George, this fellow's even better than Houdini. You know, Houdini could only get you out of the trunk when you were in it. But this fellow says he'll open my trunk and get me out in no time, and I'm not even in it. Or am I? Gracie, will you shut your mouth and open your trunk? <laughs> All right, now let's see. Where did I put the key? Oh, it isn't in my bag. It isn't in my pocket. Oh, I know where it is. But, George, you'll have to go and get it for oh, me. All right. Are you sure you know where it yeah, is? I know just where I put it. Well, Gracie, where did you leave it? Uh, in the left hand bureau drawer in that hotel in Paris. In Paris? Yeah. Somewhere, someplace, there must be someone who can do something to stop this silly chatter that goes on for <laughs> Wednesday at the same time, the makers of vintage White Owl cigars will bring you another adventure of Gracie with Bobby Dolan and his White Owl Orchestra and George Burns and Gracie Allen. And in the meantime, look for the vintage mark on the box. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. What you're about to see is the world's most revolutionary telephone switching invention. We call it Super Switcher. It has almost no moving parts, yet handles four times more calls than its predecessor. It required an investment of $400 million, but should ultimately save a billion dollars a year. And soon, every major American area will have one. Looks dull, eh? Well, imagine that each of these cars is a long-distance call. This new invention can handle over half a million an hour. That's five days traffic on a busy Los Angeles freeway. Super Switcher. It should go a long distance to prevent traffic jams on your long distance calls. The Bell System. People using technology to help keep down costs and improve service. Keeping your phone system the best in the world. Next. Hunt the biggest of all game with the Green Hornet. The Green Hornet. He hunts the biggest of all game. Public enemies who try to destroy our America. With his faithful valet, Cato, Britt Reed, daring young publisher, matches wits with racketeers and saboteurs, risking his life that criminals and enemy spies will feel the weight of the law by the sting of the Green Hornet. with Britt Reed in a thrilling adventure, official business. The Green Hornet strikes again.
Ed Lowry, reporter for the Daily Sentinel, stuck his head in the doorway of Miss Lenore's Casey's office and said, Have you been looking for me, Casey? Oh, yes. Mr. Reed wants to see you right away. Oh, fine. Maybe he uh, wants to give me a raise, huh? Yeah. Huh, is the word, Lowry. Even if you did deserve a raise, which you don't, you know that salaries are frozen, don't you? Yep. <laughs> Hey, what you got in the bottle, huh? Now, don't be so nosy. Now, put that down and get yourself into Mr. Reed's office. He's waiting for you. Yes, you girls sure go in for wacky colors. If my girl ever wore a color like this on her fingernails, boy, that I'd certainly... That is not nail polish, Snoopy. Huh? Well, then what is it? Oh. Uh, <clears throat> I, uh, beg your pardon, Miss Case. You're positively the snoopiest man I've yep, ever seen. Yep, that's what keeps the paper on top, kid. Well, there's your little bottle, Casey. You can pour yourself a pair while I'm talking to Mr. Reed. <laughs> pour yourself a couple on me. <laughs> you men. girl can't even buy herself a bottle of leg makeup without one of you making a remark about it. Morning, Chief. What's a good word? Oh, come in, Larry. Casey said you wanted to see me. Yes. Have you ever heard of Stan Mercer? Mercer? Mm, let me see. Mercer. Oh, sure, Stan Mercer. Sure, he's a flyer, isn't he? That's right. He's the flyer. One of the best in the business. Well, what about him, Chief? Well, now, there may be a story here, and there may not. It's one of those government things that you'll have to handle with kid gloves. Yes. Yeah. What gives? Stan Mercer just arrived in town from the coast. They brought him here to test a new plane. Yeah? Hey, that sounds good. Eastern Aircraft has just finished a new plane that's supposed to be able to run circles around anything in the air today. Yeah? And Mercer comes all the way from the coast to make the test flight, huh? I've just talked to Colonel Maxson at the airport. We're going to start testing this plane at 11 o'clock. The colonel has agreed to let you on the field, but he said he didn't think they'd be able to give you a story. Oh, why not? I'm not ready to publicize this plane. Yet. But you go on out there and keep your eyes and your ears open. And I want to see whatever you write on that test flight before it's printed. You understand? What do you... Sure, I guess so. Why? Because regardless of what you see or hear out there, we don't want to release any information without the official consent of the Army Air Corps. And I do mean official. Oh, sure. You better get going, Ed. Oh, uh, take a cab. Okay. Is that official, too? That, uh, take a cab business? <laughs> what do you mean? Do we pay for it? Yes. Fine. I'm allergic to taxi cabs when I have to pay for them. <laughs> Of course, you understand, Mr. Lowry, that this test flight is not for publication. However, in case of an accident... Sure, I understand, Colonel. He won't violate any confidences. I can tell you a few things about this ship. Oh, fine. It's generally regarded as a pursuit plane. We think it's the fastest, most maneuverable plane in the air. Oh, I see. Is that it? Over there, warming up? That's it. Do you see a beauty? I don't know much about planes, but she looks like a humdinger to me. We of the general staff think she's a, a humdinger, too. But we'll know more after Mercer puts her through her paces. By the way, I think Captain Mercer's about to go up. You like to meet him? Yeah. Might not get another chance. No, no. Gentlemen, this is Mr. Lowry, a reporter from the Daily Sentinel. Mr. Lowry, General Margrave of the Royal Air Force, Colonel Plunkett, Major Bradford... And Captain Mercer, the man who's going to test the ship. How do you do, Mr. Hardy? How do you, gentlemen? Well, Captain, I think we're ready whenever you are. I'm ready, sir. I know I don't have to tell you, Mercer, but we want you to give this ship a real going over. Leave it to me. She'll get the works, Colonel. Well, good, good luck, luck Captain. Good luck. That good luck, baby sir. is as fast as I think she is, and I won't be gone long. Good luck. Yes, sir. Captain Mercer's really a great flyer for this sort of thing, isn't he? Best in the business, Lowry. Mercer can coax more out of a ship than any man I ever knew. Ooh, he's not wasting any time getting started. Well, it's like, uh, like diving off the 50-foot board line. The longer you look, the farther away it seems to the water. Oh, yeah. The public doesn't realize the truly great work our test pilots do. Every time they go up in a new plane, they're looking for trouble. So that someone else won't find it. 
sure have a tough job, all right. There he goes. Take off. Like he was driving a jeep. From this moment until Stan Mercer sets his plane on the ground again, he'll punish that ship in every way conceivable. Jeepers, look at him. He's really going straight up and no fooling. Watch him now. He's only about 500 feet up. But he'll do his best to stunt that plane all the way up to 10,000. Golly. You see, Lowry, what makes Mercer so valuable as a test pilot is that he's had actual experience in a fighting plane. In Europe and Africa. And he knows the kind of jams a pilot gets into. Hey, he's diving already. Yes. If an enemy plane were on his tail, he'd dive as close to the ground as possible. I say, Colonel, this plane is really the McGrew, isn't it? Looks like it, sir. How about that? She's the McGrew, says the general. <laughs> no, he's not kidding, Lowry. This plane is the fastest thing that ever left the ground. How high is he now, Colonel? How about six? Maybe 7,000 feet. Tell me, uh, if it's all right. What do you try to find out about a ship in these test flights? Certainly. First, we want to know just how much all-around punishment the ship will take, plus her maximum maneuverability and, of course, maximum speed. Oh, another thing. How do you accomplish these records? I mean, uh, how can you tell these things? Well, in the first place, there are the instruments in the plane. Record these things. And, of course, the captain is in constant contact with the ground by radio. Well, say if someone wanted the information on this test flight, couldn't they get it by cutting in on the wavelength of that plane and intercepting the captain's reports? No, he doesn't report any of the instrument reading. The chief purpose of his contact with the ground is to take instructions on testing the ship. Oh. What comes next? Power dive? Yes. Straight down, with a throttle wide open. Mercer will do everything but get out and push. Oh. Well, there he comes. Boy, this is where he really earns his money. Look at that guy. Straight down. How fast do you think? Oh, I didn't mean that, Colonel. I wouldn't even guess at how fast he's going. But I would venture to say that no man has ever gone through space as fast as Stan Mercer's traveling right at this moment. Golly. Isn't he ever going to level off? He's still trying for more speed. Mackerel, I'm scared just watching him. Come on, Mercer. That's enough. Come on, pull her out. Pull her out now. Come on. Oh. Well, Lowry, you've just seen something you can tell your grandchildren about. Yeah, but I hope I don't have to wait until I'm a grandfather before I can tell the people who read the Daily Sentinel. Hello? Boss, I just saw that show, and it's really something terrific. Remember what I said. You can thank the colonel for letting you in and then come on down here and write your story. Yeah, sure. You might not be able to release it for weeks, but I want you to get it on paper while it's still fresh in your mind. Okay. Oh, listen, I'll be in in about a half hour. I'm waiting for Captain Mercer now. Oh, well, don't try to pry any information out of him. Oh, no, no, no. He offered to give me a lift into town. He's uh, changing his clothes now. Okay, Ed. I'll wait for you and we can have lunch together. You can tell me all about it then. Swear. Oh, is uh... Uh, is that official, too? That uh, we'll have lunch together business? <laughs> Tell me, Lowry, uh, were there ever any sculptors in your family? Huh? I don't get it. I was only wondering, Ed. Uh, sometimes you're such an artistic chiseler. Oh, now listen, <laughs> <boy>. <laughs> I 
should go ahead and let that slowpoke buy his own lunch. Well, I can't imagine what's keeping him. Ordinarily, the prospect of a free lunch would bring Lowry down here in jig time. Yeah, well, he's been over an hour now. Publisher's office. This is Inspector Morrow. Is Mr. Reed there? Uh, one moment, please. It's Inspector Morrow. Hello, Inspector. Reed, you'd better come down here right away. One of the patrol cars just picked up your man, Ed Lowry. What? He was riding into town with that test pilot, Captain Mercer. They slugged Lowry and kidnapped Mercer. I'll be down right away, immediately. Britt Reed, arriving at police headquarters, was immediately ushered into Inspector Morrow's office. Oh, hello there, Reed. Hello, Inspector. Where's Lowry? The boys had him upstairs in the first aid room. Was he badly hurt? Oh, just a gash over his temple where there was lugs applied to blackjack. Any idea who's behind this? Hey, well, here he is now. Come in, Lowry. Uh, that's all, McGuire. Thanks for patching him up. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Right. Hey, boy. Looks like I kind of fumbled the ball, huh? Well, it looks more like somebody fumbled you. Yeah, I guess you're right. How do you feel, Ed? Oh. Like the morning after. Well, Lowry, suppose you tell us all you can about this thing and we'll see what can be done. The abduction of that test pilot is obviously the work of someone interested in getting information. Secret information. You're right, Reed. That is pretty obvious. Now, think hard, Lowry. Wasn't there some one little thing about the men that slugged you and kidnapped Mercer that could start us on a lead? I tell you, Inspector, I've tried and tried to think of something. But it happened so fast, well, I was knocked out cold in a herring before I knew what was going on. When I came to, there was a bunch of people standing around, and a, a couple of cops were helping me into a squad car. Uh, this uh, new plane that Mercer was testing this morning, what about it? I can't tell you anything there, Inspector. Except that the Army officers seemed to think it was a super-duper. No fooling. Inspector, I... I don't like to think what those men are going to do to Mercer to get that information. Neither do I, Reed. Lowry, tell us everything you can remember right from the beginning, huh? Well, the boss here sent me out to the airport just to be on hand when Stan Mercer tested this new plane. Oh, I've told the inspector about that, Lowry. You start with Mercer after the flight. Oh, yeah. Well, after the captain brought the plane down... I talked with him for a couple of minutes, and he offered to give me a lift back to town. So, while I was waiting for the guy, I called up the boss, and he said I should come downtown, and we was going to have lunch together. On him. Oh, Lowry, the inspector isn't interested in your mercenary ambition. Yeah? Well, I still ain't had no lunch. Anyway, pretty soon, Captain Mercer came down, and we got into his car. He said he was going right by the Thompson, and I figured that was just fine. So we started out. Well, how'd you like the test flight, Mr. Lowry? I enjoyed it, Captain. How about you? Believe me, brother. That's the greatest little plane in the world. Just as soon as they get that ship into production, Schickel Gruber is going to think he knocked over a swarm of bees. How far is it from the airport into town? About uh, six miles, Captain. Well, traffic's pretty light. You've got to make it in 10 or 15 minutes. Tell me, how does it feel to travel six or 700 miles an hour? Well, you get that terrific sensation of speed. Danger, of course. Mostly you're so busy trying to check the plane that it's all over with before you have a chance to think much about it. Yeah. Of course, the thing that a test pilot really worries about most of the time is blacking out while he's in one of those power dives. Jiminy, you'd never know what happened, would you? Not at that speed. Your chances of coming out of it would be pretty slim. You, uh, you ever black out? Yeah, a couple of times. But I always manage to... The guy must need a lot of room to pass. Well, all right, come on if you're in such a rush. 
expect me to drive off the road so he can go by? Well, there's a fine-looking bunch of guys in that car. Hey, you crazy fools. What are you trying to do? Pull over there, wise guy. Police. That doesn't look like any police car to me. Those guys don't look like cops either. What do you mean, Maury? This looks like some kind of a gag to me, Captain. Those guys Can't aren't... do anything about it now. The horse is right off the road. Listen, if these guys are looking for trouble... All we... right, Mercer. Get out of that car. Come on. What's the idea? What do you think you're pulling off here? Yeah, what business you got stopping this car? You keep your lip button up, fella, if you know what's good for you. Come on. I said get out and be quick about it. Sure. I'll get out, mister. And if it's trouble you're looking for, I'm going to give you're it... You're going to what? Hey, look out, Captain. He's got a gun. You see too much with your eyes, mister. Here. Oh. I said, when I come to, there was the captain's car. The other car was gone, and there was a bunch of people around. The cops helping me into that squad car. Boy, that guy really slapped me with that sap, too. Inspector, uh, how about the possibility of Lowry identifying those men through pictures? No good, Reed. No, no, no. We tried that. We set Lowry in the rogues gallery as soon as he was brought in. No dies. Well, we're certainly starting with a stone wall in front of us. Inspector, there's one possibility. Now let's hear it. Anything is welcome. Providing, of course, that Lowry is willing to uh, gamble his carcass. What are you getting at, boss? How would it be if the Daily Sentinel ran a story on this thing, inferring that Lowry has been able to identify one of the men involved in that kidnapping? And that the police are promising quick action. You mean... He means to offer me up as a burnt offering. That's what he means. Yes, it's risky business for you, I'll admit. But it might bring one of that gang out of hiding. It's a chance worth taking, Larry. Oh, it is, huh? Well, mighty sweet of you gentlemen to sit around and figure how much my hide is worth. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Lowry never gives in easily. It's <laughs> Don't worry, Ed. We won't let you stick your neck out uh, any farther than we have to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like that last part, especially. Well, I got that in tonight's paper, Inspector, and see what happens. Yes, be sure to keep in close touch with me, Reed. But I will. Oh, come on, boss. Since you're going to offer me up as a fatted calf, maybe we better go get that lunch on you. <laughs> Hey, Slugger, close that door. Okay. I want to talk to this guy some more. Hey, you. You going to come across? I wouldn't tell you, Rance. The right time. <coughs> You'll talk, sweetheart, before we get through with you. Get as rough as you want. I can take it. I won't talk, see? No matter what you do with me, I won't talk. Don't count on help, Mercer. There's none coming. Hey, Wait. Brecker. Shut up. Sit. The flash just came on the radio. That Seminole reporter has identified one of the guys that snatched Mercer. The cops have promised an early roundup of the men behind the snatch, and they've called the FBI to help. Yeah? Listen, Brecker, that's us. What do we do? Shut up for a minute. There's something screwy about that. If I'd have known that guy was a reporter, I'd have sure fixed him proper. Couldn't have identified us. We haven't got any police records. Yeah, but just the same. You get this stuff packed. Ron Meyer's coming over tonight. We'll get our dough and turn this guy over to him. He can do what he wants with him. You mean we're going to beat it out of here? Sure, you dope. The police gag may be a phony, but I ain't taking any chances. They give you the hot seat for fooling with an army officer. Yeah, you're right. But what are you going to do? I'm going to take care of that big mouth newspaper guy. <laughs> Later that evening in Britt Reed's apartment. Hello, Mr. Reed's apartment? Just one moment, Mr. Lowry. Oh, it's him, huh? Oh, I wonder. Hello, Ed. Listen, boss, that story uh, got resolved. Well? I just got a call from a guy. 
Said his name was Mr. Davis. Davis, huh? He sure sounded phony to me. What do you want, Larry? Said he had a great story for me, and I should meet him at the cigar store over on 10th and Riverside. Well, that's just a couple of blocks from the paper. Yeah, I know. Well, wish me luck, boss. I'm going. Oh, wait. You called the police about this? Are you kidding? Oh, sure I called the police. You don't think I'm going to try to catch those guys alone, do you? The cops are going to have that cigar store surrounded 40 ways from Sunday. Good. Don't take any chances, Lowry. <laughs> Thanks, boss. If I ain't back in 30 days, give my paycheck to the Greek war relief, will you? So long, Lowry. I'll give Miss Case a memo on that in the morning. Did uh, you say the Greek war relief? Yeah, that's right. I said the Greek... <laughs> hey! Cato, we've got to hurry. We go to where police lay trap for a kidnapper? No, if those men are as smart as I think they are, they'll suspect a trap. I, I don't understand. In other words, I don't think Laurie will ever reach that cigar store. Oh, come on, this is a job for the Black Beauty and the Green Hornet. We're going to tag Laurie from the moment he leaves the Daily Sentinel. Hurry. Seconds later, stepping through a secret panel in the rear of a closet in his bedroom, Britt Reed and Cato went along a narrow passage built within the wall of the apartment house itself. This passage led to an adjoining building which fronted on a dark side street. Though supposedly abandoned, this building served as the hiding place for the sleek, super-powered Black Beauty, a streamlined car of the Green Hornet. Britt Reed pressed a button. The great car roared into life. A section of the wall in front raised automatically, then closed as the gleaming black beauty sped into the darkness. now, Cato. Oh, look, Mr. Lowry coming out of the building. Cato, car. Lowry starting across the street. Yes. Roadster pulling out. That dirty rat's going to run Lowry down right in the middle of the street. Hang on. Hold oh, tight. We're going to crash it. Any big Hurry. I want the man driving that car. <laughs> Cato, help. Uh, get him out of here. Maybe dead, Mr. Brown. I hope not. Hope he lives to die illegally. All right. Now hurry, let's get him to the Black Beauty. Hey, what happened? Hurry, Cato. Let's get out of here before Lowry arrives. Oh, sit, Mr. Brown. Good. Hold your hat, Cato. Mr. Braunmeier, Brecker will be here in a minute. He had to go get that guy, Lowry. I'm not interested in the man, Lowry. I'm interested only in what information this Yankee pick has given you. I can answer that, you filthy Nazi. The answer is none. Oh. So, you are one of the braver type of Americans. You won't talk, eh? Ah, why don't you go shoot yourself? Hey, Capitan Mercer, you have certain information about a new plane, which I mean to obtain. It will not be pleasant for you if you choose to remain silent. If I may coin a phrase, sauerkraut. Yes? Nuts. Swine. You will talk. That's right. Talk about... Captain Wilcox, buddy. On the witness stand. <laughs> Don't move, you yellow rat. Hey, that's the Green Hornet. Green oh, Hornet. Hornet. All right, get busy there, cauliflower. Take those ropes off the captain. Come on, move. Yeah, sure, sure. All right, Mercy. Sure. I'm all right now. Looks like they gave you quite a going over. That's all the good it did him. Skunks. Good for you, Captain. There. There you are, Captain. You can't escape from here, Hornet. You've got that a little twisted, my friend. 
Five minutes or less, there'll be so many FBI men in here, you'll think you're at the movie. FBI? How did you find this place? Your stooge Brecker evidently didn't have as much fortitude as the captain here. He talked plenty. Hey, that's the cop. I'm getting out of here. Right. But you won't know it when you leave. Take it, you traitor. Oh, don't you? Yes. Same for you, Fritzy. No, no, don't. Yellow rat. He did worse than that to me. Yes? Show me what you mean, Captain. With no. pleasure. See? No, no. no. This. No. Very pretty, Captain Mercer. A nice illustration of a Nazi doing a power dive. Give the police my compliments, will you? I'll be landing, Skipper. Thanks, Green Hornet. Wait a minute, police. I'll let you in. Where's Are you all right? Sure, Inspector. Who are they? The Green Hornet took care of them. What? That crook? Yes, Inspector. And he asked me to give you his best regards. young captain, the test pilot, certainly is handsome, isn't he? Oh, uh, yes. I'm uh, looking forward to meeting him. Oh, I'll introduce you, boss. Him and me's just like that. Oh, that's fine, Laurie. Hey, Chief, I was just wondering, uh, the Dodgers are playing this afternoon, <laughs> and, uh... Take the day off, Ed. In fact, I have two tickets. You can cover the highlights of the game for the paper while you're there. Swell. That, uh, that makes it official, huh, boss? <laughs> That makes it official, Lowry. just heard the adventure, Official Business. These exciting dramas are sent to you each week at this same time. They are copyrighted features of the Green Hornet Incorporated. All characters, names, places, and incidents used in this drama are purely fictitious. Bob Height speaking. This program has come to you from WXYZ in Detroit. This is the Blue Network. Tuesday, a lucky shot makes Richie an instant hero. Want to go up to Inspiration Point with me? I'll show you my fake. <laughs> oh, Richie, you're such a jock. Then... Buns. Hiya, Pinky. Are you? It's the love story that shook the world. I love what? This drama. <laughs> Action and romance. Fonzie loves Pinky right after Happy Days. Hi-ho, Silver! Away to those thrilling days of yesteryear with the Lone Ranger. A fiery horse with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty high old silver, the Lone Ranger. Thank you. 
When the western United States was first opened to settlers, many criminals traveled to the new territory in the hope of finding easy wealth. They soon realized, however, that wealth could only be purchased by hard work, so they turned to robbery and cattle rustling. It was these men that the masked rider of the plains fought so tirelessly. It was only through his efforts that law and order was finally established on the frontier. And now return with us to those thrilling days when the West was young. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse, Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, Silver. We're heading for Prairie Grove. Tell us waiting on the trail ahead. Hello, Silver. Hello. Our story opens in the town of Prairie Grove a typical frontier settlement in southwestern Texas. It is late afternoon, and Clem Barton, a rancher, hurriedly enters the small post office on the main street. Fred. Hey, Fred. I'm in a doggone big hurry. You got any mail for me? Hmm, might have. Well, then give it to me quick. I'm looking for something special. Now, just hold your horses. I'll have a look. Offhand, can't exactly recollect whether there was something for you or not. Don't be so fired slow about it. Just a second, just a second. Yep, yeah, here's something. This is yours, I reckon. What are you being so blame hasty about? I got to meet Banker Shaw at 5 o'clock, that's why, and it's just about 5 now. Oh, here, give me that. You're meeting Banker Shaw? I am, but this is what I'm looking for. Yippee, this is it, all right. If you're planning to see the bank here, you better get a hustle on. He's getting ready to take that stage. What's that? Look for yourself, you don't believe me. There's a stage just across the street. Well, of all the... <laughs> Looks to me like he kind of forgot about you. Well, I'll catch him. Hi there, Banker Shaw. Hey. You calling me, Clem? Gosh, Mr. Shaw, what are you doing with your bag all packed and everything? You ain't forgot our business, have you? Eh, business? What business? You know, the ranch, the mortgage. Mortgage? I thunder claim it clean slipped my mind. Gosh, I was hoping we'd get things cleared up today. Look, Mr. Shaw, step back away so those folks won't hear us, won't you? The stage won't be leaving for a couple minutes yet. Well, come along. Now, what is it that's a doggone secret? Well, it's like this, Mr. Shaw. I just now got the cash I sent for to pay off the mortgage. And I'd sure hate like blazes to take the risk of keeping it on me. Well, that's a shame, Clem. I'm sure sorry I forgot about our appointment. If I wasn't going to Gold City, you could give me the cash now, and then you wouldn't have to worry about it. But, uh, but can't you put off your trip till tomorrow, Mr. Shaw? Sorry, Clem. My business there is a sight too important for that. Well, then how about leaving the cash in your bank for the night? Now, Clem, you know better than that. The bank's closed up tight this late in the day. Of course, you could have them take care of it over to the cafe. After all, the holdups has been not by a blame sight. Then I reckon you'll just have to take it home with you again. But uh, when are you coming back? When? Oh, I'll be back tomorrow evening. I'm just staying overnight. Could I see you tomorrow night, then? Mm, yes, I suppose you could. Of course, the mortgage ain't due for another week yet. But I won't feel real easy keeping $5,000 out to the ranch. And I don't blame you, Clem. Well, let's say you meet me tomorrow night at 10 o'clock, then. That good enough? Oh, that'd do just fine. Get aboard, folks. We're set to travel. Well, the stage is ready to leave, Clem. Sorry I couldn't do no better for you. Oh, we'll make out, I reckon. So long, Mr. Shaw. Tomorrow at 10, then. Good day to you. I'm right in, Mr. Shaw. We're near to five minutes late getting started already. I'm ready, driver. Get up there. Get along with you. Get along with you. forgot the time, have you, Clem? Huh, Sophie? Well, what time is it? Most nine o'clock. You said you had to be to meet Mr. Shaw in town at ten. Oh, gosh, I was near forgetting. Get the cash out of the cupboard for me, won't you, Sophie? 
I'll have to make tracks. Uh -huh, I'll get it. Uh, my hat. Uh, where in blazes is my hat? Your hat's on the chair where you put it. I declare when you get fussed, you never know what you're doing. <laughs> well, I reckon I'm just feeling good knowing the mortgage is going to be paid up, honey. Well, it was mighty nice of your brother Ned to give us a lend of it. Well, you'd better be careful with it. From what he says, things being the way they are back east, he won't be able to send you no more. Uh, you bet I'll be careful. Here it is, Clem. Now, you put it in a good, safe place. Yeah. There. It won't fall out of that inside pocket, I reckon. Now, where'd you say my hat was? Oh, oh, here it is. Oh, you hurry to town. The horse is all saddled outside. Nice moonlit night to ride. Well, you take care of yourself. Uh, who in the blazes is that? Whoever it is, don't you stop to talk to him. You just keep going. An engine. Oh. What you want, Redskin? Don't stand there, Clem. I'll deal with the engine. I'm a-going, honey. All right, engine. Uh, what you say you want it? Me want food. Yeah. Me pay you. Food? <laughs> Well, land's sake, we ain't got a whole lot on hand, but you're welcome to share. It's just for yourself? No, me got friend. Oh, there's two of you. Another redskin, huh? Uh, him white friend. White friend? Then why don't he come up and ask for the grub instead of sending an engine after it? I is that him standing below in the shadows? Uh. Oh, well, I reckon it don't matter, though. You just wait till I have a look in the kitchen, and I'll see you. There, sharp. Oh, oh, that's the way Clem rode. Hello, oh, free your horse. Something's happened. Me come. Stranger, don't let nothing happen to Clem. Help him. Hurry, fellow. Uh -huh. Hit me ready. Come on, Get him on, scout. Come on, silver boy. Can't sit, fellow. Shout, keep him the trail, fellow. Not right. Sounded like a rifle. Uh -huh. Hurry, silver old fellow. Come on, there, silver boy. Can't sit, old fellow. You, look. There's a horse. There's a man lying on the trail. Uh, oh, Silver. Oh, 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 oh. What's the matter left the ranch house when you knocked on the door? Uh, him. Him, same fellow. He's not dead. Bullet cut cross head. Yes. Didn't wound him seriously, but it was enough to knock him out. Oh, no. Him come too. He'll be conscious oh. in a moment. Look, Tanto. The shot must have come from behind that cut bank. It's a perfect spot to hide if you wanted to drag out some man on this trail. Uh, uh. The man who fired the shot could follow down the gulch and make his escape unseen. Oh, the, the cash. He'll be all right, friend. The bullet only scraped your scalp. Uh, wait, I, I gotta look. The cash. You were carrying money? It, it's gone. It was stolen? How much did you have? Five thousand dollars in folded money. Five thousand dollars and all of it borrowed. What? You're masked. You're the fellow that shot me. Were you... Easy, Clem. Your wife can prove we were at the ranch house when the shot was fired. But, and but we I... didn't know you were carrying money on you. Here. Feel well enough to ride back to the house? Just just let me rest a minute, stranger. Can you answer some questions? Huh? What questions? How many people knew you had that money? Nobody. That cash come from the east, and I never told nobody about getting it. No one at all? Well, I did tell Banker Shaw, but he don't count. What I mean is, it was him I was taking the cash to. So he'd have just as much reason as me for keeping it secret. I see. Oh, oh doggone this head. You see... Banker Shaw holds a mortgage on my place, and I was going to pay it off tonight. A mortgage for $5,000? Uh-huh. But from what I've seen of your place, it isn't worth that much. Well, as a matter of fact, stranger, it ain't. But when I asked for that 5000 I needed it bad. And if the banker was willing to lend it, I wasn't going to put up no objections. Then Shaw would be more anxious to have you pay the mortgage than to take over your ranch. Shucks, I ain't suspecting him, stranger. You just asked me who knew about the cash, and I told you. Of course, he might have been careless and said something that was overheard. Banker Shaw don't ever say anything careless-like. And besides, he couldn't have told nobody. We fixed up our meeting tonight just when he got on the stage yesterday. He's been out of town ever since. The stage is only due in now. We're going to try and get your money back for you, Clem. Say, do you mean that? We do. Gosh, you're sure a strange sort of fellow to be wearing a mask and riding with a redskin. We're not crooks, Clem. Do you think you can make it back to the house now? Your wife will be worried. I don't reckon I can. Give me your hand, will you? Here. Oh, my head's like to split. Here. Oh, oh thanks, engine. I'll help you, Clem. Yep. Uh, golly, I sure don't know what I'm going to say to Sophie when I get home. I'll sure get a tongue lashing with the cash gone and no way to borrow more. Steady, Silver. How soon does the mortgage have to be paid, Clem? Well, there's just six days left. A lot can happen in six days. You ready, Tonto? Uh huh? Me, me ready. Say, which way are you heading? Ain't you going back to the house with me? Not now, Clem, but we'll see you later. I'll see you later. Well, if they ain't the blamedest fellas I ever seen.
That night, the Lone Ranger and his faithful Indian companion, Tonto, made camp. But the next morning, they returned to the dry gulch to search for some trace of the man who had robbed Clem Barton. Oh, oh, that's over. Oh, oh, that's over. Oh, 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 it's too dark to follow the trail last night, Kimosabe. The moonlight didn't help any in this gully, but we may find something today. Oh, there, empty shell. Yes. Look, here's where the man kneeled to shoot. You can see the mark of his knee in the soft earth. Oh, that, that right. And there are hoof prints. Horse got broken shoe. A broken shoe on the left forefoot. There was a small horse. You can see how light the prints are. Isn't that right. Here's where he left the gulch. I'm afraid we can't trail him, Tonto. No. Him ride on hard ground. Him not leave trail. He evidently knew what he was about. Now what we do? There's some things I don't understand, Tonto. The outlaw must have known Clem had that money. That's right. But Clem says the banker was the only one to know. If he'd loaned more than the ranch was worth, he stood to lose if the money wasn't delivered. Uh, here, Silver. Here, Scout. We're going to town, Kimosabe. You, you, you've got plans? Not yet. But the things I want to find out. Come on, Silver. Come up, Scout. Two hours later, the Lone Ranger, disguised but without his mask, sat at a table in the cafe with Tonto. They watched a hard-faced man called Pete as he talked with the banker. Hello, the hoof prints left by Pete's horse are exactly the same as those we saw in the ghost. Uh, I wonder what business he could have with the banker. It looked plenty strange. Too bad we can't hear them. At least we can stay and see what happens. <laughs> Well, Mr. Shaw, I better be on my way. Even already? Yeah, I gotta. But I'll be seeing you again. Uh-huh. Maybe there'll be some more business we can do together. I sure hope so. Hey, Clem. What happened to your head, Clem? Did you get in the shooting screen? Hey, hold on and tell us about it. Not now, boys. I gotta talk to Mr. Shaw. Howdy, Mr. Shaw. Can I sit down? Go right ahead. Thank you. Now, maybe you'll let me know what you gotta say for yourself. You kept me waiting last night till after midnight. Mr. Shaw, I was shot at. That's how I come to be wearing this bandage. Shot at? And the cash stole from me. Well, uh, who done it? Well, that's something I don't know. The only fellas I seen was a masked man and an engine that rode up when they heard the shot. The bullet knocked me out cold. A masked man and a redskin? Why, there, the crooks have stole your cash. You're mistaken, Mr. Shaw. Sophie says they was at the house when the shot was fired. Then they had a partner with them. Don't you see it? Their partner could have shot you, then rode off. Them other fellas talked to Sophie so they'd have an alibi. Then they rode up and stole the cash off you while you were still out. And it worked because you was injured enough to think the same fellow that shot you must have got the cash. Say, do you really think that? I'll bet every penny in my bank it's so. Mr. Shaw, it wouldn't surprise me none if you was right. Huh? Hey, look over there. That's the same engine. And that fellow with him. He's about the same bill. We'll I'll find that... out about this. Man, grab that redskin and his friend. Get a hold of them. There they go. Out of their way. After them! And through the door! They're heading for their horses! Grab your gun! Make them stop! There they are! Drill them! Oh, they're moving too fast! Then, this is the job for the sheriff! Tell them Clem just had $5,000 stolen! And those are the fellas that stole it! The curtain falls on the first act of our thrilling Lone Ranger drama. Before the next exciting scenes, Please permit us to pause for just a few moments. Now to continue the story. The Lone Ranger and Tonto, suspected of the theft of Clem's money, made their escape from town. Their great horses carried them safely beyond pursuit, but that night, they returned under cover of darkness. That's Pete's place up ahead, isn't it, Tonto? Uh-huh. And there, like in cabin. That means he's still at home. Tonto, we've got to make him talk. Mm, not right. The man who would fire from cover must be a coward. I think we can persuade him to confess whether he planned that robbery alone or whether someone else gave him his instructions. Uh, someone must have told Pete about the money. Maybe banker tell him. Shaw loaned more money than the ranch was worth. 
Clem forgot that the banker could have hired someone to steal the money. And that way, get the ranch, too. That's right. Hello. Yes, so Pete through the window. Oh, oh, Silver. Oh, come on. You may not be alone. We'll have to take a chance. Oh, that's right. Come. What the? We're going to have a talk, Pete. A mask, man. You... Don't slap, Mother. Get out of here. Alone, huh? Take his gun, Tonto. Honey, go. Leave my suit line alone. What's the idea? He's got guns. Good. Throw it aside. Get the hold up. No, Pete. But you're going to tell us about your holdup. Huh? You shot Clem. You stole the cash he was bringing to town. You're loco. You can't lie out of it, Pete. You shot him from the dry gulch next to the trail. We found the prints of your horse. My horse? We didn't know it was yours until we saw you ride up at the cafe today. But when you did, it gave your game away. That ain't so. Who was your partner, Pete? Partner? Someone told you Clem had that money. I have a good idea who that person was. But I want the information from you. Now, look here. Are you going to talk? <laughs> talk, I said. Talk or take the beating of your life. Quit shaking me. I've got no mercy for a crook like you. Talk. Ow! That's only a start. Get up. Wait, I... Stand by the door, Tonto. If it makes a break for it, stop him. Him not get away. Don't hit me. You're bringing this on yourself, Pete. You can save yourself by telling me what I want to know. I don't know nothing. Very well. Stand back. You ask for it. Don't, don't. I'll talk. Let me loose. I'll talk. Honest, I will. Just don't beat me up. Quick. It, it was this way. I... I was down by the cafe the other day. And then this fellow... I found out the name of the man who gave Pete his information, Tonto. But there's still more to do. Steady, Silver. What? What's that? We've got to trick him into returning the money. It won't help Clem to get the guilty man if the money isn't found. You got plans? I have. We're going to call on the banker. Hi, Silver! Get him up there! Oh! Open this door. Mr. Flagon. Come on, Tonto. Inside. And close the door, Shaw. The, the masked man Clem told me about. Right. At the same engine. You didn't think we'd be back in town, did you? The sheriff's looking for you fellas. I'll tell you. You're not leaving the house. And if you try to reach that rifle hanging above the fireplace, you'll never make it. I can draw before you've taken another step. You can't get away with it. We'll this. see about that. So I know who's responsible for the theft of Clem's money. You ought to know. You took it. That accusation won't stand, Shaw. Tonto and I can prove we're innocent. You can't. What's more, you're going to help us prove it. What's that? I meant exactly what I said. Are you a friend of Clem's? I am. And you want his money returned to him? Of course I do. Then listen to me and stop looking toward your gun. You'll listen whether you like it or not. The following day, Shaw, the banker, entered the cafe, looked around a moment, then made his way toward a man standing at the end of the bar. Hello, Mr. Shaw. Howdy, fellas. Hello there, Jake. Good afternoon, Fred. Howdy, Mr. Shaw. Looking for something to settle the dust in your throat? <laughs> Don't mind if I do. Have one with me, Fred? Glad to. Say, what are you so pleased about? Ain't seen you with such a grin in your face since you shot the fellas that try to hold up your bank. <laughs> Just had a stroke of luck, that's all. Yeah? Come on. Let's sit over that table here and I'll tell you about it. Hey, barkeep. Two of the usual. Bring them to our table. Sure thing, Mr. Shaw. Sit down, Fred. There. Now, what in blazes is it all about? <laughs> I suppose you know I'm holding the mortgage on Clem's ranch. <laughs> that ain't nothing for you to be grinning about. No. Give him 5000 for that mortgage, didn't you? Yep. When he got the cash together to pay you off, it was stole from him, wasn't it? It sure was. And he can't get another 5000 to pay you with, can he? Nope. And if you can find anything in that to make you happy, I admire to know what it is. If it was me, I wouldn't give half the size of that mortgage for Clem's place. If you can grin about losing more than $2,000, you must be off your head. You're just postmaster, Fred. Nobody'd expect you to understand these things. <laughs> and you mean to sit there and as much as say you want Clem's place? I ain't said it yet. But that's the fact. It beats me. Here comes the barkeep. <laughs> I reckon you're needing a drink worse than I am. Just set him down, barkeep. This will pay for him. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Shaw. There you are. You can keep the change. You want anything more, just holler. Look here. 
I've been thinking over what you just said. Yeah? And I've got a notion why you want Clem's ranch. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm betting I ain't. There's something on that ranch makes it valuable. Now, what would that be? I don't know, but whatever it is, you know about it. Hmm. Maybe it's gold, maybe it's oil, but that don't matter. There's something on or in that ranch worth a heap of cash, something that's got nothing to do with the cattle. Because there ain't a cattleman alive would pay you $5,000 for that measly dried-up range. Now, come on, tell me what it is. It's been nice talking to you, Fred. Wait, you haven't even tasted your drink. Change my mind, I don't want it. Good day to you, Fred. I savvy why you're leaving. <laughs> I came too blame close to the truth, didn't I? Now it's you that's off your head. See you later. Uh, now I wonder. By heaven, so does thunder, that's it. I'm going to find out. Hey, Fred, what's say with you? Huh? <laughs> you look as though something bit you. Something did, just about. Yeah? You saw me talking to Banker Shaw just now, didn't you? Of course I did. Didn't I bring you your drinks? Barkeep, there's something blame funny going on. Huh? You know what Banker Shaw told me? He wants to foreclose on Clem. He was laughing about it. No. I'm telling you the truth. But but he, he'd be losing money. Barkeep, I'm just wondering if he would. Huh? Don't you tell nobody I said it. But he's got a reason for foreclosing. And just between you and me, Barkeep, maybe that same reason would make him keep Clem from paying off. Mind you, I ain't saying it so. But it seems to me it's a mighty strange thing. Mighty strange. Bankers aim to make himself rich with clam drying. What's that? There's oil or gold on it. Oh, right. oh, you fat soul. Just what's the banker up to? Yeah, no, I think we'll find out. It was Banker Shaw had Clem robbed. He aims to get his ring. <laughs> He must have been done the banker done it. Why else did he want to foreclose? Oh. No, we, we ought to set the sheriff on him. Sure. Banker done it, sure as shoot. He can't get away with a thing like that. Hanging's too good for a polecat like this. Yes, it is. Shaw, oh, you're in a heap of trouble. Yeah? Ain't you been uptown? Nope, not since the last to talk to you. But everybody's talking about your full clothes, not Lem. They're saying that if you're so blame anxious to get his ranch, maybe you took steps to see that he didn't pay you. Nonsense. Yeah? If you think I'm lying, you just go over to the cafe again and see what happens. Yeah. You mean they really think it was me, Rob Clem? They don't think nothing else. But they know better, Ned. I'm no crook. Why, I wouldn't take a penny I didn't come by honest. You needn't tell me that, I believe you. But it ain't all the folks in town knows you as well as I do. There, there isn't going to be trouble, is there? Look here, Shaw. You and me have known each other since we was young uns. Sure we have. And we've been good friends all that time, too, haven't we? I reckon so. Well, then, you can believe what I'm saying. I've seen some mighty mean crowds. I can recollect the time the folks in town raided the jail and hung that crook who shot the other sheriff in the back. Well, I... Just you wait till I'm through talking. What I'm getting at is this. In all the time I've lived in this here town, I ain't never seen a crowd that meant business any more than the one that's gathering uptown tonight. So, they're fixing to hang you. Hang me? They put two and two together and decided you're guilty. They haven't any evidence. That's just why they're going to hang you themselves instead of waiting for the law to do it. They can't do that. They saw sure blazes are fixing to do just that. And you got just one chance to save your skin. I, I got a chance, you see? I got it all figured out. The only way you can keep from being hung is to show them you don't want Clem's ranch. What's that? That's this way, Shaw. If you'd said from the first you didn't want the ranch, then they'd never got the notion you was responsible for the holdup. Ain't that so? I, I guess so. Now, if you do something to prove you're willing to give it up, maybe the crowd will change his mind about your being guilty. But, but what can I do? I said we've always been friends, didn't I? I heard you. Well, I'm willing to buy that mortgage from you. Then I'll go uptown and tell the folks you sold it. After that, they'll have to figure you wasn't to blame. I'll take my chances, Fred, before I'll lose my $5,000. You won't be losing it. You mean you'll pay me that much for the mortgage? I will. But just because we're friends. There you are. 5000 even. Now make over the papers in a hurry so I can get back and head off the mob. That won't be necessary, Fred. For what? Where'd you fellas come from? We were hiding behind this other door. 
And just waiting for you to show us whether you had that cash on you or not. But, Sheriff, The I Sheriff can... has already told the town people who was responsible for the holdup, Fred. The banker won't be bothered. Look here, what in blaze is this all about? Sam, can... bring him in. Here's the other scum. Well, you needn't shove me. He tried to escape last night, and we forced the truth from him. But Tano and I brought him back. Uh-huh. Then the masked color brought him around to my office and made him tell me who his partner was. You ain't gonna believe anything he says, are you? <laughs> Fred, even without Pete testifying again, you, that 5000 you just put on my desk would almost prove it. Where could you have saved $5,000 on the salary of a postmaster? It's a mistake. You're framing it's me. It's no I... mistake. But we nearly made one because Clem thought only the banker knew about his receiving the money. Clem forgot that he opened the envelope which contained it in front of you in your post office. <laughs> but the masked fella found out the truth all right. And it was a masked man's scheme to make you think there was gold or oil on the ranch, Fred. So you'd hand over the cash you stole. If I get my hands on him, I'll... You pick ain't, him. Fred. You're going to jail. And, Clem, we might just as well take care of that mortgage right now. The mask fella cleared up the first robbery, but there's no sense in taking chances on another. The story you have just heard is a copyrighted feature of the Lone Ranger Incorporated. When I was a kid, the closest you could get me to a fish was the aquarium. Now, thanks to McDonald's, I'm the expert. You see, most fish is not government inspected, but all McDonald's fish is U.S. government inspected grade A. And it's all prime white filet. No fish cakes, not ground up, not mixed with other fish. It's a filet of fish. The best-selling fish sandwich in America. Tell them your nickname, Henry. They call me Jaws. Quality you can taste. Groucho Marx meets some of the most interesting people you could ever hope to hear on radio in You Bet Your Life, coming up next. Ask the Groucho. Yes, friends, it's a Groucho summertime. By popular demand from your letters, rating histories, and the acclaim of critics, the DeSoto Plymouth Dealers bring you selected shows from You Bet Your Life, the comedy quiz series produced and transcribed from Hollywood. Groucho Marx is on vacation, friends, and will return in the fall. Until then, it's fun and laughs each week this summer as we proudly present some of the best of Groucho's past shows. And here he is... The one, the only... Groucho! That's me, Groucho Marx.
Well, here I am again with $1,000 for one of our couples. Now, Mr. Fenneman, who's first to try for the $1,000? Well, just before we went on the air, our studio audience selected a student nurse, Gwen Lonsom, and a college gymnast, Aura Herabedian. Folks, come in here and meet Groucho Marx. Well, welcome, welcome, kids, to your bet your life. Say the secret word and divide $100. It's a common word, something you always have with you. Gwen uh, Lonsom, huh? Is that right? Lamason. Oh, well, you won't be Lamason very often. <laughs> and uh, you're a student, nice? That's right. A very pretty one, huh? Thank you. Where are you from, New Bedford? <laughs> no, I'm from Minnesota, born in Rochester, but I lived all over the state. Oh. <laughs> you must have been fairly active, then. <laughs> and uh, Ara Harabedian? You just made that up, didn't you? <laughs> I've carried it with me now for a few years. You're a college gymnast? Yes. Uh, where are you from? The University of Southern California. Oh. How old are you, a Herobedian? Uh, I'm 23. Are you very Herobedian in school? <laughs> You're 23? Yes. And uh, you, uh, Gwen? I'm 20. 20, huh? What a lovely age. Uh. <laughs> I, I, are you married? No. How about, have you been uh, trapped... Uh, no, I'm single. Single. Neither one married, huh? Well, the program isn't over yet, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what, what we can do here. You, you're a gymnast? Yes. Do you think you could fall for uh, Gwen here? That would be easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't fall too hard. She'll put you in splints. <laughs> of course, you're a gymnast. You'll probably marry a dumbbell. Huh? <laughs> That's known as the easy joke department. <laughs> Are you a registered nurse, Gwen? No, I'm still a student. I see. Well, I'd say you, you've registered with uh, Arrow over here. <laughs> Do you nurse anybody besides students, Gwen? We, we nurse anyone. You don't care whether they're sick or not, huh? <laughs> we, you nurse them anyway? We prefer that they're sick. <laughs> That's nice. She goes around hoping people are sick, huh? <laughs> You must have Frankenstein blood on you, uh, <laughs> or Charles Adams. Just what is a student nurse? Well, it's someone who's studying to become a graduate registered nurse. Mm -hmm. well, where are you doing this? Well, I'm studying at the Bishop Johnson's College of Nursing at the Hospital of the Good Samaritan. Oh. You have to say that whole thing every time anybody <laughs> asks? Can't you just say you're studying Bishop Johnson and let it go with that? <laughs> what are your school's requirements? Could I become a student nurse? Well, first you have to be between the ages of 18 and 35. <laughs> well, I can pass that, and I will without another word. <laughs> well, what are the various ways to crack your skull in a gym? Uh, do you fly around on a trapeze? Well, we have the uh, horizontal bar, parallel bars, side horse, long horse. I've heard about bars like that. You go in parallel and you come out horizontal. <laughs> have the three side horses and one long horse. Huh? <laughs> Would you mind describing one of these gym cracks? Uh, well, let's uh, take the long horse. It's a uh, piece of apparatus that stands about uh, four feet high and it's about five and a half feet long. So when you run the length of the gym and uh, hit a takeoff board and uh, vault over the horse, either uh, hitting the near end or the far end of the horse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That, that's all you do in school, is uh, <laughs> just trying to hit the far end of a horse? <laughs> well, I suppose that's cheaper than betting on him. <clears throat> well, you're a charming couple, and I expect you to get married as soon as you leave here. <laughs> That'll be two dollars, please. <laughs> now, let's see how well you work together as a team. In just one minute, you're going to play your bet your life for a chance at the thousand-dollar question. But first, here's something of importance. Imagine being able to turn the steering wheel of your car with one finger, even when your car is at an absolute standstill. You can with famous DeSoto Full Power Steering. Why not try it? Go to your DeSoto Plymouth dealer and take the five mile trial. Take the five mile trial. Drive five miles behind the wheel of a new DeSoto Fire Dome 8 or a DeSoto Power Master 6 and discover the amazing ease and convenience of DeSoto full power steering. Going around sharp curves and over bumpy roads, you'll have firmer control than you've ever known before. 
DeSoto Full Power Steering makes driving safer and easier and far less tiring. In traffic conditions or when you're parking, you'll marvel at the effortless ease of turning the wheel. It's as easy as dialing a phone. You see, DeSoto Full Power Steering works for you not some of the time, but all of the time. Tomorrow, visit your DeSoto Plymouth dealers and ask to take the five-mile trial in either the mighty DeSoto Fire Dome 8 with the new 160-horsepower Fire Dome V8 engine or the handsome DeSoto Powermaster 6. And remember, all dealers who sell DeSoto also sell Plymouth, the low-priced car most like high-priced cars. All right, now let's see if you'll get a chance at the $1,000. Uh, Mr. Fenneman. Yes, sir. Would you mind explaining the rules to these kids? All right. Uh, you bet as much of your $20 as you want on each of four questions. And the couple that earns the most money gets a chance at the $1,000 DeSoto Plymouth question at the end of the show. Here we go. Let's see how high I can build you $20. You selected popular singers, past and present. Here's your first question. How much will you bet? Fifteen. 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 What was the name of the vagabond lover of the 20s who sang her songs through a megaphone? Uh, Rudy, uh, I mean, uh... Uh, Talk it over now. One answer. Rudy Valley. No. Rudy Valley is right. <laughs> well, you're on your way. You have $35. Now, remember, you're going for $1,000 tonight. How much of the 35 are you going to risk? 30. 30. 30. What is the name of the versatile vocalist on the Jack Benny show? Dennis Day. Dennis Day, Dennis Day is right. <laughs> You're really climbing now. You have sixty-five dollars. Sixty-five. How much is a sixty-five? You're going to bet on your third question. Sixty. Sixty dollars. What is the name of Tommy Dorsey's former vocalist who swept the nation's Bobby Soxes off their feet? Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra. <laughs> now you've climbed up to one hundred and twenty-five dollars. And how much of this hundred and twenty-five you're going to risk? Shoot the works. <laughs> okay. The works. 125. After trying for years, one song, That's My Desire, made an overnight sensation of this singer. What's his name? Frankie, Frankie Lane. Lane. Frankie Lane is right. <laughs> and you wind up with a grand total of $250. Thanks and good luck from the DeSoto Plymouth dealers. Groucho, we invited some private detectives to the program tonight. Oh, a private detective is a lighthearted loon if you listen to popular rumor. No, you wouldn't understand that. <laughs> <laughs> These detectives. To, <laughs> I'd like to introduce the next couple. Really, I would. Maybe they know each other. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, studio audience selected one of those that we invited, and his name is Mr. Alan Rice. His partner is a spinster, Miss Etta Rue, and here they are. Folks, come in here and meet Groucho Marx. Welcome, welcome, kids, to the DeSoto Plymouth dealers. Right up there, Adam. Say the, say, the, say the secret word and you'll divide $100. It's a common word, something you always have with you. Now, let's see. Uh, a spinster and a private eye, huh? Well, this ought to be interesting. If he can't find her a man, nobody can. <laughs> Where are you from, Etta? Minneapolis, Minnesota. Oh. <laughs> How do you feel about St. Paul? Oh, well, uh, St. Paul's all right, too. <laughs> a, a hollow laugh, have I ever heard one? Huh? How is it you're a spinster, a charming girl like you, Edna? Well, I've had a great number of gentlemen friends, but uh, uh, somehow or other I didn't uh, quite make the grade. Now, if you found the, the right man now, would, would you uh, marry him? Oh, yes, indeed. If I... Uh, well, I'd think it over, of course, a while, and uh, if it came up to my expectations, uh -huh. I, I think I would. <laughs> <laughs> you feel the same way about him as you do about St. Paul, I think. <laughs> How about Alan Rice, huh? Yes, sir. You, uh, are you married? Uh, no, I'm not, Mr. Mark. Oh, pretty good detective. He keeps himself out of trouble. <laughs> Edda, are you casting sheep's eyes over there? <laughs> oh, no, I was kind of looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm spoken for, Edda. There's a... Unfortunately, there's a girl in St. Paul who is infatuated. <laughs> 
You you say you're a, a private eye. Uh, where do you do your gum shoeing? Well, I have my own agency here in Hollywood. Central what do you Bureau do? Spy on yourself? Huh? Secret Service. Oh, Secret Service, huh? I better be careful what I say here. Do you work for the government? No, we call it Secret Service because all of our investigations are strictly confidential. Edder, I think he's your man. <laughs> <laughs> or aren't you interested in a confidence man? Oh, I'm interested in most any kind of man at this age. <laughs> Edder, you're really on the prowl, aren't you, huh? <laughs> Edda, a gentleman never asks a woman her age, so tell me, how many years ago were you born? Oh, uh, well, uh, 66 and uh, maybe a little bit more. Six, 66 years ago. Let's see, that, uh, that makes you about 47, huh? <laughs> Perhaps you would explain something to me. Exactly what age does a woman become a spinster? Oh, a woman never becomes a spinster if she keeps young and, uh, and uh, keeps a young mind and uh, goes around with the fellas and all this and that. She never becomes a <laughs> Just what do you mean by all this and that? <laughs> well, tries to act young and look young and to, and uh, keep up appearances and to, and go dancing, the square dancing and and the uh, rumba and all this and that, you know. Better, I think you've evaded that very well. That. <laughs> Hey, Eagle Eye, wake up. This guy's in a transom over here. <laughs> I'm only kidding, Alan. Actually, you're, you're wide awake, alert, and every inch the private detective. Now, stay awake. <laughs> now, what's the most common kind of a job you fellows get? Well, the most uh, common jobs we get is department store work for uh, disappearance, mysterious disappearance of merchandise. Suppose somebody's trying to steal a thimble. Could you detect that instantly? Well, if he was a professional thimble thief, yes. <laughs> Are there people who would just go around and steal nothing but thimbles? Yes. Well, how can you spot a shoplifter? Do they look like crooks? They look just like you and me. <laughs> Can't you just make it you? Why do you have to drag me in? <laughs> Edda. Yes? Uh, you're still here. Oh, yes, I'm here. <laughs> Has anything embarrassing ever happened to you, Edda? Oh, yes, not could, long ago. Could you relate it to us? I was singing in church. I was singing one of the hymns that they... Uh, uh, when we were all singing there. Not in what? the choir, but this was just in the, in the congregation. What were you singing? We were singing, Near My God to Thee. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I opened my mouth pretty wide. I guess wider than I should have. <laughs> and lo and behold, my upper plate fell right down in the floor. <laughs> Edda, just a moment, Edda. Don't they always pass the plate around in church? Yes, but the plate had already passed. I must say you two have been unusual. I must say that because you really are. However, a few days in bed and I'll be as good as new. <laughs> You're going to make a very interesting wife for some fellow, and I'm going to try to find you a husband if it's the last thing I do. And I wouldn't be surprised if it is the last thing I do. <laughs> now, you're going to play your bet your life. You beat our other two couples. You'll get a chance at the $1,000 question. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how much the first couple won, but George Fenneman is going to remind our listeners. The student nurse and the college gymnast won $250. Here we go. Let's see how high I can build you $20. You selected state landmarks. Here's your first question. How much would you bet? Fifteen dollars. Fifteen dollars. In what state is Pikes Peak? Colorado. Colorado yeah. is right. Yeah. Well, you're on your way. You have thirty-five dollars. Remember, you're going for a thousand dollars tonight. How much of your thirty-five are you going to bet? Thirty dollars. In what state do you find the Everglades? Oh, uh, Florida. Florida is yeah. right. <laughs> You now have $65. Oh. She's just crazy about herself, this guy. All right. She's pretty cute at that. Now, here's your third question. You're going to bet how much? $60. $60. In what state do you find the crater Lake National Park? In Oregon. Oregon. Oregon yes, is yes. right. <laughs> now you've climbed to $125. I wouldn't be oh. surprised if Etta winds up marrying herself if she wins this money. <laughs> 
Yeah. It's your last chance to beat the other couples. How much of the 125 are you going to risk? All of it. We'll shoot the works. The works. In what state do you find the General Sherman Sequoia tree? Uh, oh, in California. Uh, California. California is right. <laughs> $250. Oh, Thanks and good luck from the DeSoto Plymouth dealer. Well, Groucho, uh, we invited some high school students to our program tonight. Yes. Uh, I, I suppose we all realize it so far. No, I didn't. Uh, what is it? We uh, have a tie in our score here, I suppose you know. But I can't tell you how much because the other couple's probably waiting out here by now, huh? And in addition to that, he doesn't know. Yes, I do, but I won't say it because the uh, high school students that we invited to the program are here. And just before we went on the air, our studio audience selected two of them to be on the show. And here they come, Miss Laura Ann, no, Lou Ann Williams and Howard Stearns. Meet Groucho Marx, kids. Welcome, youngsters, for the DeSoto Plymouth dealers. Say the secret word and you'll divide $100. It's a common word, something you always have with you. High school youngsters, huh? It's, well, it's always nice to meet young people. Uh, Lou Ann uh, Williams, huh? Yes. How, how old are you, Lou? Sixteen. Sixteen. And uh, you were? Uh, A little over sixteen. Where are you from, Howard? Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. What is your hometown, uh, Lou? Uh, Tucson, Arizona. Mm -hmm. What school do you attend? Eagle Rock High School. Eagle Rock? Mm-hmm. And at what school do you practice your somnambulism, uh, Howard? Well, I go to Fairfax High School. Oh. Do you know what somnambulism is? Well, that means you walk in your sleep. That's not true. I always trap myself in it. <laughs> what are you learning in school, Harold? Well, I take chemistry, algebra. Do you do anything else in school, like playing with the girls' basketball team? Oh, no, I, I play with a band. Oh, a musician, eh? <laughs> what instrument do you massacre? I play trombone. Are you interested in the band, too, uh, Lou? No. <laughs> no, you just don't give it to, do you? <laughs> Do you belong to any school organizations? Yes, the GAA. GAA, what's that? Ga. <laughs> Is that like the AAA? No, that's the Girls Athletic Association. Girls Athletic Association. Well, count me out. I'll have no association with any girl who's athletic. <laughs> but before I break off the association, what is the purpose of it, Lou? To make uh, sports more popular with girls. I'm back in the association. <laughs> I'm one sport who's just dying to be popular with girls. <laughs> now, which team are you on, Lou? Uh, I'm not on any team. I'm a cheerleader. A cheerleader? Yes. Oh, glad you're here. I need something to cheer me up. Can you give us a cheer? Go ahead. Something that'll uh, rouse the rooters. You mean right now? Yeah, give us a cheer. Okay. Huh? Snickerty, rickety, rickety, rack. We're the GA that never falls back. We're the people. We're the stuff. We're from Eagle Rock. That's enough. I didn't know that Shakespeare wrote poems about sports. Eh? He'll be singing that in a hundred years from now. I only hope I'm not around to hear it. Hey, Howard, Howard, is that it, Howard? Yeah, let's Howard. find out something about your band. Is it a dance band or is it just for football games? Well, we play for football games and also other school activities that need the band to play. I well, guess. Well, what? What's the secret word? Secret word? Well, you and your partner split $100 between you. Here's 50 for you. And here's 50 for you. Thank you. Didn't say you say uh, you, you just play for football games? Uh? Well, we play for school assemblies and rallies. Uh -huh. Do you march in the parades? Yes. Well, when you're marching along in a parade, how do you know what the fellow in back of you is doing? Well, I don't, but it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> Suppose he happens to be playing a slide trombone and he's reaching for a low note. <laughs> now, uh, Lou... Uh, when your band is playing, your school band is playing at a football game, do you wear pump, wave pom-poms like I've seen on television? Yes. Well, let's recreate a big game. Uh, Howard, you play your school song, and uh, Lou Ann, you wave your school colors, okay? Okay, one, two, three, go. Well, I don't have an instrument. <laughs> That's right. It's hard to play a slide trombone unless you have it. Well, we could borrow one. Hey, uh, trombonist out there, could we have the trombone for a minute? <laughs> Are you sure you know how to blow this thing, huh? Yeah. They can be pretty dangerous, those slide trombones. <laughs> well, I want you to play exactly as you do when you're sitting at a football game. Pretend the rest of your band is here, too, and you're all blowing up some school spirit. Now, go ahead, get hot, and, and uh, Lou Ann, 
You wave your school colors, okay. eh? Okay, let's go. <laughs> Let's be sensible about this. You mean that's your school song? I don't you mean the... you win football games with that? I don't play the melody. You don't what? I don't play the melody. You say... <laughs> Howard, when you say you don't play the melody, that's the understatement of the year. <laughs> Are you sure you can play that bugle? Yes. Let's try it again. Only this time, forget what you play and, and give us the old fight song now. Go ahead. Come on. Howard, that was magnificent. And I'm sure if you continue practicing like that, you can make a fortune going around breaking leases. <laughs> All right, now let's see how much you've learned in school. You're going to play your bet your life. You run your $20 into more than our other couples, and you'll get a chance at the $1,000 question. I can't tell you how much they won, but George is going to remind our listeners. The first and second couples are tied with $250 each. Here we go. Let's, let's see how high you can build your $20. You've selected famous inventors. Here's your first question. How much of the $20 are you going to bet? Fifteen. Fifteen. Who invented the telegraph? Morse. Samuel Morse is right. <laughs> well, you're off to a good start. You have $35. Remember, you're going for $1,000. Now, how much of the $35 are you going to bet? Twenty-five. Thirty. Or twenty-five. Twenty-four. Oh, Twenty-five? Oh, Thirty. <laughs> I think we should make it twenty-five. What? <laughs> Make it twenty-seven fifty, eh? Well, let's, let's make it twenty-five. Oh, Save a little bit for dinner. We're going to find out now who's the boss of this team. Eh? All right, what is it, kids? Twenty-five. Okay, twenty-five. Who invented the uh, cotton gin? Eli Whitney. Eli Whitney is right. <laughs> and now you have sixty dollars. Here's your third question: How much of the sixty are you going to bet? Fifty-five. 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 Who invented the lightning rod? Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin. $115. Now, how many is your last chance to beat the other couples? How much are you going to bet? Bet it all. Bet it all? Mm -hmm. Yes. Who invented the incandescent lamp like you use at home? Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison is right. <laughs> all right, you came through. Huh? And you two kids wind up with $230. And that means that our first two couples who both won $250, get a chance at the big question together. Now, that's the big question in just one minute, but first, here's an important message. Friends, if you're looking for a used car, remember you can't go by price or appearance alone. You also have to go by the reputation of the dealer. And that's why so many people like to buy not only new cars, but also used cars from a DeSoto Plymouth dealer. He's a good man to do business with. When you buy from a DeSoto Plymouth dealer, you know you'll get satisfaction. You'll get a used car that's a real value, whether you're buying the latest model or just dependable transportation. Your DeSoto Plymouth dealer has many different makes and models of good used cars on his lot. Some of them are DeSoto's and Plymouth's he sold when they were brand new and has serviced in his shop ever since. So, before you decide on any used car, drop around and see what your DeSoto Plymouth dealer has to offer. You'll find he has the best used car values in town. All right, Groucho, here we go with two couples tied for the big question and the chance at the $1,000. 
Each couple will decide on a single answer between them. Now, write it down on one of these cards that I'm going to hand you. Now, if both couples get the right answer, they will split the money between them. All right, you all ready? Put on your thinking caps. Here we go for $1,000. I'll give you 15 seconds to decide on a single answer between you. Think carefully. Please, no help from the audience. Here it is. For $1,000, tell me who was our youngest president at the time of his inauguration. Let me see the card. No, oh, I'm sorry. This couple wins with Theodore Roosevelt. He was just 43 at the time he... Spinster and the Private Eye had the right answer, Theodore Roosevelt. The other, the other couple had guessed Franklin D. Roosevelt. They both had Roosevelt's, but unfortunately they had the wrong one. Well, that's right. You win $1,000, and, and how much uh, did they win? $250. That's $1,250. Yeah, so you win $1,200. What are you going to do with all that money, Etta? Well, uh, oh... It's I... out of the question with me, yes. Etta, so let's... Uh... <laughs> I have a friend, an old lady like myself, that's been ill for several years. And uh, she's, uh, well, it's been seven years now that she's been ill. And I said, if I want any money tonight, I'd help her out. Because she's gone to the end of a rope financially. So I'm going to help her out. Well, that's, that's a wonderful way to spend the money. I'll put it there. You really cleaned up tonight. Congratulations from the more than 3,000 DeSoto Plymouth dealers from coast to coast. You bet your luck. Go ahead. Be sure to tune in again next Wednesday night at the same time for the best of Groucho from the You Bet Your Life series. Don't miss the best of Groucho on television, too. Also presented by the DeSoto Plymouth Dealers of America. And remember, all dealers who sell DeSoto also sell Plymouth. Two great cars, both products of the Chrysler Corporation. And when you drive in, tell them Groucho sent you. Good night, folks, and remember, see the DeSoto Fire Dome 8 tomorrow. Folks, here's a reminder from the National Safety Council. The three R's of safe driving are ready, reasonable, and right. You Bet Your Life, transcribed from Hollywood, is produced by John Goodell, directed by Robert Dwan and Bernie Smith, music by Jerry Fielding. This is George Fenneman signing off for the more than 3,000 DeSoto Plymouth dealers from coast to coast. going to relax here for the rest of my life. Hey, you two, what are you Yankees doing on my property? What? You're not taking, you're not taking the south again. Run! <laughs> 
Well, I guess this always happens. See you next time, folks.